are you saying? Vav said. Ruv for short. And you think that having a daughter fighting on the other side would make Skarata put his beloved clones at greater risk than they already are? She's his flesh and blood. You still don't understand Mandoade at all. Vav let out a long and weary sigh that sounded real. Eliot Orishaya Talden. Family is more than bloodline. And if you looked at any Mando working for you and doing a solid job, might I add you'd find some of their kin fighting for one of the Republic's enemies at any given time. We've worked as mercenaries for millennia. When you hire a Mando, you get professional loyalty as part of the deal. Funny how you see us as private contractors fighting for the cause of freedom when it's your credits, but as a moral scum when we get paid by someone else. Maybe we're like all your fine Jedi who come from non-Republic worlds, perhaps. I didn't call you in for a debate on the ethics of private military contractors, Wallen. Yes, I realize this is one of those philosophical gray areas that you struggle with. But if you want me to slide a blade into a man I'd have to trust with my life in battle one day, I require grounds. Because clients come and go, but your professional community is with you forever. Very well, said Zay. Intel says someone has been poking around in files and places that concern them greatly. They won't tell me exactly where, because apparently as director of special forces I have no need to know. But I can watch the unseen by the shadows it casts, and I know this is treasury, and I know this is defense, and if there's anyone who has the wherewithal to get this far into Republic systems leaving no direct trace, it's Skirata and his very clever boys. Vav still didn't move a muscle. Despite the office security soundproofing to thwart eavesdroppers and bugs, a sudden noise interrupted the hold-your-breath tension. It was the sound of claws scraping the doors. Murd had shown up. I can't argue with your logic, said Vav. In? Say he didn't even ask boss for Delta's position. It was irrelevant. Or not in? Vav waited five beats. Scorch had seen him do that many times, and the longer he waited the more scared Scorch always got. Five beats was a warning of serious displeasure. You're paying me, Vav said at last. If I find him doing anything to help the enemy, I shall give you full details. But only because he'll be in breach of his contract with you. Our word is our bond. It has to be, or we're just savages. Wisely, Zay didn't come back on that last line, but Scorch was never sure if Zay shared the common view of Mandalorians. He might have been ignorant of the culture, but he was a pretty tolerant guy for a mystic. Remember, I expect discretion. Then Zay almost said dismissed. Scorch saw his teeth come together, and the shape his lips were beginning to form. He stopped short. Thank you? The doors parted as Vav walked toward them, followed by Delta. Murd sat patiently at the threshold and made no attempt to bound into the office. The Strill trotted ahead of them down the corridor, nose almost welded to the plequwood floor in pursuit of fascinating scents. Scorch switched to his helmet circuit so that Vav couldn't hear. Skirata's going to cut off his criffing get Essie and ram him down his throat if he finds out. Sev snorted. I told you it was getting a bit too much like Keldabe around here. Cal wouldn't scupper the Republic. Boss said. You sure about that? Fixer sounded unconvinced. More to the point, is Cal sure? Vav said nothing until they reached the doors leading to the training wing of the HQ building. He turned slowly, and stared at them as if their helmets weren't in place, and he could see not only into their eyes, but into their minds. In case you're wondering why, if, and when, Vav said, this is Q Valdar business, and I will not involve you in it. Stand from under, stay away from it. Taylor Basie? 
It was the most aggressive way a Mandalorian could ask someone if they understood and if the question ever required an answer, yes was the best one. It was an order to back off. But Delta was tasked by Atane, and she was very much on Skarata's team. It put them in an awkward spot. Sarge, boss said, where does this leave General Termukin? Vav dropped his chin and gave Scorch that benign, but I'm not joking warning look. Like you stay out of Q Valdar affairs, I keep clear of internal Jedi politics. Until you receive an explicit order to disregard her in the chain of command she's still your CEO. Scorch liked to be clear. They all did. Sometimes he envied the white jobs for the clean lack of politics in their working lives. Well, Shab, Sev said watching Valve walk back into the gym again. I'm going to start a sweepstakes. Place your bets, vote who's going to be left still standing in Cal's happy little gang this time next year? Galactic City Utilities Department Standby Underground Reservoir, Coruscant, late evening. So when was he going to tell me that my girl's a prisoner of war? Skirata sat on A.E. Han's casing, so besieged by his torrent of problems that he'd overloaded and reached the relatively comfortable stage of simply picking them off as they floated to the surface. Do what you can. It's all you can ever do. Vav paced the edge of the permacrete quay as if he was measuring it for a carpet, head down, hands clasped behind his back. Try to look surprised when he finally does, Cal. Skirata opened his palm and stared at the data crystal from Vav's concealed audio recorder. No Mando with two brain cells ever went into a contentious meeting without an electronic witness hidden somewhere. Vav always had one on him, in his collar or belt, even in his underclothes, Rhett Linney just in case. It was a Mando mindset. You never knew what was coming around the corner to ruin your entire day. Don't worry, I'll win an award for dramatic presentation, Skarada said. Thanks, Wallen. So is he going to use Ru to shake me down, or has he told you just to see if you'd come running to warn me? Well, we know it's true she's on the POW list. I checked. Better assume every malign motive until proven benevolent, though. But Zay's not a hollow chess player. He's just drowning in the war like everyone else, grabbing what flotsam he can to stay afloat. You're in full Imperial Ermina Navy mode today, I see. It's the water. Brings out my inner sailor. The underground lake, stored as an emergency supply for homes across Coruscant, casts rippling reflections onto a vaulted permacrete roof that stretched far out of sight into darkness. A.E. Han was moored down here, courtesy of yet more folks who owed Jailer Obram a favor and so turned blind eyes when asked. She could have been laid up on the surface easily enough, ready to bang out at a moment's notice, but this was a forgotten place, perfect for hiding a submersible starship. The exit, when the day finally came, was via the sluice bulkheads at the far end of the reservoir. Ordo said the distance was enough to reach takeoff speed before the ship slipped through the narrow opening into the daylight and clear air. A.E. Han was going to give someone a massive surprise when she punched out of the side of a utilities plant. No rehearsal was possible. Ordo had to get it right the first time, but he was Ordo, and so he would. My alarm bells went off when Zay said he wanted Mariel, Jane and Bessany to investigate the virus, Skarada said. It's to get all the suspects in one room approach. Like a Karelian holodrama. If I were laying bets, I'd say that's unhappy coincidence, but we plan for the worst. What's the state of play with Atane? Well, the news gutted Dar and he's not talking to her at the moment. Skarada checked the chrono on his forearm plate. He preferred to work in full armor. It was as much toolkit as protective clothing. They'd do back at barracks from Nerif in a couple of hours. With any luck, Bardike will make it by then, too. 
Jay think we have to treat this as the last big planning meeting. You're going to come completely clean with Omega? Despite what happened with Dar. Oh, I think I need to keep them away from any fallout from my mess until we're literally ready to move. So, not yet. For a moment, Skirata's natural suspicion tugged at his sleeve and said, Yeah, good idea. Get all the gang in one place, and warn Vav so he can tip off, say. Not knowing now who he could and could not trust got to Skirata in a way few things ever could. But that was their erotic game divide and rule, so distrust, set Mando against Mando by adding a little poisonous doubt to the mix. If Vav set me up, and this is some clever double-double game, then I'm going to take my time killing him. The trouble with wargaming double-cross scenarios like this was that there was no logical point at which to stop. It was layer upon layer, FT could drive you crazy. Skirata knew Vav all too well after being cooped up on a force-forsaken stilt city on Kamino for years. If he was the double-crossing kind, it would be a first time for him. But... Skirata shook it off as best he could. Mandalorians needed to learn to stick together, to look after one another and let the rest of the galaxy find its own fall guys to do the fighting and dying in their place. If you don't feel comfortable having me at this meeting, Cal, just say so. Vav squatted down to pet Murd who had finished inspecting the makeshift dock and trotted back to report with a series of grumbles and whines. Just because I'm good at this slippery two-faced stuff doesn't mean I enjoy it, and if there's another unfortunate coincidence, I wouldn't want to be seen as the leak. Skirata wasn't sure if he felt ashamed or amused at hearing his very thoughts laid bare but the comment made his gut flip for an irrational moment either way. How long have you been the only telepathic Mando, then? Long practice, over-familiarity, convergent thoughts. We've both known each other long enough to realize what the stakes are. Murd seemed to approve of the subterranean birthing arrangements. It walked up to a handwheel set low in the wall and sprayed its territorial scent with abandon. Murd when we bang out, you can do that all over Zay's office. Skirata said trying to find something to laugh about. It'll take irradiation to clean it off. Ae Han was almost ready. She'd had a full refit, one discreet piece at a time. Her supply lockers and tanks were full and cryosealed, and she looked a lot tidier down below than she had when he'd haggled her out from under that radian. She wasn't just a multitask submersible. She was a lifeboat for everything he loved and cared about. Tied up alongside her in the water was Giaika, the tiny shark-shaped sports submarine they'd used to infiltrate Ko's size hideaway on Daruma. Muriel loved that thing. He came down here to pilot it occasionally when he was back at base, just letting off steam like a normal lad of his age. He'll love thrashing that up and down the lake at Kirimorat. In the throes of plans crumbling to dust, there were still good things to look forward to. No, Zay. I've not come this far to lose my nerve now. We're nearly there. You want to stop me? Then you're going to have to kill me. Murd sprayed copiously into the water. Vav managed a rueful smile. With Murd's contribution arid A.E. Han's anti-fouling coating. Remind me not to drink coruscant water again, will you? Good reason for leaving. Come on. Back to base. Waiting for everyone to assemble at Lesema's apartment was taking longer than Skirata liked. Even with Cat on his lap, precious time he usually cherished he still had that feeling of needing to get everything sorted and stowed to be ready to run. Cad and Murd seemed to have developed an understanding. Cad babbled happily at the strill, which rumbled and even squeaked for a few moments, then disappeared for a while. It returned dragging the covers from Juzik's bed and it proceeded to build a nest from them on the floor. It was a ruthless predator, but it was also a devoted parent. Strills were almost the archetypal Mandalorian spirit. 
Jane arrived with Ordo and Bessany just after midnight. Lasima put Cad to bed again, and within the hour all six nulls some in uniform armor, some in Beskergam and Helamar had arrived. There was no sign of Juzik or Atain. Skirata waited a little longer, then decided they could catch up. He played the recording of Vav's conversation with Zay and waited for comments. How do you lie to a Jedi Master? Lasima asked. Without him sensing it, that is? I didn't, said Vav. I said I'd tell him if I found Kel doing anything to help the enemy. The minute that this little Shabir opens a comm link to any former Death Watch personnel, I shall gladly turn him in. Skirata paused for a moment, then managed to laugh. Do I know any? No, but they're the only group I'd really call my enemy. So I didn't lie, and I was genuinely emotional enough for him to believe what his Force senses told him he wanted to believe. Lasima applauded politely. That's a very clever technique. Thank you, my dear. Mandoade are trained to acquire certain states of mind for battle, so it's an easy switch. I'm sorry. Bessany, perched on a chair next to Kamarke, looked exhausted. This is all my fault. The Gerlinen told me I was crashing around when I was doing my digging. Shab, no, Skarada said. Ordo saw the file on you, remember? They haven't traced it back to you. You got good intel, Ad I.K. You made the difference. We know about the second stream of clones, we know about the extra fleets, and we have a rough idea of when it's all rolling out. We might not know all the details, but we've got enough to save our Shebs when the time comes. That's all down to you. Maybe I was too cocky, Jang said quietly. I'm the one who took the risk of introducing a program into the Treasury network to crawl through every linked Republic computer system to mine data. I should have stuck to short-lived programs that self-erased. Grabbed snapshots. Is that what it actually did? Vav asked. You should see the quantity of data it transmitted back. Most of it useless, but... Snapshots rely on you looking in the right place at the right time, so I thought it was worth the risk. You really are a clever lad. Well, they still don't seem to know what it did only that it's been in the system and vanished, Bessany said. Unless, of course, they really do know I'm involved, and even the tech droid is instructed to lie to me. Jane shook his head. They can't trace the entry point to your terminal, Bessany. I sent the program via the main comlink, so if they can even find the route it entered by, it's not traceable to any individual user. Skirata realized how much faith they all put in one another. He was no fool, but he really had no idea of the sophisticated technical skills that Jane used as easily as Skirata drew his blade. He took it on faith ironically, faith in the enhancements that the Kaminoans engineered into the nulls that they all knew what they were doing. Even Bessany no, he had no idea of the fine detail of her expertise either. He was proud of his kids. He included Bessany in that now, she was his daughter, because Mandos didn't draw the distinction of in-laws. I think we've got two issues. She said with the earnest air of someone used to conducting meetings and commanding attention. One, what happens when we start this investigation? Do we treat it as real, that they think we have nothing to do with the problem, or do we assume it's a shakedown? Say's chat with Wallen makes me think the latter. Either way, we have to find another way of monitoring activity in our areas of interest, and that's issue two. Follow the supply chain, not purchasing, from now on in. All we need is to keep tabs on the firms we know will supply the kit. KDY, Rothana specifically. 
Then there's Orodazil, big supplier to Sparty Creations before the cart out plant was trashed. And the data I pulled off the CSX and IC company information service shows no fall off in production or profits since cloning was banned. They say they're making water purification equipment now. Seeing as they lost their biggest customer overnight, I find it hard to believe they've found enough new business to fill that gap so fast. So we just need some way of getting an overview of their outputs and shipping activity. Check what they're shipping, when they're shipping it, and where it goes. Anyone got a contact in K2I? Mariel asked, looking around his brothers. If not, we'll have to get in there. My father worked for K2I. Skirata tried to honor the memory of his birth parents, but it had been more than 50 years, and it was getting harder than ever to summon up the scraps of the past. The apartment on Quote was reduced to one view of a wall, but memory was also kind, because he could no longer recall the full detail of the scene he came back to after his home on Circarus was bombed. I know a very reliable freight pilot, Aiden said. She helped our Ark deserter vanish, so she'll be good for a few trips to KDY. How do we get into Oro de Zeal? Skirata asked. Leave that to me, said Vav. Skirata started to feel that things were coming back under control again. All it took was a task list and common sense. Okay, now on to wet assets. We've got Yuthan still in the secure mental unit and my daughter Rua in a POW camp. Ideally, we snatch them both within the same time window to minimize holding time here, and get them off planet fast. Bardai K is keeping tabs on the secure unit, and I'll look after Rua. He said it as naturally as if he'd seen her last week. He didn't even know what she looked like as an adult until he got hold of her ID hologram. He searched her features for Lippy's face, but found mainly his own. Ru was brown-haired and pugnacious-looking. Now he was practicing not seeing her as a stranger. None of the Nulls had said a word about it, but he could sense that they were standing by to intervene if things didn't go as planned. He'd spring her from prison. Then it was her choice what she did next. Okay, what have we got left? Skirata asked. Medical update and finances. Pretty, I said. Mijake? Nenelin came up with some interesting insights but no solutions, and I paid him off, with the reminder that if he opens his mouth, tenure won't save him from the weight of my disappointment. Helamar didn't go into detail. Skarata could guess. But there's excellent data from the embryologist, who's confirmed there are no manufactured genes in the sample just manipulated naturally occurring ones. The Iowa bait stuck to the basic blueprint. That's narrowed the range to what Mario first suspected that they just concentrated on rapid maturation and on making sure the genes that influenced bonding and social compliance were fully expressed to make clones as loyal and disciplined as possible. They learned their lesson with us, Mario said. Maturation is the bit we're interested in which is, unfortunately, the most complex. Databases? Skirata asked. Mariel tapped his pad meaningfully. We've ripped most of the data on cloning and genetics now, public sector and commercial. Yuthan's going to have everything she needs. Shah, Arcanian Micro would kill to grab what we've extracted. Rarely, very rarely Skirata stepped outside himself for a second and saw what he did plain and unvarnished. Extortion, blackmail, industrial espionage, theft, fraud, kidnapping, violence, even good old-fashioned spying on the state. He they did the lot. This was a crime syndicate. My syndicate. He never saw himself like some hut chakar or other gangster. He didn't see himself as a paragon, either. But he could sleep at night for the most part, and he worked out that he could live with himself because other than in war, which was another matter everyone he'd heard had been asking for it. 
There was collateral damage. The families of scumbags he shot, and they might well not have been scum, but they were unseen strangers. Thieving he faced up to the fact that it was never victimless. And still he slept. The same or worse had been done to him and those he loved. But he squirmed now. What had stabbed suddenly at his conscience was the awareness that he wasn't all that different from Zay. The Jedi seemed like a nice enough man. He treated Maze with courtesy. But when push came to shove, he did immoral things and sent clones to die because he could justify it. Collateral damage. They both had their rules of engagement. Why am I not, say? Why don't I think I'm as had as a Jedi? Because I don't drone on about compassion and respect for life. Because I don't exploit slaves while polishing my principles. Because. It's personal. When I kill, I mean it. Even when it's just killing them before they kill me. Skirata found that he was watching Ordo watching Bessany, a strange act of observation that summed it all up. This was his son. Not a throwaway organic droid made to order. But a man with powerful feelings, a man who was loved and who could love in return, and this random civilian, whose most remarkable quality wasn't her pretty face or her razor-sharp mind, was a woman who looked at Ordo purely as a man like any other, and loved him. Jedi weren't allowed to love. If you were forbidden to love a person you could see and touch, how could you ever learn enough compassion to treat strangers right? Jedi never truly learned to love anything beyond an idea, and that was the gulf that Skirata saw between himself and Zay. He wasn't even trying to work out if he was standing on higher moral ground than Zay and his kind. He just needed to work out if he was, on balance doing more harm than good if he carried on like this. Calber, are you feeling okay? Pretty I put his hand on Skirata's check. Talk to me, bear. What's wrong? Skirata was jerked out of his thoughts so hard that the touch startled him and his heart hammered out of control. Sorry, son. Embarrassed, he looked around at worried expressions and tried to joke his way out trying to process too many thoughts with one brain cell. You smart lads don't know how hard it is. You need to get some sleep, Aiden said. We thought you'd had a stroke for a moment. You're no use to us, dead bear. It was an old Mando joke, the kind of thing that Biroy said to the bounties they'd hunted down and cornered a hint to surrender quietly. Finance, Jang said. Want to hear the update? Might help you sleep. Juzik was late. So was Atane. Skirata would get a few hours sleep and then go find them. Okay. Last item on the agenda. Jane had an oddly satisfied look on his face. Skirata waited for the punchline. Our current assets stand at 1.36 trillion credits rounded down. There was a pause of such profound silence that Skirata heard Murd's stomach gurgle. He took a breath. His hearing was shot to Heron from too many loud detonations too close, and he lived with that, but he hadn't thought he was that deaf. Say again, son? Helamar seemed to think he'd misheard too. Meshab? Just over a trillion creds, Calbear. You want me to count out the zeros? Way. Mariel started applauding. Ordo joined in, then Lasima and the others. Oi, Amanda. Ori Kandosii, Viobiake. You actually pulled it off. I thought I was wasted being just a gorgeous hunk, Jang said, grinning. He smoothed the fine gray leather gloves tucked into his belt. Skirata hoped Atain never asked too many questions about those. I felt like being creative for a change. The Nulls were extreme risk-takers. Skirata now feared Jane had gone too far, 
His spy program had been detected and now he'd ripped off enough creds from the Republic to get attention. Oh, Shab. Skirata got up and walked over to him. Just tell me how, son. You look worried, Kalber. It's a big hole to leave. Not from several trillion bank accounts. The Nulls laughed like Skirata had never seen them laugh before. They really did think it was hilarious. They were giggling like kids. Spell it out for an old Shakar, he said. Vav nodded. And me. You know roughly what my programs do. Murd wandered over to Jane and put its head in his lap as if to join in the adulation. Jane didn't seem bothered by the drool, but he moved his gloves to higher ground, to the clip on his shoulder plate. They wandered through computer networks, copying data and sending it back to me. So I created a version that wanders around bank networks skimming a credit or half a credit off each account it finds and depositing it in another account. Well, this program did a lot more exploring than I counted on, thanks to the central clearing system Republic Bank's use. That led it into every bank on the grid. Trillions of accounts. And who misses half a cred on their balance statement? Who'd argue with their bank about it? Which bank would spend time investigating such a small dispute anyway? Next thing we know. Thank you for choosing the Clone Savings Bank, citizen, you've invested wisely. Skarata nearly wept. He was tired, so his guard was down, and he was prone to emotion anyway, but this was shock and joy. Bessany just put her head in her hands, maybe amused, but probably hyperventilating in horror. The poor kid was an auditor. She was supposed to hunt men like Jane. Look, it's not like I left any widows destitute, Jane said defensively. He must have misunderstood Skarata's expression. Shab, I didn't even leave any rich hut starving. And I only hit Republic banks. It's social taxation. Your. Your. A genius. Skarata managed at last. Thank you for noticing, Kalber. Jane looked up as Vav leaned over and shook his hand. The really clever stuff is making it stealthy enough to defeat security programs. And it's been laundered? Vav asked. Laundered, pressed, starched, new fastening sewn on, and now it's being reinvested. You want to know how much interest it's earning per day, Kalber? I'll live with my current level of shock, thanks. We now have a war chest. I think I'll join you in that suspected transient ischemia, Cal, Helamar said. He looked as ashen as Skirata felt. Those numbers cut off the blood supply to my brain. They could now buy anyone or anything, and buy a lot of clones a new life if they wanted one. If those sorts of resources couldn't also buy a solution to the genetic aging puzzle, nothing could. Skirata would have slept well in what remained of the night. If only Darman and Etain had walked through those doors having made up and forgiven. He slept in a chair anyway, as he always did, and waited, dozing fitfully and watching. The doors stayed closed. Chapter 9 Someone knows. I feel it. And I know someone single-minded is looking for information about the new clone army. It's not a secret I could have hidden, not an operation that big, but I didn't need to. Beings believe what you tell them. They never check, they never ask, they never think. Tell them the state is menaced by quadrillions of battle droids, and they will not count. Tell them you can save them, and they will never ask from what, from whom? Just say tyranny, oppression, vague bogeymen that require no analysis never specify. Then they look the other way when reality is right in front of them. It's a conjuring trick. The key is distraction, getting them to watch your other hand. Only single-minded beings don't join in the shared illusion and keep watching you too closely. 
single-minded beings are dangerous. And they either work for me, or they don't work at all. Chancellor Palpatine, talking to his personal Republic Intel agents known as his hands. Main Computer Control Room, Treasury Offices, Coruscant, 0845 hours, 998 days ABG. Everything ready? Bessany asked. Yes, Agent Wenin, said Jay, the tech droid. We've maintained strict security. None of the staff knows it's an audit investigation. As far as everyone is concerned, the shutdown is due to the virus infecting the network. Let's go, she said and nodded to Mariel and Jane. Monitoring them from a few paces away was a Central Republic Audit Office employee with a name tag that read Elec, but Bessany was sure the woman was an Intel agent. It didn't matter. She wouldn't find a thing. Lockdown. This was how it was done by the book. No warning was given. Staff throughout the building suddenly found that their input devices wouldn't work, their computer screens were frozen, and they couldn't make calm calls. And then a small army of droids began searching their workstations, because it wasn't a job that anyone wanted a flesh-and-blood collie to do. Droids were impersonal, impartial, and nobody had to look at them resentfully afterward. It made for more peaceful workplace relations. Security droids also stood guard at the exits, actually locking staff in breach fire regulations. Bessany found that almost funny under the circumstances. What would you like us to do, Agent Wenin? Mariel asked Deadpan. Lieutenant Jane is ready to start. The two nulls stood to attention by the control console. All data storage and processing for the treasury was done from this huge room. The staff mainly human, but also Nimbanese and Celestans watched the two ARC troopers warily. Bessany wondered whether to ask them to remove their helmets, so that the staff could see that there were real human beings under the white plastoids seeing as the rest of the security rummage was being done by droids. She wanted them to know the difference. But now she also knew how much clone troopers relied on the helmet systems for comms. Jane and Mario would want to conduct unheard conversations. We're here to get this done without digging ourselves in any deeper. The public relations will have to wait. You can run your forensic program now, Lieutenant. She stood back to give Jane control of the terminal. The CRO officer glided up behind his seat like a ghost, watching in silence while he inserted the data chip, keyed in commands, and then sat back. What program are you running, exactly, clone? Bessany braced for impact. It was a very emotive issue, using the term clone when the woman knew both his rank and name. It said he was nothing. Routing analysis to detect via which terminal the virus entered the network, and then purge it from the system, overweight female human, Jang said. The shock on her face gave way to outrage. I beg your pardon? Jang's tone remained even. I thought we were using generic phenotype descriptions as a term of address, as you appear to have dispensed with name and title. It really wasn't the best time to make a stand on courtesy but that was a measure of how angry it made the nulls. At any other time, it would have been funny. Officer Alec looked as if she was trying to translate what Jane had said into some language she understood. Bessany silently willed Jane to quit while he was ahead. How will this program detect that when our security skin couldn't? Lieutenant? Because I wrote this program, Officer Alec and I'm a great deal more intelligent than those who produce monitoring systems for Republic procurement. It was impossible to take offense at Jane. He was simply stating facts. Alec didn't answer, but watched him carefully while Bessany made an effort to look as if she was curious about what he might find. There, he said at last. That's your point of entry. A comlink data portal. 
I thought we had adequate filtering for comlink-borne attacks, Bessany said. Jay, schedule me an interview with the head of system security, please. Let's get that plugged. Jane didn't need that access now anyway. Lieutenant, can you suggest a solution for that? Certainly, ma'am. Can you identify the incoming comm link? Alec asked. Jane pushed his seat back to let her look at the screen. No, I'm afraid not. This code here shows dash. Oh, yes. The range of numbers is within the public node allocation. You're very well informed. Jane said keying in more commands. Yes, it's the public comm link node in the Fabosi district. The university. Alex shut her eyes for a moment. If this is some student prank, they have some very sophisticated programming skills. Kids today, he said shaking his head. Alec had switched from addressing Jane like a droid to apparently thinking he had more to contribute than Bessany. You don't think it's a student slicing into our system for thrills, do you? If I were a gambling man, Officer Alec, I would place my credits on industrial espionage. Why not real espionage? Because company secrets and the profits associated with them are bigger than planetary interests. Spying is small stuff by comparison. I don't know what should worry us more, she said. I could, of course, run similar checks for all the Republic contractors whose details are held on the Treasury system, starting with defense. This spy program and that's all it was, I think, because there are no corrupt data has probably taken a look at commercially sensitive information. You're very definite about that. If it was military espionage, Officer Alec, they'd be looking for totally different data specifications, operating parameters, jamming frequencies. None of that data is held here. Anyone rummaging through the accounts wants financial information. Good thinking, she said. Very well, I'll authorize your access to defense contractors to carry out whatever checks you need. I doubt they'll refuse our help under the circumstances. Bessany was left breathless by Jane's sheer nerve. Had he planned this? Was he just busking it, as Skirata called it making it up as he went along? He just talked his way into rifling through KDY's systems with the Republic's blessing. It was so casual, so effortless, that Bessany wondered if Ordo was also really all he seemed. I could do what we call hardening a target, said Jane. Try to breach their system security to see if it's robust enough. I'm sure they have paid professionals to do that, but so does the Treasury, and they didn't spot this spy program on entry. Alec nodded. Start with KDY. I'll square it with the Chief of Staff and the Chancellor's office. Wait for my confirmation. Lieutenant, have your program sent over to our Information Technology Division. She turned to Bessany. And I still want to see the results of staff monitoring, just in case. These people may have contacts on the inside. That's being done now, Officer Ellick. Bessany turned to the control room staff. As soon as you get the all clear from the droid security teams, release the system lockdown. Alec left without shaking hands, which was no surprise. Bessany, almost faint with relief, followed Jane and Mariel outside into the service turbo lift. Mariel ran his gauntlet around the interior as if he was feeling for a draft of air, then checked the display on his forearm plate. No bugs, he said and took off his helmet. Spook. Jane took off his helmet too. Definitely spook. Nobody else would memorize public comm link node outgoing codes. Nobody sane anyway. You pushed your luck there, Jane, Bessany said. She could feel her face burning now as the adrenaline dissipated. Did I read that right? 
you're going to slice KDY's system on Republic time? Please, miss, can I do some spying? I won't make a mess. Mario mocked Jane. You little crawler. You're just jealous of my sheer animal magnetism, VODK. I wondered what that smell was. Jane affected a breathless, sultry tone. Women can't resist me. Not even Alec. Get over yourself. Mario laughed. But that did take some gaiety, I admit. Bessany watched the indicator charting their progress to the 400th floor of the complex. I don't want to do that ever again, Jane. With any luck, you won't. They replaced their helmets. Bessany tidied her hair to make sure that when she stepped out of the turbo lift, she didn't look red-faced and guilty at having lied to cover up an even bigger mountain of lies. The doors parted and they walked to her office past open areas where droids were still searching desks and cupboards, watched in grim silence by the clerks. Bessany checked that her terminal was working again, then turned to Jane. Are you really handing over your program to her? I'm handing over a program to her. There's nobody working for her who'll know the difference. That's my intellectual property, and if she wants it for Republic use, she can pay me for it. And of course, the Republic will never spot another Jane virus with it, Mariel said. Everything will look nice and clean. Bessany had to do a double take. You mean you pulled another scam under her nose? Jane shrugged. Well, she thinks she's got a program that'll find all spy applications now, but she hasn't, so she might well have more viruses she'll never know about. So? Yeah, I think I did. Remind me never to place a back with you. It was the all clear. This crisis, at least, had passed and Bessany was back to her normal daily level of fear of discovery. Somehow it seemed a lot lower. Agent Wenin? She looked past Jane and Mariel. It was Jay, the tech droid. All sorted, Jay? Back to normal? Droid security team 87 beta report finding evidence of improper access and used by an employee, ma'am. Bessany's shoulders sagged a little. They were back to the routine of internal disciplinary trivia. Remote gambling, no doubt, some staff were hooked. You'd think treasury staff would know better. Who is it this time, Jay? I hope the winnings made it worthwhile. Ma'am, it's Agent Joe Kazan Zentis. We've detained her for accessing suspicious files unconnected to her duties and transferring confidential data files to Flimsy copy for removal from the system. The office perspective shifted violently like zooming the focus on a holocom. Bessany's relief had been cruelly short-lived. The nulls said nothing, acting as if they didn't know the name. These these are just procedural slips on her part, right? Some files never left the building, either on data chips or hard copy. She's just been careless. But what's this got to do with me? She's tax enforcement. She's not in my department. But you're in charge of the defense data security breach, Agent Wenin. Jay was patient, if a droid could be. Bessany always assumed they could. And she appears to have been accessing defense budget data. Oh, that can't be right. I know it can't be true, don't I? I'm sure this is just some mistake and it wouldn't be the first time. Let her go back to her desk. I'll talk to her. Apologies, ma'am, but you can't do that. Why? Standing procedure says we're obliged to refer the matter to law enforcement. Ah, good old CSF. Captain Obram would sort out this little mess without a fuss. He made Bessany's armed siege at the med center vanish without a trace, after all. I'll call CSF then. Just to square the books. No, ma'am, 
It's for public domestic security for any breach like this involving civil servants. The head of staff security has alerted them. Bessany found her stomach nodding again. RDS was new, not part of CSF or any civilian law enforcement structure at all, and reported direct to the Chancellor's office. The cozy word domestic belied the true nature of the beast. Well, they'll find they have the wrong person then, she said. Bessany knew they had the wrong woman because she was the perpetrator. But there was nothing she could say to clear her friend that would not end in disaster for Scarada, Ordo, and everyone she now held dear. Now she fully understood the term collateral damage. Arca Barracks, Coruscant, later that day. There was something going wrong. Dharma knew it. Shouldn't we be out hunting bad guys by now? Niner leaned against the transparisteel wall that ran the length of the recreation area overlooking the parade ground. He rested his forehead against the clear sheet, hands in the pockets of his red fatigues. No briefing? What's happening, do you think? Darman, boots up on the low table opposite his chair, was psyching himself up to finally face Skirata, and he couldn't put it off any longer. But when he returned the calm call, Skarada didn't respond. Darman shoved the comm link back in his pants and rehearsed a long monologue to attain in his head for the umpteenth time. I can't sulk about this forever. I have to see Cad. He's mine. Dar? Don't ask, at IK. I thought we were meant to be deployed with Delta. Where are they? Look. We can't do anything until they get some leads for us to follow. You want to kick down every door on Coruscant? Okay, Dar. Just asking. Why would I know? I'm just the coolie labor. I don't get told anything. C.O.R.R. didn't join in. He was examining one of his prosthetic hands, the synth flesh covering peeled back while he tinkered with the miniature servos. He'd lost both arms just above the elbow, and seemed to need to confront the loss head-on. Sometimes he dispensed with the synth flesh and went with the bare metal look, even sharpening his vibroblade on the durasteel fingers the way some females filed their nails. For diversion when bored. Darman took it as bravado. Losing one hand seldom bothered anyone in a society that had good medical care but losing both somehow stripped you of a touchstone of humanity. Bessany had been very distressed by it. C.O.R.R. was the first trooper she'd got to know personally. Dar, C.O.R.R. said at last, Do you want me to come with you? Where? Darman knew exactly where he meant. Clone brothers knew each other so well that they could think like one another, which was usually a comfort but Dar felt more like he was under siege. Why? Because you shouldn't face this on your own. Let's go see your kid. I don't know where he is. I walked out before Atain explained any of that. Well, ask her. Darman wasn't sure what he'd do when he saw his son. He'd been trying hard to recall his face from when Skirata had laid the baby in his arms, so... Now he understood now he knew why Calbert looked so tearful but the kid wasn't going to look like that now. They grew fast, babies. Clones were surrounded by their brothers at every stage of development in Topoka City, because the Kaminoans didn't bother to hide the transparasteel gestation tanks. Darman felt he knew enough about baby boys to handle seeing his own. Okay, he said. He comes Skarada again. Niner didn't need to be told what Darman was doing. He walked over to his brother and stood watching. Son. Skirata's voice sounded a bit breathless, as if he'd been pulled away from some crisis. Yes, he was really was Darman's dad now. It was official, legal, at least on Mandalore. Son, I was worried about you. Are you okay? Yeah. Calbert, where's my son? He's with Lasima at the moment. 
You want to see him, don't you? He's a lovely kid. Yes. Atain's been trying to talk to you. I know. Don't shut her out, son. This is my fault. I'll put it right. Darman heard Ordo say something to Skarada in the background, but he didn't quite catch it. I can't bring him to the barracks while Zayis there. Jedi fake Force-sensitive babies. But not on my watch. Look, we've got a few problems at the moment, but I'll be at the barracks in twenty minutes or so, and we'll work something out. Darman had a long list of questions to ask Skarada, and had been able to ask none of them. He put the comm link away and couldn't marshal his thoughts. He knew what he wanted to do now. He was calmer, still shocked at the enormity of the news, but if there had been no constraints, no duties, he would have gone to Etain, picked up Cad and walked out of the GR too. Well, wherever. Mandalore, probably. He didn't know where Kiramora was, and Fi said the location was secret because a haven for deserters and renegades had to show some discretion. Darman missed Fi. His dream, which was a fancy word for the ideal he'd come to measure his current existence against, was having all his brothers around in Etain, and Juzik, and all the other people he could trust, and now he added Cad to that seeing Cad grow up with all these friends and family around him. It had to be all of them. He didn't want to be on the run, cut off from most of them forever. Better armor up, he said. Can't loaf around in my reds all day. Arca barracks was eerily empty much of the time, with most of the commando squads deployed and only a handful there between missions to debrief, recuperate a little, and pick up any necessary retraining and new kit. Omega had the whole floor to themselves. Darman took a shower and washed his fatigues, then armored up and sat in the locker room, helmet on his lap, waiting. The other three ventured in. They seemed to be expecting him to explode if they said the wrong thing. It was a long twenty minutes. Here he comes, said Aten. Two sets of boots clattered along the corridor, not GR issue, Mandalorian sitar, definitely, from the sound. Skarada's gait had changed since his ankle was fixed. Now his walk sounded like any other soldier's except for the occasional scuff because he was still getting used to not limping. He wore full busker gam in the barracks, as if he was weaning himself off the erudic ways of Coruscant and its civilian fashions. But Skarada walked through the fresher doors in his civilian rig-brown bantha hide jacket and brown pants which was slightly at odds with his heavy mando boots. Vav stood behind him in his black besker gam with his helmet under one arm, Murd at his side. Darike, Skarada said. Come here, son. And Darman did despite himself. He stood up and let Skarada throw his arms around him. Kalbir thought a manly hug sorted a lot of problems, and generally he was right. This time, though, it was going to take more than affection to fix things. I'm sorry, Skarada said. I know you're upset. Aten, C.O.R.R., and Niner leaned against the lockers, moral support for their brother. Why didn't anyone tell me, Bear? Darman asked. Why did Atain lie to me? What did she think I'd do? Is she ashamed of me? Shab, no, son. Skirata's face was anguished and exhausted. She adores you. It was me I stopped her telling you. She wanted to, right from when she knew she was pregnant, but I threatened I'd take the kid away from her if she didn't do as I said. Darman didn't believe him. Skirata might have been a pitilessly hard man, no stranger to violence, but he was the kindest of fathers. He'd never have threatened Etain. Don't cover for her, Calbear. I'm not. It's true. Ask Ordo he walked in on the row, and I'm not going to dress it up. I stopped her telling you, and that was wrong, 
whatever the circumstances. Darman didn't like the feeling growing in his gut right then. Skirata had been the sole anchor in his childhood, the only adult he trusted, his shield against the Kaminoans and everything that scared him. He wanted this not to be true. Atena Tain was a Jedi, and as much as he loved her, she wasn't a foundation in his life like Skirata had been. You put my son in my arms, Darman said, and didn't tell me who he was. I swear to you, son, Orihat, we were going to tell you then. But you said that you weren't ready for babies. So we decided against it. We. All right, me. Leave Atain out of it. She's a kid like you, never had the chance of a normal life, and she did her best because she needed something to love when she wasn't allowed to, ever. She loves you, and she loves Cad. I'm the one who should have known better. Darman knew what was happening inside him now. He recognized it. So did Niner. He moved a little closer, as if he was going to take Darman's arm and tell him it was okay, and things would be better now. Darman was angry and hurt. He knew he had to let that steam vent out carefully. Why did you stop her the first time? I thought it would distract you when you were fighting, and you'd get yourself killed, said Skirata. Vav was still silent. In a room full of soldiers, there was now really only Skirata and Darman. And I didn't know if you could take it emotionally. A lot of men with more life experience than you run away when they find out they're going to be a dad. So am I a man, like anyone else? Or am I always going to be a kid who needs everything done for him? Look, I was wrong. Skirata looked rough now. His eyes glazed with unshed tears, and his voice was shaky. You should have been told. You should have been there when Cad was born. I took that from you, and I'll never forgive myself. Yeah, this wasn't about Atain. Somehow... For all the knowledge he lacked of normal family life, Dharma knew felt that she was in as big a mess as him, but Skirata was the grown-up, the seasoned warrior, the father, the veteran sergeant, the one who should have taken the situation in hand. I want to see Cad, Dharma said. When we go off duty tonight, I want to see my son. And Atain? Dharma thought. Yes, he could face her now. He nodded. But he wasn't satisfied. The floodgates had opened, and he couldn't close them. He had to know everything. What's happening, Kalbir? I mean the rest of it? We know we don't get told everything, but you're always up to something, and you don't tell us. You said problem when I come to you. Skirata looked at Vav who shrugged and went to stand guard at the doors with Murd. Skarada held out his hand. Come on. Bucket show me all your helmets are offline. Don't you trust us? C.O.R.R. asked. Of course I trust you. I just don't want any potentially live links while we talk. I'm getting paranoid about security breaches and the tech the Arutais can get hold of. Things are not going great. Terrific, said Aden sourly, flipping his helmet upside down between his palms and showing a totally unlit interior, all systems down. We're not amateurs. Neither is Jane, said Skarada, but some Republic Jobsworth knows someone's been in their network. What network? Niner asked. Treasury. Darman knew that Bessany had slipped codes to Skirata from the start. He could guess what was coming, or at least he thought he could. Jane's been caught slicing? Or was it Bessany? Neither. Her friend Jilka's been picked up by the RDS bully boys instead, and even Jailer Obram can't make that problem go away. Jilka knows one thing too many. It might put Bessany in the frame. 
But what's she done? First things first, Scarada said. I need to go in and shut Jilka up before she tells Palpatine's heavies too much. Shut Jilka up. Niner did his conscience of the GR Act, that resigned expression that said he'd follow orders but he didn't have to like it and he'd argue. As in slaughter. If need be, yes. Aden looked at Darman. She's Bessany's buddy. And it's Bessany she'll implicate. In what? Niner asked. Scarado was talking about something to thwart the Chancellor. It was the first explicit proof Darman had that he was running his own operation not in parallel with the Republic's interests, or outside them, but against them. Darman loved and respected Calbert, but he was under no illusions about his methods. He'd been up to something daiji for a long time. Fai's extraction, the base on Mandalore, Ko Sai, the bank job on Maijito with Vav that Delta didn't talk about something major was happening. Scarado was well off the chart. And so were the Nulls. Just tell us, Darman said. We're big boys now. Put your credits where your mouth is, if you meant what you said to me a minute ago. Scarada paced slowly around the fresher with his head lowered, staring at the gray tiled floor as if he was working up to saying something awful. Valve was getting impatient at the doors, doing that sigh and head shake that meant he was going to cut in and tell them if Scarada didn't. But Darman wanted to hear it from Calbert. For Shab's sake tell them, Cal, Vav said. Skirava let out a long breath. Ad Ike, what I'm going to tell you must not, absolutely not, go beyond us. Do you understand? Not even if the Chancellor orders you to answer. Especially not then. He looked at Niner. That means you too. You're as straight as a die, son but this isn't the time or the place for being master ethical. So Aiden had told Skarada about Niner's row with him over letting Sul Desert and walk free. Niner drew his head back slightly as if he was hurt by the suggestion. We're not going to like this, are we, Calbert? Skarada was all business again, eyes dry, as if they hadn't had the conversation about babies and lies at all. This is a need-to-know job. Not because I don't trust you, but because what you don't know usually can't drop you in it. Usually. We get it, Aden said. Just tell us. It's not Jilka who's been mining the Treasury's data. It's Bessany. And I got her to do it. We don't live in a world now where you get a lawyer and a trial you end up committing suicide whether you want to or not, like that h &E hack. But nobody has been told about it scares the living Asik out of me. So. Okay, I'll blurt it out. When the big red button gets pushed we get out. And I mean we. Darman heard Niner fidgeting. His armor rustled against the fabric of his bodysuit. They'd all talked around the subject, about what would happen after the war ended and now they knew. Was the war going to end, though? Shouldn't we be there for the final big push? C.O.R.R. asked. Do our bid? Seems a shame to leave the party early. Son, I don't know the full details, and it's not for want of trying. Skirata fastened his jacket, looking as if the snatch discussion was coming to an abrupt end. But the more I find out, the less I think this is going to end well for the likes of you and me. I, the Nulls, Vav, and me, we've been getting an escape route together, and a refuge for any man who wants to leave the Gia without a body bag. And we're getting close to finding out how to stop your accelerated aging. It's a whole new life, Ad Ike, a long one like any other humans. Are you in? Will you come with me when I say it's time to run? There was another communal silence. Drip. 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 Another leaky faucet joined the first in a quietly insistent chorus. 
So it's true about Kosai. Niner said at last. We didn't kill her, son, but we've got her research. Every being needed some certainty in their life. Darman knew that some needed more than others, and he didn't need as much as Aten seemed to. But one thing he did need was to know that Cal Scarata was the honest foundation stone of the clone's sense of identity. Right now, there was nothing solid left under Darman. He was adrift. He couldn't rely on Calbert to level with him. The unknown and invisible was worse than incoming fire you could see. You never told us, Darman said quietly. Again, you decide what we get to know. Dar, leave it, said Kor. Soldier's lot in life, that is. Calbert, you kept us in the dark. Like you kept me in the dark about Cad. Darman found himself looking down into. It was a tough line to follow. But Niner, being Niner, tried. So you slot Jilka to save Bessany. If you knew what Bessany had found, Nike, you'd understand. And it's not just about Bessany. What the shab is it? Darman snapped. Come on, Calbear, spit it out. Skirata dropped his voice almost to a whisper. Palpatine's developing a new clone army. A big one. It shouldn't have felt like a slap in the face, but it did. It was reinforcements, but it didn't feel like it. What, you mean more of us? Well, that's Dash. Morphet clones, yes, but not from Kamino. He's fallen out with Lama Su. Got his own production plants, and building lots more ships. I think the clones from the 14th are the vanguard. And the guys were seeing around the city. It was all getting too messy for Darman. There was something wrong. It was the kind of strategic information that special forces needed to know. If reinforcements were coming, they should have been told just like he should have been told he had a son. About time, said Niner. We're stretched thin enough to read a holozine through us. Okay, Calbir, that's all we need to know. But that still doesn't fully explain why Jilka's a problem. Niner, Naviodi, shut up, will you? Said C.O.R.R. No, you need to know this, all of it, because it's going to blow up soon, Skarada said. I want you to be ready to save yourselves. It was so quiet in the freshers that Darman could hear a faint, distant, distracting drip from a faucet. Okay, full story, said Niner. The extra troops aren't going to be deployed for some months. Skirata held his hand up in front of his chest as if to quell argument that hadn't even started. Palpatine's holding them back, but they're fully developed. Fast-grown Sparty clones, we think, mature enough to fight within a year or so, not grown Kamino style like you millions and millions of them. He's got a big push planned, and the fact that nobody... Skirata's eyes, oblivious of everyone else. The pressure in his head, right behind his eyes, felt almost like a bad dose of flu that had hit him in just a few moments. He couldn't hold it much longer. What else don't you tell us? How can I trust you? Dar, I'm sorry. Skirata put his hands on Darman's arms as if to soothe him, but Darman pulled away. That's why I'm telling you everything now. I said, what else? I'm not holding anything back. At least I don't think I am Dash. You wouldn't even know if you were lying. It's all just one big lie. Skirata's eyes changed. Something went out of them. Light, life, whatever. But Darman had wounded him. Son, I'm not exactly an Israt holy man. I admit that. But whatever I did, however stupid it was, I did because I love you boys more than you'll ever know. Liar, said Darman. Liar. And he punched Calbear in the face. 
The shock of the impact traveled up Darman's arm into his shoulder in slow motion. He heard the yells to stop, felt someone grab his arm, but shook them off. Skirata fell against the tiled wall. He started yelling, too. Leave him, leave him, get out and leave us, Dash. But the feeling didn't stop for Darman, not even when the punch exploded in pain. The feeling that his lungs were going to burst if he didn't get rid of this hammering pulse in his throat. Darman hauled Skirata upright and hit him again. He heard the oof and felt the spit on his face, but Skirata didn't hit back. It's okay, son. Skirata gasped, scrambling to his feet, arms held away from his sides. All Darman could see was blood, nothing else. It's okay. Let it out. I asked for it. Darman wasn't aware of much else for the next few seconds, maybe minutes. He had no idea except hitting and hitting and hitting Skirata anywhere he could reach. No focus, no aim. There wasn't even Skirata, not really. There was just this weird rage, half terror, and Darman wanted it out of him because he couldn't draw another breath with it still inside him. Valve was shouting at the others to get out and leave them to it. Then all Darman could hear was rasping breath. It was his own. Skirata was panting, too. When Darman looked down at his hands, they were raw and bleeding, and his first thought was that he hadn't put his armored gauntlets on, and he was glad. He landed back in reality, shocked. Calbear, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Skirata leaned back against the wall, legs out in front of him. Darman could still only see the blood not the face, just blood from the old sergeant's nose and mouth. Skirata wiped it with the back of his hand and smeared it everywhere. Darman was almost paralyzed with horror and regret. The smell of the blood made him feel unsteady. But he edged forward and lifted Skirata to his feet. Do you want to talk, son? Skirata paused, put one hand on the wall to steady himself, and spat into the nearest basin. He could hardly get the words out. Or do you? Want to be alone for a while? I'm sorry. Shab, I'm sorry, Beardash, I'm sorry, too. It's okay. Come here. Skirata embraced him. He actually hugged him although it felt as if he was also hanging on to him to stay upright. Darman felt he was now in a stranger's body, because he didn't know how he could ever have done such a thing to Calbear. He didn't know what had erupted from him. But it had gone away. And Skirata just held him as if he hadn't hurt him at all. Now, what do you need, son? I don't want to talk, Darman said but I don't want to be alone, either. It's going to be fine, don't you worry. Skirata spat more bloody saliva. Something hard pinged in the basin. Everything's going to turn out okay. Chapter 10 So what's wrong with being a mercenary? Is your war worth fighting? If it is, then why does it matter who fights it for you? Aren't we imbued with the righteousness of your cause when we take up arms for you? Would you rather your own men and women died to make the point? And if your war is so noble, so necessary, why aren't you fighting it yourself? Think of all that before you spit on us, Uruatai. Jaster Mariel, Man Alor, Aiori Ramikade, speaking to the regent of Mech via UIL, ten years before dying at the hands of a comrade he trusted. Arca Barracks, three hours later, 998 days ADG. General Zay filled the corridor, robes flapping as he bore down like a band of stampede. At least it looked that way to Scorch. Zay was on the warpath. These quiet days when everyone seemed to be on the brink of screaming anger and nothing was getting shot, vibrabladed, or blown up Scorch knew there was far worse lurking under the surface. He was fed up waiting for op orders when he could taste the tension in the air. Vav and Murd walked head-on toward the Jedi as if he was a minor inconvenience. 
Sergeant Vav. He barked. No Wallen then. What in the name of the force happened to Skirata? I've just passed him. Vav was the only being Scorch had ever seen who could come to a halt grudgingly. He's fine. He is not fine. He's badly injured. He can't even stand up straight. Vav inhaled slowly. We were having a philosophical discussion, as Mandalorians often do, and I asserted that the only demonstrable reality was individual consciousness, but he insisted on the existence of a priori moral values that transcended free will. So I hit him. Say he didn't even blink. You think you're so witty. No, I think you should stay out of Mando clan business. It's for your own good. Now, do you want to report or not? Zay gestured Vav into a side lobby. So the old Shakar really had been spying on Skirata. Scorch was actually surprised, and even a little disappointed but Zay had a point, and it was an inarguable order. Scorch stood to one side, trying to look and feel as if he wasn't listening intently. I see that arrests have been swift, Zay said. Some stupid clerk, General, said Vav. So Skirata is not your traitor, even though he is a light-fingered little scumbag who'd steal your teeth if you smiled at him. But I don't think you'll see a continuation of his dishonest habits, because he now understands the error of his ways. Scorch translated into plain language. So Vav had given Skirata a good hiding for causing trouble and made him swear not to rip off Republic funds and kid again. That was... unexpected. Scorch had always had Skirata down as the Alpha Mando, even if he had to stand on a box to headbutt Vav. I'm relieved. Zay nodded shoulders relaxing visibly. I didn't want to think I was that far misguided about his motives. We still have a job to do, General. The suspect this tax clerk the RDS is holding. The Chancellor can set up as many internal enforcement agencies as he wishes, but I have no faith in anyone's interrogation ability but my own. I'd like to talk to her. Good luck, Zay said. I'm just the Director of Special Forces. My wishes count for nothing. Exactly so RDS won't share information with us any more freely than Intel does, so I'm planning to stroll over there and extract her if need be. Say he spread his hands in mock helplessness. My authorization will get you no farther than the front doors. No, I mean authorize me for the retrieval. That's extreme. So are the rumors I hear about a big enemy assault coming soon. I'll grab every source I can get. Zay clasped his hands in front of him in that Jedi way, looking slightly sideways at Vav. Trying to sense any dark side in me, General? Vav asked. You don't feel remotely dark. Quite serene, actually. I've been told that before, and that should set off your warning bells, Jedi. Your senses need recalibrating. None of you can feel darkness right under your noses. Okay, agreed. Do it. If it goes wrong, you're on your own. I wouldn't have it any other way. It was another non-conversation that had not taken place about a subject that wasn't for discussion, deniable. Zay strode off at high speed boots studding, cloak napping like wings, a giant hawk bat of a man. What do you want us to do, Sarge? Vav summoned Murd back to his side with a silent gesture. Nothing. Sarge, we can dash. No. You can't. Sorry. This crosses the line from soldier to. Well, I don't want you involved with this. I needed Zay to know what I was doing, but it's better you don't ask why either. Okay, Sarge. Scorch activated his helmet comm link, wondering if Fav didn't think they were good enough to take on RDS. I'll get the schematics of the security cells, 
and we'll have you an operational plan inside half an hour. Scrap the plan, Scorch, but the schematics would be very welcome. Get some rest. Kashyyyk is going to wring you dry. Okay, Sarge. They had time to give him a bit of help. We wouldn't foul up, honest. I know. But this is too dirty and political even for special ops. Concentrate on Kashyyyk. Real soldiering to be done there. Vav gave him a thumbs-up gesture and walked away toward the accommodation wing. So what did he know about a big assault? There was always one coming, and Vav was good at leaving everyone wondering just how much he knew, just enough revealed to make folks take notice of him. He knew an awful lot about Jedi, that was for sure. Scorch slapped down his own curiosity and told it to behave. He didn't care how Vav knew. He was just glad that he did and he trusted him, because Vav's words always came back to him from those first days on Kamino. Everything I do from this moment on is to make sure you survive to fight. Even if I don't. Yes, Sarge, Scorch said. We know. Kirimorat Mandalore. I want to come with you, Fi said. I can go, can I, Parja? Please? All Fi knew was that things were going badly wrong back on Coruscant. Juzik was packing up to go back, a day sooner than he'd said. He never broke his word, if he said he'd stay four days, then four days it was. But he looked preoccupied as he stowed his bag in the burn-streaked aggressor starfighter he used as a runabout. Juzik's metamorphosis from modest Jedi Knight to Mandalorian bad boy not just in appearance had been dizzyingly fast, as if he'd swapped one set of passionate beliefs for another without pausing to think. Maybe that was what being raised in a cult did to a man. He only knew how to surrender himself to an ideal. Fine knew how that felt, and how adrift you could feel when that certainty was snatched away. Juzik's taste for fast, dangerous transport hadn't changed one bit, though. The aggressor was the bounty hunter special, with a decent hyperdrive and even holding cells. Your call, Fika, said Parja. Just remember that you're a deserter, or you're dead or you're stolen Republic property, whichever way they look at you. So you better not get caught if you do go. Juzik fastened his bag, seeming not to hear. One good thing about being a Jedi was that I never own enough stuff to worry about packing. Now I'm working out what I need to get rid of to travel light. Me? Fi said. I know, I'll slow you down. No, I never said that. I swear I won't be a burden. I've just come, Calbert. We've got a loo problems to sort out. At least Dar knows about Cad now, and... Well, that's resolved. So why are you rushing back? We're in, he final phase now, Fi. We've got a lot to do before we can pull everyone out and Skirata needs all hands on deck. You said I was as fit as an average human. Fi made his mind up. He was going to go, even if he had to make his own way to the core. I'm probably as fit as Kalbir, and you're not stopping him. Juzik looked at Parja as if he was appealing to her to back him up. She didn't. Bardike, I'd rather he stayed here with me, she said but he can make his own decisions, and I'll still be here when he comes home. No Mando woman ever stopped her man going to war. You could come too, Fi said. And it's not exactly a war. You don't need me holding your hand any longer, Fi. Besides, someone's got to keep this place going, and I've got the workshop to worry about too. It'll be a few weeks. That's all. Juzik looked over his shoulder for a moment, as if he'd heard something, then shrugged and slammed the cargo hatch shut. You're not going to give up, are you? No. Take him, Bardike, Parja said. 
I'll worry myself sick about him every minute he's away, but forcing him to sit it out won't help him get better. Juzik didn't answer. He walked around the blunt tail section of the fighter and looked as if he was checking the airframe, but Fine knew him well enough to see that it was just marking time while something else not the ongoing argument was taking his attention. What's wrong? Parja asked, drawing her blaster from her belt. She did it casually, as if she was going to clean it. But when she flicked the charge button, Fi caught on. They had company. Nobody should have been able to find them here, but Juzik had sensed something. Maybe nothing, Juzik said, but he had his hand on his belt, too, and that meant he was feeling for his lightsaber. It was weird to see a Mando in traditional Beskar Gam even handling that weapon. Juzik rarely activated it now, but like any soldier he defaulted to what he'd been trained to do. The body remembered. It didn't need the conscious mind. Jedi started lightsaber training when they were four years old. Fi hadn't drawn a blaster in earnest for a long time, and the short custom Wester 20 still didn't feel right in his grip. Juzik turned to face out toward the field, scanning the landscape with slow care. Get down, he said. Fi, Parja, find some cover. Parja grabbed Fi's sleeve and forced him behind the protection of one of the aggressor's twin manipulator arms. I thought we were hidden here, Fi whispered. Nobody's supposed to be able to find us. Juzik took a few steps forward. Fi heard his boots crunching on the gravel. There's two of you, he called out. You're not sure if you're really bitter enough to kill me or if you're desperate for help. I can even pinpoint your position. The fields didn't answer. There were no engine or drive sounds, not even in the distance, just the sound of wind hushing the trees, and the distant rhythmic bark of a shatchel buck announcing he was in town and looking for does. It was a shame Juzik wasn't wearing his bicy. He could have sent Fi some coordinates to aim at. Come to that, Fi wasn't wearing his either. Come on, I know what a clone feels like in the Force. Juzik called. You're all different, Vode, but I can still sense the things you have in common. The seed heads on the grass fifty meters ahead rustled and shivered. Parja squinted down the optics of her blaster. I think I got M, she said. Stang, that Jedi of yours is a human rangefinder. I reckon it's that Shabir Sul and his crazy buddy. Can you see them? No, just the movement. Hold fire, then, Sire Rike. If I tried to follow her aim, he'd been a top-grade sniper. He felt the reduction to ordinary skill levels keenly. They're arc troopers. They're not that incompetent. Juzik had always had an odd reckless streak. For the most part, he was a methodical man, good at engineering and fixing things. But then he'd go and do something crazy, almost as if he wanted to test himself. Fi recalled a terrifying high-speed speeder bike ride through Coruscant on Juzik's pillion. Now Juzik walked slowly across the open ground and out into the knee-high grasses, making himself a target. Parja shifted her weight slightly down on one knee with her elbows supported on a strut of the aggressor's airframe. All right, get it over with. Juzik called. He held his arms away from his sides. Parja, Fi? You will not open fire. Here? Not unless Sol or Spar starts it. A few moments later, the grass parted, and two figures in green Beskergam got to their feet. Asik, Parja said, adjusting her aim. They were two meters to the right of where I thought they were. They're good at throwing you off. Fi had promised Sol he'd kill him if he messed with Juzik, and he was going to make good on that if the Shabirs so much as twitched. And they're too good at tracking us. We're getting sloppy. 
Phi broke cover and went to back up Juzik, blaster still aimed. Parja covered him. Disappointingly, either Ark had laid down his own weapon. If you've come to put a round through me, go ahead, Juzik said. Phi thought he was pulling some clever ruse, but then it dawned on him that he was serious. Bard I.K. was standing there like a target, asking for some weird martyrdom. If it gives you closure, do it. Phi stepped into his path. Bard I.K. Enough. Phi. Either I believe in what I'm doing, or I don't. Spar pulled off his helmet. You're really full of it, Jedi. I'm not a Jedi now, but I was, and so I have to bear some of the guilt. Spar holstered his blaster, and Sul followed suit. Phi didn't move. Parja walked up and pulled him aside. What's your problem? She demanded, scowling at the two deserters. Go spray your testosterone elsewhere. You don't even know how to be Mandoade. But if you want a lesson, I'll give you one. It's more than putting on the Besker Gam. How did you find us? Juzik asked. You fly a fighter like that, you get attention. Sul said. Try parking it undercover next time. Juzik put out his hand to shut Phi up even before Phi had formed the words, which was just as well. You make a good point, Naviodi. I was careless. What do you want from us? We hear that Skarata might be onto something. Art gossip, eh? Is it true? Can he stop us aging so fast? Not yet. So it's true that he's trying. If your gossip is that reliable, then you know the answer, and you know he'd help any deserter. Sul looked at Spar. Did he help you get off Kamino? Spar just raised an eyebrow. He's okay, the old Barve. We want in, Sul said. How do we get to see him? Is he recruiting? Room for eight in an aggressor. Juzik gestured over his shoulder at the starfighter. We're heading back to Karuskant. If you're up for some work, we've got plenty of jobs to keep a bored ARC trooper busy. Juzik was insanely trusting. Phi wanted to grab his shoulders and shake him, and explain that he couldn't just dump two renegade alpha planks on Calbear like that or on. Ordo but whatever Juzik picked up from the force usually seemed to work out. Except for forgetting that we need to camouflage all vessels right away. Even here, even on Mandalore. Okay, said Sol. Let's go. Juzik popped the hatches and ushered them into the small cargo area. Parja nudged Phi with her elbow, hands on hips, chin down. Now that Phi was on the brink of leaving, the reality of being parted from her hit him hard. He missed his brothers, he felt useless, and he needed to get something back in his life but he'd craved a girlfriend for so long. I'm ungrateful. I get what I want, and then I forget what it was like to he that lonely. Well, I said you were worth fixing up, and Juzik and me, we fixed you up, so. She looked resigned. Want me to pack some food for you? Just. Well, my backpack. You be careful. Phi was a little disappointed that she didn't beg him to stay. Maybe that really was how Mandalorian women did things. They gritted their teeth and got on with it while the men were away, if they weren't off fighting themselves. They didn't fuss and make parting even harder. You know I love you, he said. Shah, he couldn't remember the words of the contract. He had to open his data pad. Now marry me. Parja was still wearing her workshop overalls, spattered with lubricant, pockets ratting with tools. She wiped her hands on her pants and held out her hand to him to grip it in the Mandalorian way, hand to wrist. Phi took it. 
You know the words, Fika? I can read them out. Okay, Parja said. We read them together. She looked into his face. He found that he could repeat her words with just a fraction's delay and do a pretty good job of making the pledge together without the need to look at the words on his pad. Mmm, by solistome. She said and he joined in. Mmm, my solistartome. And Chai Midinuyen, and Chai Biayuri Verde. It was a very simple pledge, a contract, a business deal in its way. We are one when together, we are one when parted, we share all, we will raise warriors. There wasn't anything more that needed saying. Is that it? Fai asked. Yeah, you're stuck with me now. Okay. That's good. Yeah, you'll do too. Juzik stuck his head out the hatch. Fi, did I miss something? We're married, Fi said. Did he feel different? Yes, he really did. You can see Parja blew our savings on her wedding gown. You Mirsheb. She gave Fi a big, noisy kiss. You're lucky you've got a missus who knows how to replace a manifold gasket. Now, Bardike. You bring him back in the same or better condition, or this galaxy won't be big enough to hide from me. It was always best to leave fast once you decided to go. Long drawn out goodbyes were painful. Fi discovered that for the first time in his life, and although it hurt, it was nothing like the pain of thinking he'd live and die lonely. It was a pain he could savor, to remind himself what he now had and what was worth living and fighting for. The aggressor lifted clear. Parja was still visible for a few seconds, a tiny figure in brown, then a dot. The camouflaged bastion just looked like uneven ground from the air. Aren't you supposed to celebrate? Juzik asked, engaging the autopilot. Sol and Spar were aft in the hold. I think it's really sad to marry and then part. It's not forever. And we had the honeymoon already, I suppose. Even so. Okay, we can do the drinking and carousing later. That was a nice thought. Everyone could attend then. There was an end in sight of sorts to the war, and even if Skirata never found a way of slowing the aging process, Fi would live the years he had left to the fullest. Karuskin stood between him and that happier time. But he was back in action again, and that made him feel whole. He gazed out the viewport at the star's cape before the aggressor jumped to hyperspace, and thought of Sicko, the TIV pilot killed helping Omega board a separatist ship. Space was a big, lonely place to die. Bardike, I think Calbear is going to go nuts when you turn up with these two, he said, diverting himself from thoughts of Sicko. They found us. The Bastion's supposed to be off the chart. And how do they know about the aging cure? Why trust them enough to bring them along? Juzik gave Fi that look, as if he was wearing a sun visor and letting it slide down his nose so that he could look over the rim. If they're secure in the hold they're not wandering around blabbing about how they found us, are they? And Spars almost certainly still got contacts in the Ark ranks. I'd put my bets on Maze talking to his arc chums about Ko's size head showing up in a box. That's disgusting. Yeah. Don't think that I feel sorry for her. She never saw us as anything that could feel pain. But when I look back at the things I've done that seemed normal at the time. That's war, Fi. You don't have to feel bad about it. You really didn't have a choice. She did. You can tell what I'm thinking, can't you? Sometimes. You're a good brother, Bardike. If I calculated the time to triple zero, they'd be landing by nightfall in Galactic City. Now he was starting to get that tingle in his gut, like pre-battle anxiety, because Parja was right. He wasn't just returning to base. 
He was sneaking back as a man who didn't exist, and he couldn't afford to be caught. It was like operating behind enemy lines. He'd had plenty of experience at that. Karuskant, triple zero, was now enemy territory. Lasima's apartment, Karuskant. Etain watched the doors, mouth dry and stomach nodded. She could feel Darman coming closer, and Skarada too. She knew their impressions in the force so well that she could pin them down pretty accurately. There were variations from day to day, but they always had the same cores, Skarada, a whirlpool of intense loves and hatreds, and Darman, generally at peace with the world. Today, though, she could feel the change in both of them, from Darman's anguish and uncertainty, and from Skirata's raw pain. But she still wasn't ready for what she saw when the doors parted. Cal, what happened to you? Skirata looked terrible. He was slightly bent over, as if his chest or stomach hurt him, and his face was a mass of cuts and fresh bruises. Someone had given him a thrashing. Vav. She thought the two sergeants had settled their long-running feud, but it seemed to have erupted again. I got what was coming to me. He said his voice distorted by swollen lips. Not the first time, either, and it won't be the last. He pushed Darman ahead of him with a careful hand. Go on, son. You've got someone to meet. Cal Dash. ETK, just grab this time with Dar and Cad and I'll sort myself out. You don't know when you'll next get a chance. I'll be back in the morning, and the seam is staying with Jailer's family for the night. Cal's injuries had rescued her from an awkward moment. Darman hadn't spoken to her since he walked out of her cabin on Nera Station a few days ago, and she'd had no idea how to break that ice again. But that was suddenly forgotten now. Darman's embrace was desperate. He buried his head in her shoulder, hugging her so hard that it almost hurt. Etain looked past him to see what Skarada was doing, but he was already gone. She heard his footsteps fade outside. Cad's asleep, she said. I'll wake him. Is that bad for him? Darman was already the anxious father. Of course not, she said. He sleeps when he's tired. But it's hard to get him into a routine because we don't have one. Lasima looks after him? Yes, she's wonderful. And Bessany helps out, and Bardan and Cal. But... It's time he knew his dad. Okay. Darman swallowed. I'm ready now. I really am. I don't know what else to say, Dar. Nothing you need to say. We can't change what happened so it makes sense to forget it and start again. That was Darman all over. He never bore grudges and was the most easygoing of men. If anyone thought clones were identical, all they had to do was look at Darman and his brothers to see that they were as diverse as any random group of human beings. Am I forgiven? She asked. Yes. He stepped back and pinched his top lip, a little nervous gesture that she'd seen in Skirata from time to time. In ordinary civilian clothes, no fatigues or armor that marked him as a standardized product of Kaminodarman looked like any other being Etain might see on the walkways of Karuskant, and that promised the same possibility for her. It was me, Etik. I hit Kalber. It was hard to take in. What? I really hurt him. He didn't even try to defend himself. He just let me go crazy and kept saying he was sorry. The thought of Darman even losing his temper seemed utterly alien, let alone doing that much harm to someone he loved to anyone, in fact. It was a different kind of violence from the kind he was used to in combat. Is it? Am I so steeped in Jedi belief that violence is acceptable if it's not done from hate or anger that I can't see something fundamental? What started it? She asked. 
He told me everything he kept from us. Everything. Kosai's research, the new clone army. So I called him a liar. I told him I couldn't trust him. And with him not telling me about Cad, I just... hated him for a moment. No, not even him. I just lost it completely, about everything, just like Scorch did. It was the first time Atain had realized how broken some of the clone troops were. It was one thing haranguing other Jedi about the clone's inherent humanity. It was another to recognize that it had a negative side, too. Atain had come to see them as invulnerable because she recognized their superior qualities, and forgot that, in time, the intensity with which they fought would shatter them as surely as it would any other being. It just took much longer. How can he forgive me, E.T.I.K.? Darman asked. Because he loves you, you're his son. It wasn't the punches that would leave the scars on Skarata. She knew that. It was losing Darman's trust. Have you forgiven him? Darman glanced at his own hands. The ferocity of his attack showed in the cuts and bruises on his knuckles. Of course I have. I didn't mean any of it. I was just out of it for a few minutes. People always claimed they didn't mean the things they said in the heat of the moment, but usually they simply didn't know they thought those things, or would dare say them aloud. Do you think he's keeping any other secrets from you, Dar? I don't know, he said. But it doesn't matter now. Love and trust weren't necessarily the same thing. Atain decided to change the subject. Let's see if Cad's awake. He wasn't. He was sleeping peacefully, and they stood watching him for a while, mesmerized until Atain picked him up and handed him to Darman. Cad woke and looked up at Darman with endearing wide-eyed surprise. Could he tell this wasn't Ordo or Mario? Maybe he could. He grinned he grinned at everyone, of course but this seemed different somehow. Maybe she was imagining it. He'd reacted strongly to Darman when he held him before. That's Dida, Atain said. Say Dida, sweetie. Darman just burst into tears. Atain did too. There wasn't a lot to say, just a lot to feel, so either of them tried to rationalize it. They spent the rest of the late afternoon and evening playing with Cad and pretending that there wasn't a war outside waiting for them, that they were just any ordinary young family. They even recorded a family hollow image for the years to come. It was an exotic, heady fantasy for people who were anything but ordinary, and wouldn't be allowed to be ordinary without a fight. Etain pondered the irony of desperately wanting not to be special. I'm glad you called him Cad. Darman said at last. Are you happy that he's growing up as a little Mandalorian? Will he be able to use the Force? Juzik and I are starting to show him how to control it. Well, to hide it, really. I don't want the Jedi Order taking him. Darman's expression hardened a little. Would they do that? With a benign smile, but yes. They would. It's not all nice, the Jedi Order, is it? It's not quite the image we were given on Kamino. Not all Jedi are the same. I still want Cad to be Mandalorian. So do I. Atain held Cad's hands and walked him to Darman, but he pulled away and tottered toward his father with a big adoring grin on his face. Darman let him clamber over him, looking equally besotted. He looks like you. Darman said, ignoring the fact that Cad was the spitting image of himself. Cad had wide dark eyes and black hair, like Darman and all his brothers. But his nose was narrow and slightly upturned, like Atain's. I should have been there when he was born, shouldn't I? I've seen it in the holodramas. Real life isn't as tidy as that, Atain said. And I'm glad you weren't there, in a way. It wasn't my finest hour. Did it hurt? Like you wouldn't believe. 
It was funny how physical pain could be completely forgotten. As Etain watched Darman coming to terms with a baby son when he was no more than a kid himself in so many ways, she was struck by how much he reminded her of Skarada as he handled Cad and talked to him, even down to the faces he pulled to make him laugh. Humans did some things instinctively, and not even cloning and the heartless regime on Kamino could suppress that, but the rest of parenting they had to learn the hard way. She'd never known Django Fett, but his genome hadn't dictated everything in Darman. Skarada's influence was plain. In every sense of the word Skarada was Dar's father, and had laid down the foundations for the kind of father that Darman would be. Eliot Orishaya Talden Family was definitely more than bloodline and more than midi-chlorians. Chapter 11 the Mandalorian language has more terms of insult than any of the more widely spoken galactic tongues. But whereas most species choose insults that are based on parentage or appearance, the majority of Mandalorian pejoratives are concerned with cowardice, stupidity, laziness, dull conversation, or a lack of hygiene. It reveals the preoccupations of a nomadic warrior culture where bloodline matters less than personal qualities. Faces are largely masked, and a clean, efficient camp is crucial to survival. Mandalorians, Identity and Language, published by the Galactic Institute of Anthropology. Bessany Wenin's Apartment, Coruscant, 999 Days ABG. I can't carry on like this, Ordo. Bessany hadn't slept well. She'd woken and started tidying her apartment in the middle of night. Ordo had no idea what was normal for a human female, but it made sense to him that if you couldn't sleep, you used the time productively. Tidiness was essential to good discipline. She was very upset, and she seemed more upset that he'd carried on sleeping while she couldn't. I know it must be very stressful, he said watching her scrubbing frantically at the breakfast dishes. But I don't think you should stay here. It's too dangerous. She whipped around so hard that her hair flew. I meant Jilka. She's under arrest, and terrible things might be happening to her, and it's my fault. Ordo, sweetheart, I know this is daily routine in your job, but it's not every day in mine. Ordo was still unsure what evidence might link Jilka to Bessany. The woman had no idea what was going on. I however hard RDS tried. They couldn't beat out of her what wasn't in there to be revealed, although being said all kinds of things under torture just to get it to stop. He poured himself another cup of CAF, and wondered where Mariel and Jane had got to. Watching his brothers come and go reminded him how tied to Coruscant he was most days. Ordo, are you listening? Yes, it's a pity about Jilka. Pity? Pity? Bessany was strikingly beautiful, with a bone structure so perfect that it seemed manufactured, but when she got angry, it all turned to ice, tight-lipped and unforgiving. I'm the guilty party. My friends in some RDS prison cell in my place. I can't let that happen. I just can't. So what do you plan on doing? Ordo didn't think the two women were that close but Bessany seemed to have no friends at all other than Jilka. Turn yourself in, and tell Palpatine's minions the whole story? Implicate Calbir? Bring down the escape plan? But she's innocent. Bessany wasn't a soldier, and she wasn't used to the idea of expendability. Ordo wasn't completely inured to it either but he accepted there was sometimes a call to be made between doing the right thing in the short term and making a bigger difference in the longer run. It was a call he hadn't had to make at that level of personal involvement yet. And there was the small matter that he was besotted with Bessany and didn't know Jilka at all. He tried hard to experience his beloved's anxiety for her friend, but he knew he was like Calbert. There was a circle of those he would sacrifice everything to save, and anyone outside that had to save themselves. It happens all the time. 
Ordo said. We had to let a company of troopers get creamed because we couldn't alert them to an attack without letting the separatists know that we'd cracked their encryption. We? Personally? No. Would I have done that? Ordo didn't know. Then you don't know what it's like to be in my shoes. Bessany's problem was that she was very moral. He liked that about her. It was why she refused to turn a blind eye to the exploitation of clones. It was why she put her own safety on the line. But it was also why she couldn't handle seeing Jilka arrested in her place. And apart from rescuing Jilka, there was no way of easing Bessany's conscience. Ordo was more worried about what Jilka might feel forced to say to the RDS interrogators. Skirata was supposed to have done something about that, if it wasn't already too late, and now Ordo had his own moral dilemma. Should he tell Bessany that Jilka might be silenced for good by the very people Bessany had taken the crazy risk for in the first place? He needed to say something tactful. He racked his brain for the kind of words Skirata would use in these circumstances. This might sound harsh, he said carefully, but you wanted to do your bit in a war. This is what war is like. The consequences cost lives, our friends might suffer unfairly, and it's not like any other job. It's as extreme as life gets. There are no rules, and you don't go home at the end of the day with your life set back to normal for another day in the office tomorrow. It was all true. Ordo was quite pleased that he had managed not to say it was tough luck, and that in the time that Jilka had been detained, thousands of clone troopers had been maimed or killed, also without deserving it. Yes. Bessany let out a breath through her nose, a resigned sigh. But if it was me in there, I'd want to think someone was going to try to do something to help me. Maybe they will, Ordo said. And if they do, we won't know the result until later. She could make what she wanted of that. If he lied to her, though, could he live with it any more than she could? Would she hate him when she found out? There was a knock at the door, and Bessany jumped. I'll handle it, he said and drew his sidearm. Any routine callers she didn't have many, mostly delivery droids with groceries would use the door com from the ground level. To knock on the door... They had to be in the building already, and Bessany wasn't someone who mixed with the neighbors. Ordo motioned her to stay away from the window, then moved silently down the short hallway to the front door. He checked the security cam, but could see nothing except the smooth velvet pile of the carpet stretching down the corridor to the turbo lift and the spotless cream walls. That was what he expected. He flicked the power setting on his blaster to maximum and then something caught his eye. For a split second, his mind said oil leak, but the black tarry liquid issuing from the ventilation panel just above the floor level was one he'd seen before. He held his blaster on it anyway while it settled in a pool with an odd almost domed meniscus. At least you knock now, he said. The pool reformed itself into a large predator like a dire cat with a glossy black coat and long double-tipped fangs. It blinked orange eyes at him. That's so you don't get agitated and shoot again, it said in a rich, liquid male voice. But that was Jeanard who you shot last time. I am Valakil. Bessany appeared in the doorway. She should have stayed put until Ordo had told her the apartment was secure. I thought you said you were leaving the last time we met. I've come back, Valakil said. Not that we owe your kind anything, but Kalura is now recovering from the human occupation, and your nasty little sergeant has kept his word to leave us in peace. So I keep my side of the bargain. Run while you still can. Could you be more specific? Ordo didn't like Gerlinen's all that much although he accepted it was as an irrational prejudice. He had no reason to distrust them, because they did exactly what they said they would but shapeshifters made him uneasy. 
We've got a lot of things to run from at the moment. Very soon, Palpatine will unleash a huge clone army, the one he's been building on Syntax 2. We work that out, Bessany said. He's not preparing to use it against the Separatists. Now that was a fascinating twist. What makes you say that? Asked Ordo. Because I have been to Syntax 2, and I have seen deployment plans to ensure that Kalura wasn't on the list. A shapeshifter was the most feared spy of all. Gerlinans could assume any shape, stow away on any ship, and infiltrate anywhere. They communicated telepathically with one another. They might not have had a civilization with weapons and technology, but they were very bad enemies to make. Want to expand on that? Soldier, you can't even see what's in front of you, can you? Ordo wasn't used to being told he wasn't smart enough to understand. He wasn't so much offended as shocked. So what troop strengths are we talking about? What targets? Enough to occupy thousands of worlds. Separatist worlds? Ordo was thinking hard. If Palpatine wasn't planning a massive assault on the Seps, which worlds would he be targeting? Ordo decided to look for some economic angle when the Gerlinen left. I know this war has been engineered carefully for some other ends, and many wars are, but what does he want out of it? Which worlds? Lots of worlds. That's all you need to know. I think I know what your plans are, more or less, and so I advise you to put them into effect sooner rather than later. Agent Wenon will be the next Treasury employee who vanishes into RDS cells, and then it's only a matter of time before Palpatine hunts you all down. Go now. You know about Joka then, Bessany said. Of course I do, said Valakil. That's how we bought you time. Ordo got there a moment before Bessany did. You set her up then? He put his arm out instinctively to block Bessany's line of fire before she did something rash, but he also registered the word we. That wasn't very helpful, actually. She's a little too close to us for comfort. The meaning had now sunken with Bessany. She was white-faced with anger. You, you. She didn't seem to have a term of abuse for a predator. I trusted you. You've been prowling around my office? How could you do that? Why Jilka? Why anybody? Said Valakil. Why us? She ran record searches on that bogus company you were looking for, and that was recorded on the system, and so it was a short step for us to print flimsy copies of information that pointed to an interest in Syntax 2. She's innocent. Do you know what they're probably doing to her now? Would you rather they were doing it to you? Valakil turned in an elegant circle as if he was going to settle down, but he was simply heading for the ventilation grill. He sat down on his haunches, gazing at the plate as if some prey might emerge from it. You should have been more discreet about your affair with the gallant captain here. It's a very short step to connect you with excessive curiosity about syntax. Bessany turned to Ordo. You said there was nothing on file about me. He was right there isn't, said Valakil. But there are too many beings now who have come into contact with Skarada's gang, and there comes a time when you can no longer operate covertly because too many know you, and you have crossed too many. That time is very close. You'd better hope that your enemies spend more time with Jilka before they realize she's useless to them and start looking again. The Gerlinen blinked a couple of times as if waiting for thanks or at least a reaction. He hadn't been wrong the last time. Ordo, cautious as he was, believed Valakil now. The creature became a slick of black liquid before flowing back through the ventilation plate, and then vanished forever. Lasima's apartment, Coruscant, Kui Val Dar emergency planning session. You can't slot her, 
Skirata said, putting his comm link back in his pocket. That was Ordo. The girl in and framed the woman to throw RDS off the scent. Then that's her very bad luck. Valve was getting annoyed. Murd whined at his feet, gazing up at him, always sensitive to its master's moods. This isn't like rescuing one of our own. Get Joke out alive, and we have to find somewhere to stash her. She won't just say, thanks for saving me, I'll just forget all that happened, and vanish of my own accord. She'll be a liability for as long as she lives. Then we hide her, Tehai said. I'll find some way of getting her off the planet if you can't. If she's been framed and has nothing to reveal, Vav said, then the urgency to shut her up recedes somewhat, except for the fact that she knows Bessany's boyfriend is called Ordo. Do I have to draw you a picture, Cal? And we've already got two retrievals to do. Helamar sounded resigned, and that worried Skirata. He didn't usually agree with Vav even about the time of day. All the intel says we don't have much time left, and we just can't wander around collecting waifs and strays forever. Is this to spare Bessany's conscience? Vav asked. Because if it is, let me remind you that it's one more problem caused by sentimental attachment, all because your lads don't think before they drop their plates for the first girl who smiles at them. Yuchikar. Skirata tolerated no slight against his boys or their women folk. Bessany's earned the right to be one of us. And there's the small matter of this being the right thing to do. Vav raised an eyebrow. I hate it when you get moral. This whole operation is about being moral. We're in it to save those who've been screwed over by the Republic. And we were getting on so well. But Vav was right. If they thought Joka was going to bring down the weight of the Chancellor's personal police on Bessany and that would mean on them all then she had to be silenced kindly or unkindly. He'd been ready to do it himself until he faced up to the effect it would have on Bessany, and so on Ordo. It was also hard to forget the look on Niner's face when he worked out what Skirata was considering. We get her out. We get Yuthan out. And we get my daughter out. Jilka may already have given up Ordo and Bessany without even knowing she's done any damage. Let's just grab Yuthan and bang out now. Vav always had a point. Omega and Atene were still on Karuskin. Bessany was on her way to the safe house Lassima's apartment and Juzik was due to land at any time with the two arcs even if he might get tied up keeping an eye on Phi. They had their trillion credit haul, and more cloning data than even Arcanian Micro could dream of. Now was a good time to go. Joka could tell RDS everything, but it would be too late to stop them getting away. Somehow, though, Skirata had to try for Joka. He hated himself for not automatically putting Ro at the top of the list. We spring Joka, Skarada said. And we get her to Mandalore. Oh, and you think she'll be grateful to be stuck at the Sheb's end of the rim for the rest of her life? Vav said. Now I know why Omega make a habit of abducting prisoners and not slotting them like they should. Wallen, let's at least try. We're not savages. Exactly, we're soldiers, Cal. And we've forgotten this is a war. The four QE Valdar stood pondering the hollow schematic of the Republic Security Building and the service delivery schedules. They had a portfolio of bogus ID chips and could walk in with the catering, the sanitation crew, or even the droid that maintained the office machinery. It was just a case of finding the fastest route and locating Jilka. It wasn't a huge prison. There were just twenty cells. The doors opened. Ordo ushered Bessany inside. She was clutching a large holdall, and her face was grim. The conversation about Jilka's fate stopped abruptly. Bess I.K. can't go back to her apartment. 
Ordo said. No telling who'll show up next. Skirata's choices had narrowed to one. We're just discussing how to extract Jilka. Vav raised one eyebrow. The other said nothing. We can't extract her from the RDS facility by force, because it'll get all kinds of unfortunate attention too early in the game. Ordo took out his data pad. We get them to take her out of the cell and snatch her in transit. You've got a plan, Hilamar said. Of course. I've got access to Republic Intel codes. If we time this right, then I simply generate a bogus request for a rendition to the Rep Intel detention facilities. Then we hit the transport en route. Skarada gestured at Valve. Yes, but Brain of Galactic City here has already told Zay we're going to extract her. Double bluff, Vav said. When he hears it happened, he won't wonder if we're involved for some dubious reason and start digging. He thinks I'm spying on you anyway. He'll nod and say, oh, that's Vav doing the decent thing for me, and thwarting those intel and RDS jokers. Won't he? Skirata just raked his fingers through his hair. Well, what's done's done, and now we just have to clean up as best we can. Okay, let's triple bluff, Ordo said. Sergeant Vav, you. And I will intercept the transport. If they buy the request. Get changed. We'll do it within the hour. Try to look separatist. Vav's face didn't move a muscle. I'll put on my best jabby me accent. Bessany looked numb now. She seemed to be acclimatizing to a permanent high level of insane risk. Given another month, Skarata thought she'd be as bad as the rest of them. Come on, daughter, he said, taking the bag from her hands with as reassuring a smile as he could manage. Let's get you settled in. Is this everything? She nodded. Yes. I can't think what to do with the apartment at the moment, Dash. Leave things as they are, he said. If you vanish completely, then it just draws attention. Might be a good idea if you resign from your job, though. That seemed to hurt. A little frown creased the corners of her eyes for a fleeting moment. I'll cite personal problems with my partner. She said taking it like a trooper. They don't tend to want to pry into domestic stuff, and it's been noticed that I'm not exactly the woman I was. Skirata wasn't sure how to take that. When Bessany opened her bag and laid the contents on the cabinet in the room kept for Ordo, it told Skirata what really mattered to her. Her subconscious had told her what she couldn't live without, and it wasn't trinkets and comforts she'd crammed into the holdall with a few changes of clothes, but images, information, and her blaster. She set the hollow image projector on the side table. It pays to travel light, Skarada said. Well, I understand Mandalorians a great deal better after today. She opened the projector and activated it. If you can't carry it, it's a burden, and if it can be easily replaced it's not worth regret. You married a Mandalorian. What do you think that makes you? At least it made her laugh, and that lit up her face. I've got to wear armor, haven't I? Nothing but top-grade Besker, too. Only the very best for my girls. Some cultures preserved images on sheets of flimsy, static and silent. Skirata once thought that was a poor substitute for the walking, talking, three-dimensional hollow images, but he found them easier to deal with on the bad days. A static picture was firmly anchored in the past making the subject untouchable, announcing clearly that those days, those moments, were long gone. But a hollow image brought a special kind of pain. It was the presence of people as they really had been, as if they would answer if spoken to or respond to a touch. It was a cruel illusion. Static two-dimensional images reminded you clearly that it was all over. Hollow images just dragged the untouchable past into the present, 
and tormented you with it. Want to SEC my father? She asked. My first one? I'm honored to be the second, Skarata said. Yes, I'd love to see your dad. Her father, Norlin Wenin, lived again in the moving hollow image for a few moments. Are you coming, Bess? The figure smiled and beckoned, as if he had something wonderful he wanted to show her. You've never seen anything like this, I'll bet. Bessany smiled, distracted. It was the jewel caves of Bersengriel, and we were on vacation. She said to Skirata. I was ten, I think. And she could answer her father a hundred times, but he'd never hear, never reply. She watched her ten-year-old self run after him, giggling with excitement as she vanished into the shafts of ruby and emerald light. I do that too, Skirata said softly. That was our last trip together before my mother left. Did she have a reason? Yes, but I can't recall his name. Skirata didn't comment. Want to see mine? He handed her the small projector he kept in his belt at all times and flicked the controls. A grid of small images hovered in the air for her to select and enlarge. He pointed out detail. The guy in green armor Juzik's armor is my adopted father, Munin. And here's all my vote from previous missions. My kids all of them, clone and non-clone and Kamino. Wallen recorded a lot of this. He reckoned I'd need evidence for the defense if I ever filleted another Kaminoan. He gestured at the images of himself surrounded by a group of six grim-faced identical little boys while he stripped down a large blaster rifle on a table in front of them. I only ever had to show them once. And here's some of my commandos in training. Yeah, that's Data, Dar's first squad. Poor little Shabir all dead now, bar him. Why does Ordo always sleep with the covers over his head? Bessany asked. Skirata stared in slight defocus at the hollow images, then put the projector on the cabinet. Live ordnance tests. To see how little kids coped with the noise and shock. He couldn't stand the night storms on Kamino after that, and he always buried his head under the covers. Funny, none of his brothers did. She gave him a long look that he couldn't quite read, and for a moment he wondered if she thought he was reminding her that her own woes were nothing compared with those that Ordo and his brothers endured. Then again, she might just have been trying to imagine the closed world of Kamino, a small group of marginal Mandalorians cooped up together for years whether they liked one another or not, recreating a small but distorted outpost of their society a long way from home, just to stay sane. Who saved who? Who needed the leeching of the Mandalorian ethic more our boys, or us? Bessany's fine-boned face broke into a sad smile again. Don't let him get himself killed. He's Ordo, Skarata said. He decided he was never going to let that happen to him when he was two years old. Yes, the Nulls and all his clones had come a long way and they had a lot farther still to go. Sector L-32, Galactic City, an hour later. Ordo had to hand it to Vav. He looked utterly convincing. With a ferociously short haircut, as near to shaven as he could get without a shine on his scalp, and a lightly tinted mini-hud visor of the kind favored by the security community, he looked like the real deal. The severe black business tunic set it all off. It said do not mess with me. He looked like a republic enforcer of the most dreaded kind, quiet and implacable. Fortunately, my hair grows back fast. Vav sat in the passenger seat of the unmarked black official speeder and passed his palm discreetly across the top of his scalp as if feeling naked. This is not my style. The speeder wasn't actually one they'd liberated from the GR command pool but Anaka's contacts seemed to be able to summon up a facsimile of anything on a drive and repulses. Ordo contented himself with the ubiquitous helmet and visor common to most enforcement 
and rescue agencies across the planet. Mariel might have enjoyed disguising himself by altering his hair and eye color, but Ordo wanted to keep it simple. He checked his chrono. Five minutes until the shift changeover at both the Rep Intel facility and the RDS. It would then be another eight hours until anyone checked the custody sheets again at either end. But Ordo and Vav wouldn't be waiting that long. I hope Mert is okay, Vav said, staring out of the tinted viewscreen at the flicker of passing vessels zipping by in the sky lane at the end of the alley. Is Estril safe around a small child? Being hermaphroditic, all Strills have a maternal streak, Ordo. Hence the endless nest building when it sees the baby. If it takes my clothing to make nests one more time, I shall be very displeased. Vav snorted. Come on. It's charming. Ordo could recall the time he was terrified of Murd and pulled a blaster on it. The animal seemed bigger than him at that age, a savage thing. Now it had become a comrade in this war. It even played with babies. All things were possible. The chrono showed 1400. Okay, let's do it. He said opening his comm link. Wadi, are you ready for nerve hurting? Tehai grunted. I hurt my neck last time I did this. Let's try to avoid collisions. Vav opened his comm link, transmitting a false origin code to appear on the RDS system as Republic Intel. Ordo readied the bogus authority codes, slicing into the Intel system to generate a handover request from a genuine Intel officer who happened to be on a lunch break. It was just a matter of looking down a list of terminals grouped by the appropriate department and finding those machines that were on standby. It would take hours to show up as an anomaly. RDS custody desk, please. Vav had a rich, resonant, upper-class voice that he could polish or roughen at will. It used authority. He was hard to disbelieve. Hello? Yes, this is Republic Intelligence. We're requesting a prisoner transfer. We require a female human, Zan Zentis, initial J. Would you like me to spell that? No? Very well. Apologies for the short notice, but it's to minimize the risk of a rescue attempt. We have reason to believe that her associates might attempt to extract her. Now we can collect her, or you can transfer her to our secure unit, but we'd like this done immediately for the reasons I've given. Vav stared ahead as if in a trance, listening. Ordo both dreaded these gambles and relished the adrenaline rush of taking them. If the RDS bought the story and opted to ship her over, then it would be a physical intervention. If they were lazy and said to come and get her, it would be a tidy taxi job. Yes, I do have authorization. Stand by. Transmitting now. They waited. It was a long 30 seconds. Thank you. Do transfer with... Do transfer her. May I have your transport identity, please, for the security gate? Vav rolled his eyes, his voice unchanged. Got that. Thank you. Ordo kicked the speeder into life and shot off at top speed toward the RDS landing platform. It was secured but they could hang around and wait for the RDS transport to emerge. Vav tapped the transponder code into the onboard sensors so that they could identify the right vessel. They were never marked. Shab. He sighed laying a fearsome sonoff verpine slug thrower across his lap. I hate it when they're conscientious. Why can't they be lazy DQ like every other government department and get us to do the work? Tehai, a few blocks away, sounded as if he was tightening all his speeder restraints. On the comm link, metal chinked and fabric rustled. Can we synchronize holocharts, please? 
Ordo concentrated on the anxious chill in his gut and used it to keep him sharp, just as Scarata had shown him. It was almost the first lesson he'd ever taught Ordo and his brothers to use their fear. It was their alarm system, he said. They had to heed it and realize the adrenaline was getting them ready to run faster, fight harder, and notice only the things they needed to stay alive. Ordo slowed the speeder and brought it to a standing hover at the end of the spur skylane leading to the main route. Government vehicles could bypass the automated NAV system that controlled skylane traffic, just like taxis. They could take any route. But in broad daylight, they had limited options for intercepting another vessel without getting a primetime slot on HNE. So where's the best place to take them out? Vav asked flashing the Sector Skylane holochart onto the inside of the view screen like a HUD. Got that, Wadi? I'm synced in. Thanks. If they take the direct route, I'll try to force a stop at the underpass between the spaceport and Cor Plaza. That way we don't get picked up by surveillance sats. CSF ran the sat system, which was simply a crime prevention tool and all awkward things could be made to vanish if CSF was approached the right way. The archive was only stored for ten days anyway. Ordo checked the underpass layout. There were service bays to allow delivery repulsor trucks and maintenance vessels to pull in. That looked like the best option. Now, what if they don't take that route? Ordo asked. Usual ploy, Tehai said. Force them down the levels, the lower the better. But jam their comms first, before they know they're being hijacked. We don't want a full-scale fleet battle in front of the good citizens. This is why I prefer the lower levels, Vav said. You can have a decent shootout and an armed misunderstanding down there, and nobody pokes their nose in. Very civilized. Ordo watched the RDS entrance. After a few minutes, the gates parted and a nondescript white windowless speeder edged out, looking exactly like a million other service vessels cruising the skylanes at that moment, with no livery indicating prison duties. The sensor blipped. It recognized the transponder code. A red pulsing light appeared on the head-up holochart. Got it, Tehai said. Watch my trace, please. Running parallel to you. Good luck, gentlemen. Vav seemed to love these operations. He came alive. He and Murd responded to the same stimuli, the chase. Oya. Let's hunt. Ordo kept a sensible five vessels distance behind the prison transport. The pilot didn't seem to like crowded sky lanes and diverted to a side route probably wanting to spend as little time in transit as possible to minimize the risks. He looked as if he wasn't going to take the spaceport route. Okay, I'm looking for service bays. Vav followed the holochart, leaning forward a little and adjusting the display to a larger scale. I'll call them as we come within a quarter click of them. Left, Ordo said. The holochart traces shifted and Tehai pulled a block ahead of them in readiness. He was running on a chronic counter that would time his intercept run to cut across the prison speeder's path at precisely the right moment to slow it, stop it, or force it to divert. The idea was to avoid a crash. It didn't always work out that way. He's moving down to the repulsor truck lane, Ordo said. Naughty. That's freight only. Rep until don't he transit regs. Wadi, if he carries on that course, can you take him at the intersection with the Gimmet sewage tunnel? At not in? Please, Ordo. At. Lots of service bays there, Vav said happily. Droid drivers. Nice and quiet. The gimmet was just a huge enclosed tunnel that shunted sewage from millions of buildings into the main waste processing plant that was known to Mandalorians on Coruscant as Asik Ocean. 
Every species here had a similar name for it. The gimmick betrayed no external signs of its unsavory traffic except for methane-consuming fungi that clustered around the gas vents and small cracks. But folks were still keen to avoid living within five clicks of it. It plied a lonely trade. I think it's now or never, Vav said. Big service bay, undercover, half a click. Got it, said Tehai. Step on it, Ordo. I'm coming in from the right. Ordo closed the gap. If the pilot didn't check his six now and wonder why a shiny black speeder was tailing him down here, he never would. Ordo hit the jamming device and made sure the guy never shared his concerns with his control room. It must have produced a failure signal in the cockpit. The prison speeder accelerated suddenly, streaking ahead. Ordo matched its speed. From then on, he was flying by instinct. Juzik would have done this better. Ordo had to admit that. The prison speeder veered left, with no exit in sight, as if it was slowing to try an evasive U-turn. Ordo nearly rammed its tail. Tehai's intercept speeder appeared out of nowhere and flashed across its nose, pulling up hard right and just above it to block it in. It lost control, and Ordo sideswiped it into the permacrete walls of the freight lane, more by accident than design. It could have lifted free, but he pinned it, and the two speeders screamed along the wall, locked in a shower of sparks, sending trucks swerving past them sounding their klaxons. When the service base suddenly appeared on the left like an open mouth, Ordo forced the prison speeder left while Tehai blocked it from lifting. It skidded across the floor of the bay and came to rest against the far wall. Vav was hanging out of the speeder before Ordo even landed and jumped down to race across to the battered white vessel. He didn't stop to take names. He fired horizontally point-blank into the cab through the side view screen. Whether he was shooting to kill or to keep the pilot from getting out, Ordo had no time to check. He ran to the rear hatch of the vehicle and blew the hinges out with close-range blaster fire, pulled it open, and reached in to grab Jilka. Stay down, stay down! He yelled. Don't move. Vav kept firing. Ordo had to climb inside before he realized Jilka was strapped into a seat. He shot out the restrained anchors and hauled her bodily out of vessel, then bundled her into his speeder. Vav backed away from the prison vessel, still firing sporadic shots while Tehai covered the exit, and then jumped into the pilot's seat. Ordo shut the hatch behind him, hammering his fist on the bulkhead to signal Vav to bang out. The speeder rocketed out of the service bay at a sharp angle, into the traffic and away. Are you hurt? Ordo asked. He took off his helmet and tried to stay upright while Vav drove like a weak way after a heavy drinking session. Did you hit your head? Jilka looked up at him. He hoped it was Jilka, anyway. If they'd snatched the wrong prisoner somehow, he didn't like the idea of what he might have to do next, but he could always dump her in the lower levels with a big credit chip. All prisoners wanted out. Are you going to kill me now? She asked. Her voice was shaky. Or just maim me a bit? No, I'm Ordo. Her face sharp featured fresh bruises, scared eyes changed instantly. Do you always pick up women this way? No, I shot Bessany. He's not very good with pickup lines. Vav chimed in from the front. Actually, Attain shot her, Jilka. Ordo almost slotted her. Things were a little chaotic that day. You can take the macho thing too far, Captain. Jilka said fixing Ordo with a baleful stare. Try flowers next time. Maybe dinner and a show. She shuffled along the bulkhead and sat up on the curve of the repulsor housing. She wasn't exactly screaming in terror. But then Bessany had said she was a tax investigator, 
and she was used to hut levels of violent objection to her carrying out her duties. It would have taken more than a hijack to really rattle her. Tell me this is a rescue, she said. Ordo nodded. So she'd worked out the other possibility then. It is. My life's screwed forever now, right? Afraid so. But it beats whatever rep intel or the RDS would have done to you. We'll see, she said. Vav seemed very pleased with himself. It's okay, my dear, he said. You can join our little bandit gang as a tax avoidance consultant. The hours are terrible, but you get to see the galaxy on expenses. That was about her only choice now. Everything dug her and them in deeper. She held out her hands to indicate that she wanted the cuffs removed, but Ordo decided she could wait until they got to the safe house before he uncuffed her. There was no point taking chances. Her eyes narrowed a little. And you're not separatists. We're not on anyone's side but our own, Ordo said. Sometimes I can't tell the difference between the Republic and the Seps anyway. As soon as he said it, it struck him as being more profound than he intended. Maybe there was no difference at all. The Republic now had as much reason to treat him as a hostile as the Separatists did. The speeder vanished into the lower levels via a flood conduit, plunging the cabin into darkness lit only by the faint green glow from the cockpit panel. Good point. Jilka's disembodied voice was weary. I can't see the difference, either. Chapter 12 You worry too much, Clone Master. I only require your clones to be fit for purpose, and that means they have no need to meet the same exacting standards as the army bred on Kamino. The Grand Army has to heed the very best in the galaxy for one single special operation ahead of them. This is the culmination of my strategy two armies with two quite separate tasks. Chancellor Palpatine, to the Sparty lead clone master supervising the production of a new army on Syntax 2. Arca Barracks, Coruscant, one month later. Atain had teetered on the brink of following Juzik into the state of limbo outside the Jedi Order, yet the final leap still proved too hard. C tried to press the right buttons but she couldn't resent him for it. I want you on Kashyyyk with Delta, he said. You did line work on Kalura organizing the local population to resist the separatists. The same job needs doing there. Say he knew exactly how things had been on Kalura. He'd been there with her, keeping the insurrection going, and the days before he became chained to a command desk, he was a fighting man, a good Jedi a good officer. It wasn't that she didn't respect him now. It was just that they were too far down different paths and unable to step off. I'm happy to go, Master Zay. She lied, wanting a few more days with Cad and Darman. But we're talking about Wookiees and Delta here. Neither need my feeble hand-holding. However, if I can make a difference... Kashyyyk is going to be critical in the war. Then I'll give it my best shot, as ever. I know what you do, Atain. She didn't sense any accusation or disapproval in him. Her first thought, though, was that he knew her secret. What do I do? You treat your men as equals. Well, they are. At the very least. I meant that I approved. As soon as I can get this discussed by the council, I intend to improve our command style with our troops I know we're sadly lacking in too many areas. A little respect and kindness go a very long way. Well, you're a little late to the party. General. But she had never seen Zay treat any clone as less than fully human. He'd been Juzik's master. The two would never have lasted in that relationship as long as they did if there had been a fundamental difference in their outlooks. Better late than never, General, she said. Captain Mays walked in with a pile of data pads for Zay to check. 
It seemed a waste of a highly trained ARC trooper to have him in a post like this with a staff officer there were fewer than a hundred of these men left but that was the way the Chancellor wanted it. A senior clone trooper for every key Jedi, expert military advice on hand as well as close personal protection. Atain thought Maze was probably frustrated by the role, knowing Ark as she now did. Would you like a cup of CAF, Captain? Seiya asked absently. He got up and poured from the jug on the side table. It's fresh this time. That's very kind of you, sir. Thank you. Maze took his cup and left. Say he stared at the closed doors for a few seconds afterward. What do you think is going to happen to a man like that after the war ends? He asked. Will happen, or should happen? Either. Was Zay working up to confronting her, or did he know or feel that she had a better insight into the psychology of clone troops than most Jedi? They'll be more alienated the longer this goes on, she said. There was no point pulling her punches now. We're storing up trouble for the future. You can't take an optimized human being very intelligent, very resourceful, very dedicated and then restrict his life. It's not just morally wrong, it's dangerous for all concerned. Once they see their full potential, they won't forget it or go back quietly to their barracks. We must plan to give them full lives, General. Freedom, in other words. Choice. Say was silent for a long time. Attain didn't feel inclined to interrupt his thoughts. She could see him standing up at the Jedi Council to make that point, and she didn't want to imagine their reaction. It was one depressing thought too many. It's so easy to become accustomed to the abnormal and unacceptable simply by being exposed to it for too long, he said. We get used to doing terrible things. That's why I need the Skiratas of this world. He lives his compassion, even if he has no idea what it is philosophically. But so many of us cherish it as a theory, without application. Attain looked that as a confession. She wondered how Skirata would take it. Well, let's both apply it now, shall we, sir? She said. I'll see you on my return. As she felt the whisper of air from the doors closing behind her, Atain had the feeling that she was abandoning Zay in the throes of a quiet crisis, and that he might have needed to talk to her for much longer. But Darman and Cad needed her more. She packed her small bag in her cabin at the barracks she hadn't stayed at the temple in a very long time and took an air taxi to the Craggit to say her goodbyes at Lasima's apartment. She was getting practiced at it now. It still hurt every time, but the more she left, the more she knew she would come back. The Force had made her certain about Cad and his destiny that he would affect many lives and now it made her sure she would come home and that the war was in its final days. Darman was already at the apartment, playing with Cad. He sat on the floor with the baby, letting him explore the workings of his helmet. Every time the tactical spot lamp activated or the HUD flashed icons, Cad squealed in delight and giggled. Darman seemed utterly at ease with his son. I hope you've deactivated the uplink, Attain said, kneeling down beside them or else he's just committed five battalions to attack Corellia. Darman laughed. So you got a ship to Faustin 9 to twiddle our thumbs. There's work to do there, she said. Cad plucked a wire connector from the helmet and offered it to her, grinning. Why, thank you, sweetie. I think Dida needs that to talk to his boss. Shall we put it back? Not much. Darman said. It's a recce job. Commandos do reccees. It's in your job description. Besides, my son's father has to come home safe, and there must still be five females in the outer rim that CORR hasn't dated yet. I don't want to stop him short of the galactic record. 
Ket had now found a marker stylus in Darman's belt pouch, the type he used to mark an unconscious Ovin's forehead when he'd given him medication on the battlefield. Oh, Kalura. That was horrible. I'd never have survived if Darman hadn't shown up. The baby scrawled on the lining of the helmet's chin section, and Darman admired his efforts. Now I'll have something to remind me of you when I'm away, Kat I.K. He lowered his voice and gave Atain a dubious look. Can we have another kid one day? This was what she wanted to hear. This made her feel solid. They were a family, no mistake about it. Things were going to be all right. I'd love that. With more painkillers, though. I really want out of the army, ETK. Not long to go. You feel that? Calbear still thinks all the logistics add up to a big push soon, and he wants us out. It's just a matter of waiting for him to call Endex. Atene knew all this, she knew Skarata's plans, and she was part of them. But the end was now acquiring a solidity of its own, becoming a separate entity that wouldn't tolerate any prevarication or delay on her part. Fine. It can't come too soon. She felt guilt for all the men she could never help men like C.O.R.R., who had blossomed at the first opportunity to explore a wider life but she had to save those she could. The underground escape route beckoned. She would be good at making that work, using her four skills for something tangible. And maybe she'd influence Sei into pursuing a more humane approach to the army. Stop bargaining with yourself. The chrono ate away at the remaining hours. Cad was in a giving mood today and kept handing her one of his toys, a small fluffy four-legged thing that was supposed to be a nerf. She got ready to leave, dreading the moment Lasima returned because it meant that her time was up. But it wasn't Lasima who walked through the doors next. It was Anaka, the Wookiee. Cad was transfixed. He'd never seen a Wookiee before. Atane lifted him up so Anaka could hold him and to his credit he didn't burst into tears. He tugged at her fur as if he couldn't believe she was real. Anaka made a purring noise, and Kat squealed with delight. What brings you here, Anaka? Atane asked. Has Cal trashed more vehicles and left you to round up the wrecks? Anaka yelled that she was going back to Kashyyyk to help drive out the separatists who were despoiling her homeworld. I'm headed there, too, Atain said. She didn't believe in coincidences. What made up your mind? Anaka jerked her head in silence, a wookie shrug. Atain could guess. Eventually Skirata arrived with Lasema, wearing his it's nothing to do with me expression. Atain just raised an eyebrow. You need all the wookies you can get, he said. Atain couldn't bring herself to berate him for leaning on. Anaka to play minder to her. The Wookiee probably did want to do her bit for her homeworld. It was good to know he was looking out for them all. It felt a lot better than being the object of his anger. You look after yourself, at IK, he said. And that's an order. I Calbear. He left her to take her leave of Darman and Cad and she walked away from the apartment clutching her son's nerf, feeling that it didn't look out of place at all with a concussion rifle and two lightsabers. Crag at restaurant, lower levels, Coruscant, later that day. Forgiveness is a wonderful thing, Cal. Helamar ignored every health warning that his former profession had issued and tucked into a plate of assorted fried meats and weris eggs, moistened with extra melted robe of fat that soaked into a breadroot patty. He'd been away for a few weeks and seemed to want to make up for lost time. All that aggravation about the baby's been forgotten. If only the rest of the galaxy could agree to shake hands and move on. Skirata was treading water now, waiting for a window for the next stage of the withdrawal. At least Joka had shut up pretty fast. He hadn't told Bessany how close he'd come to slotting her, 
and Bessany hadn't yet told her how she'd come to be in the frame for something she hadn't done. He just hoped Bessany wouldn't give in too soon to her honest urges and confess all. It wouldn't be pretty. Jilka was a fugitive now, anyway, whether she liked it or not. It had a remarkably sobering effect on anyone. Guess who's joining us for refreshments upstairs? Scarada said. Palps? No, he had another engagement. Someone we haven't seen for a few years. Helamar contemplated the translucent yellow glaze of egg yolk on the white patty. If it's Dread Priest, let me get my special rusty scalpel first. Nothing like that. Come on, eat up. Jang's dropping in with a handy contact, too. Plans to make, work to do, Midge I.K. Skirata had never quite worked out how Alpha Zero Two had managed to escape from Topoka before the war, but he was content that he had. Helamar bolted down his meal and followed Skirata back to Lasima's apartment. It was going to be a big shock for him. Surprise! said Skirata, opening the doors. Three clones sat around the table with Bessany and Lasima, playing Sabak, Fi, Sol, and Spar. Look at Fi, good as new. Skirata wondered if Fi was ready to return to even easy duties yet, but morale and feeling part of a squad again would do him more good than half the fancy medics in Coruscant. Midge, remember that lad? It's Dash. Helama walked up to Spar and slapped him on the back. Spar not usually the most cheerful of men stared at him for a moment, and then his face split into a knowing grin. How you doing, Spar? Helamar started laughing. How's the headaches? Ooh, it's me back, Doc, I can't move. And the voices. The voices. Both men burst into peals of laughter and embraced each other. You, Chikar. You made my day, you know that? Said Helamar. So you've done all right for yourself. Busy? Oh, bit of this, bit of that. I even turned down a job. Mandalor or something. You don't want to do all that Mandalorian stuff, Ad I.K. Look what happened to the last two. Terrible promotion prospects. Skirata heard every cough and spit into Polka City, every scam and scandal in the claustrophobic Q Valdar community, but Helamar had a few cards he kept close to his chest. It was only now that Skirata saw Spar and the medic laughing that he put two and two together, and wondered why he hadn't ever managed to make it add up to four. So you're the one who got Spar off Kamino, he said. Helamar bowed theatrically, armor creaking. You saved your favorite sons, I saved mine. You never told me. You never told me what Jane was doing to the banking system. Good for you, Midge I.K. Skirata meant it. But you can tell me now, can't you? Django came and went as he pleased, even if we were stranded. You got your supplies of Tahar and UJ cake, didn't you? There were outbound parcels, too, if you know what I mean. Django knew when to turn a blind eye to the cargo and slaves hold. He owed me one. Skirata wanted to ask what reciprocal deal had taken place, but it could wait until they were both well away from Coruscant and a bottle or two of Tihar had been consumed. So you're going to join the team, Spar? Helamar asked. Spar reverted to his usual unsmiling self. I don't want pay. I want a chance at that cure when you lot find it. I want to live as long as the next man. Skirata cut in. Son, no clone ever has to ask for what's his by right. I keep telling you that. You don't have to bargain for it. You sure you want in on this mission? You're not obliged. Spar seemed taken aback. No, I am obliged. And so. Him, too. So nodded. I'm in. I'll take all the aberrants I can get, Skarada said. 
good lads. The Kaminoans were proud of their low rate of aberrance. They had a behavioral norm for clones, and any clone who didn't fit it, any clone who didn't have the sense or self-control to keep his opinions to himself was classed as deviant and reconditioned. They were full of euphemisms, the Kaminoans. It was the language of purity and cleansing. But it was destruction of will, of hope, and even of life. Clones who survived reconditioning were a psychological mess, Skirata knew, but they met the Kaminoan standards of not talking back, and that was all they wanted. Skirata had never worked out if the Awa Bait genuinely believed that clones who didn't toe the line were defective. Or if they were just cynically callous, the handful of prison camp guards holding down millions simply by terror, wielding the fear of who would disappear next and never return making terrible examples of a few to deter the rest. The prison camp analogy bothered him more now in his quiet moments. We had enough clone troops and arms on Kamino to revolt and wipe out every Kaminoan. Hard men. Best troops the galaxy's ever seen. And yet we stuck to the rules, pretty much. If I'd been half a man, I'd have organized them, led them, overthrown the regime. Force knows I had the years to do it, but I didn't. Nobody did. Seventy-five out of the hundred Kiwi Valdar were Mandalorians, experienced special forces troops, more than enough to take down Kamino and turn it into a wasteland. From the inside? A stroll. Why didn't they rise up? Kamino swallowed them, and Skirata now hated himself for being swallowed. They got used to the prison rules a slice at a time, still Mando, still free-thinking, but as prey to institutionalization as anyone. They slid into making a difference on the margins, looking after their boys, and never saw the bigger picture or the doors they could simply kick open. Never again. Never. Okay, Skarada said. I need a hand springing a couple of people. One's a scientist called Yuthan. She might be your passport to a ripe old age. The other's my daughter, who's banged up in a POW camp for getting caught in sep colors. Your real daughter? Fai asked. What does that make you, my unreal son? My biological daughter, yes. Fai didn't ask awkward questions, but Skarada could see them forming in his eyes already. I go where sent Calbert. They sat down to resume the sabak game in hushed tones so that they didn't wake Cad. Skarada had never been much of a player, more a drinking observer at the table, and Fai seemed much more interested in talking to Bessany. He hadn't seen her or at least he couldn't recall seeing her since he'd been in various stages of coma, and now that he was back on Coruscant, he kept patting her hand as if he really wanted to give her a big hug but was afraid to. Skirata found it unbearably touching. He hadn't stopped thanking her since the day he landed. You saved my life. Fi told her. You saved me. Bessany helped him play his hand. Skirata hadn't realized that she was pretty sharp at cards. Fi, you were just too good to throw away. She said at last, eliciting a big grin. I believe in never wasting a good man. The hollow plans of the detention center on Paul's annexes were projected onto the wall while they chatted and speculated on the quickest way in and out. The best options were always those that required no shooting and heroics, just a cool head. And Inaka wasn't around to sweep up the transport situation it now fell to Tehai. They were still debating the merits of bogus ID slipping into predictable methods of entry made them vulnerable versus infiltration via the drainage system when Jane arrived with a guest. So looked up. Well, I never. You again. The woman was short, graying, and swamped by her pilot's overalls. She looked like Skarata felt, wrung out and despairing of the galaxy but still ready to give it a kick where it hurt most. She met his gaze. He saw a kindred spirit in her eyes that he could do business with. 
Sol, you bad boy, she said, grabbing the Ark in a playful headlock. I bust my butt getting you out of the Republic's clutches, and you come straight back. Did they get you from the dumb box of clones, or what? Sol actually laughed, submitting to the mock attack. That told Skarada a lot. This is New York Valen, Jane said. One of Aiden's buddies. And when she's not helping us with removals, she flies freight. New York, this is Cal Skirata. My father. Sergeant Skirata. Us short folk got to stick together. She studied Skirata unselfconsciously and held out her hand for shaking. Want to look at my schedule? I'll show you mine if you show me yours. Is it worth seeing? Skirata asked, feeling unaccountably bashful. It'll hold your interest, Mando boy. What's nice this time of year? New York held out her data pad. Can't seem to stay away from the place. I was born on Quat. Skirata was no longer in control of this conversation, and not even of his own mouth. Why did I ever volunteer that information? New York Valen unsettled him. My, you do visit the old place a lot. Skirata didn't have Ordo's ability to do a quick visual scan of a document and analyze it immediately, but he knew a lot of components in transit when he saw them. It was enough for thousands of vessels. Shipyards are extra busy then, he said. Working up busy. New York seemed to be testing him. She probably had a good idea that he wasn't exactly the Chancellor's trusted advisor on procurement issues. This is all replacement parts for battleships, not small stuff, so they're either delivering a lot of combat-ready hulls or anticipating a big need for replacement parts all at once. You ever worked in shipbuilding? No, but I know how to hang around in cantinas waiting for my cargo, listening to folks who do. And? Lots of new vessels and transports rolling out now hundreds a week and some big panic to be ready in a few weeks' time. Skirata looked at Jane for confirmation. The Null had access to the KDY system. He nodded. I'm grateful, Skirata said. He pulled a 10,000 credit chip from his belt and put it on the table beside her. Placing it in her hand seemed an act of charity, like giving a child spending money. Newark looked at the chip, then tossed it back in his lap. I've been getting trouble pay and on-time bonuses, thanks. I'm just trading information. It's tax-free. So what do you want from us, New York? Aiden S. got that sorted. My old man's ship was lost a couple of years ago, and I know he isn't going to be alive, but I want to know the how and the where. That's all. That shuts Skirata up. Sorry to hear that. I'll let you know when I find out more, okay? We're grateful, New York. We really are. And you better hang on to those creds, Mando boy. You look in need of it. I'm a trillionaire, Skirata said deadpan. If you're worth that much, you can afford some better armor. Look at the state of you. All scrapes. We Mando boys like to show we've been in action. Anyway, this is top-grade Beskerful density. 2% ceridium, no fancy lamination or carbon alloy. Does all that mean it's heavy? Yeah. Very heavy. Heavy is best. Explains why you're so short, then. He watched her go, dumbfounded. Jane gave him a prod in the shoulder. I think she likes you. I think she's just trying to joke her way out of being in limbo about her husband. Skirata said and found himself hoping Jane was right, then scolding himself because he didn't have time for that foolishness. Okay, date set. We bang out on. He calculated. 1,090 days ABG. Copy that. Sol said mimicking the regular troopers. He had a sense of humor after all. 
he was going to need it. SEP controlled area near Kachiro, Kashiak, one month later, 1,070 days after Geonosis. You sure you saw Grievous leave? Scorch aimed an anti-armor round at the wall of battle droids, ducking as dagger-like chunks of tree and fizzing metal shrapnel hammered on his armor. You saw a fixer, so what else do you think that was? Why, though? Is it a retreat? Blaster fire poured down on them from the Trandishan positions. Every time Scorch raised his head he was looking at another wave of Trandos and battle droids. Does this look like a retreat to you? Scorch couldn't have given a Mott's hairy backside about the bigger picture at that moment. It was the first time he thought they might have been in real danger of getting overrun and slaughtered. The Sep presence was putting up a bigger fight than he'd expected. Incoming. Boss smacked his head down again, and his field of vision was full of the crawling debris on the floor. Scorch could hear the drives of a ship. When he knelt up to look again, a supply vessel was dropping down onto the landing pad in the clearing. Trandos rushed to unload it. Sev popped up from the cover of a pile of SB droids and began hosing the pad with blaster fire. Can you put an anti-armor round or two in there, boss? Just getting the range now. Boss fired once, twice, three times. It was hard to see how accurate his shot was, just a split-second wake of vapor and turbulent hot air, and then everything was one vast sheet of burning gold with a white-hot heart. The explosion shook the ground under Scorch's knees. The blinding light gave way instantly to roiling black smoke, and as the wind parted it Scorch saw nothing left on the pad except burning, twisted wreckage. I think he was hauling detonite, Sev said. I wish they all blew like that. We've got to stop them moving around this criffing forest so easily. Boss looked around waiting for the next wave of droids, then crouched down in the lee of the barricade, getting his breath. Okay, the Wookiees can keep picking him off, but we need a bigger hydrospanner to sling in their works or this is going to be a running battle for the next five years. He clicked his helmet comm link. General, can we shortcut this? Atain took a few seconds to respond. Scorch could hear the blaster fire in the background, and the roars and barks of furious Wookiees. How hard do you want that shortcut to be? We'll take a ten, ma'am. We're feeling lucky. Inaka says if you can take the bridge at Kachiro, or sever it, you'll cut off their supply line completely. Atain paused as if listening to a running commentary. It'll cut ours off, too but Wookiees can rebuild smaller bridges around it in days. Seps can't. I like the odds, Boss said. Let's go, Delta. Atain's voice was breaking up on the link. And we've got Geonosians swarming everywhere here you'll need to be way up in the trees to take Kachiro. Bugs? Seb said cheerfully. Save a few for me, ma'am. I love their pretty wings, especially when I shoot them off. Boss reoriented their HUD positioning, and the squad worked its way through the forest, too pumped on adrenaline to worry about what predators might be waiting. Then a hairy arm waved from overhanging branches, Wookiees. They were showing them a route higher up into the trees, a fast track to Kachiro. Scorch shot a rappel line into the branches and winched himself up, then ran up a section of tree trunk that made him feel Jawa-sized to emerge in a treehouse village on a huge mat of branches and vines. It took him a second to spot the Wookiees. He saw the Trandos first. The Wookiees were emptying bowcasters at them with apparently slow, leisurely, but lethal accuracy, seeming oblivious to the incoming Trando fire. Then they charged. Wookiees really did dismember enemies. Ripping off arms wasn't a cantina joke after all. Scorch paused for a moment, almost disbelieving, 
as a wookie patriarch nearly three meters tall grabbed a Trando one-handed and tore him limb from limb, then simply plucked a Geonosian from the air and dismantled it like a mechanical toy he'd grown bored with. Even Sev froze. Ah, uh, he said. Ah. Uh. The Wookiees were defending their homes, and that made them doubly lethal. They were berserk with rage. Scorch wasn't about to offer them tips on house clearance techniques. The sheer shocking brutality had an instant impact on the will of the Seps to fight. Trandos ran, apparently forgetting they could keep their nerve and fire into the Wookiee ranks, some just diving off the tree platforms to an uncertain death beneath some just running blindly. One or two did hold the line and keep firing, but dropping big, enraged attackers that were maybe three times the Trandos' weight took more stopping power, and the Trandos didn't have it. The Sep defense fragmented. Wookiees poured out of the higher branches, and Delta fell in with them, joining a fast-moving torrent of brown fur and granite-hard muscle. Scorch collided with one, just a glancing blow, and even in his Katarn armor he felt its sheer power and mass. Wookiees were sentient and smart, yes, but the primal warrior in them took little unleashing. The Seps were falling back. Sev, being Sev, managed to run through the Wookiees, stopping every few meters to pick off Geonosians. He'd said he was going for 4,982 kills one for every commander lost at Geonosis, and he wasn't joking. He never was. He never said, 5,000, either, and even Skarata rounded up the figure. No, Sev was exact about it. War was personal for him. Scorch kept an eye on him. Stone cold, my Shebs. It was the spider droid that told them they were getting near the bridge. It scuttled down a walkway, cannon aimed, but it wasn't best suited for a close-quarters battle like this one. Scorch leapt on its back and fired a whole clip into it with his dc 17 muzzle rammed into the weak point of a weld. The Wookiees were roaring now, gesturing below, and the big male the really big one started ripping apart the branches to get a clear line of sight with the target. There's the bridge. Fixer called. Check your HUDs, people. Metal bridges were a lot easier to pick out with sensors than living plant material against the background of the same. Only the density variation gave its position away. Scorch didn't need to see it. Can I borrow this, ma'am? He wrestled a grenade launcher from a female Wookiee near him. She obviously wasn't trying too hard to hang on to it. Won't be long. The big male Wookiee had opened up a window for. Scorch. The bridge ten meters beneath was now a sitting target, big and juicy, and laden with moving sep transports. Scorch decided to play it safe and aim for the span itself, not the narrow living cables that supported it, and just fired round after round blowing apart the close-woven roots and branches until there was more daylight than bridge. The structure could no longer hold either its own weight or the traffic on it. The span creaked and tore into two dangling sections, sending bodies, repulses, and small transports crashing into the green abyss beneath. Kachiro was no longer open for sept traffic. The Wookiees roared in triumph, shaking their fists and weapons at the canopy above. Scorch, said Atane's voice in his helmet. Anaka says you're doing okay for a short, pink, hairless creature. It was impossible to get a big picture of any battle, and even working out if you'd won or not was, Vav said, something the historians had to decide many years later. But Scorch felt the destruction of the bridge was a turning point, and Delta Squad were still alive, so whatever history decided in the end he'd won. They'd won. This time, anyway. Chapter 13 I just thought you needed to know, Chancellor. I understand how strategically important the Kamino clone facility is to the Republic's survival, and as a patriot, 
I thought it was my duty to hand over this material, which is clearly from that source. It's limited, and it may be of no importance, but these Mandalorians acquired it, and I doubt they came by it by honest scientific means. I have my reputation for integrity to consider too. I would not like the tainted origin of this data to compromise any nomination for the Republic Science Accolade. Last known message sent by Dr. Ryan Enelin from his office before his disappearance, contacting Chancellor Palpatine to hand over data given to him by a Mandalorian known only as Fallon. Lower levels, Coruscant, 1080 days ABC. Skirata should have known that something had gone badly wrong when he arrived at the Kragat. Hi, handsome. Serana said, balancing plates in both hands. You haven't seen Lasima, have you? She never showed for her shift. His stomach filled with ice. Lasima was punctual to a fault. She had CAD to look after, and she ran that schedule better than the GR. I'll go check he said, striding for the kitchen exit. I tried the apartment. Serana called after him. No answer. Skirata broke into a fast walk and then sprinted through the connecting alley. Sixty or not, he could cover a hundred meters almost as fast as one of his young commandos when adrenaline was fueling him. He got to the apartment doors, drew his blaster, and readied his knife. When he keyed the doors open, the apartment was more than deserted. It looked as if it had been stripped. Skirata wasn't a panicking man, but he was now minus both Lasima and his grandson. He ran from room to room, somehow managing to remember clearance procedure in case someone from his past had come back to settle a grudge, close to vomiting with fear for his family. The apartment was definitely empty. Everything personal had been stripped from it. There were no clothes, none of Juzik's paraphernalia, no toys, no crib, nothing. He didn't own much himself, but all that was gone, Tui Holdall with a few changes of clothes, his Bantha hide jacket, and some of his weapons, including two of his very expensive custom Verpine sniper rifles. He would have thought of plain burglary if he hadn't known how well he'd concealed this place and if Lasima and Kat hadn't been missing, too. And he'd received no messages. All this had happened in the time it had taken him to leave Arca Barracks, get the Sharoni Sapphires converted to cash credits, and visit the bank two hours, tops. If it had been earlier, someone would have come to him. Shab. He spat. Shab, Shab, Shab. He secured the place again, planning to come back to sweep for evidence. But first he had to check where everyone was, and his natural reaction, honed by decades of running for his life or chasing someone with the intent of ending theirs, was to assume no calm links were now secure. He slipped out the emergency exit and onto the roof, where his green speeder now kidded out as a taxi to bypass the automated skylane controls was parked under cover. The Aerotech speeder bike was too exposed if anyone was coming after him, heavy Besker armor or not. He lifted clear to head for the AAE Han RV point. If the Asik really hit the fan, and all calms were down, that was the emergency plan. He got as far as the next intersection when he heard a police klaxon. A CSF patrol vessel dipped in front of him, flashing at him to pull over to the nearest landing platform. CSF were as good as family. He had no reason not to comply. He set down the speeder, and the patrol vessel settled in front. The lower levels weren't somewhere you waited on a platform for a taxi, not if you valued your life, so it was deserted. Skirata had his knife and blaster ready just in case. But it was Jailer Obrim who jumped down from the crew bay. Even when the man's face was obscured by a uniform helmet, Skirata recognized his build and his walk. He gestured at Skirata to open the side viewplate, flipping up his visor. They're safe. 
Obram said not giving Skarada a chance to draw breath. He didn't even have to explain who he meant. But you're a dead man. Follow me. No comms, okay? Well, it was wasn't the first time Skarada had been dead. The wild fear for Lasima and Cad was replaced instantly by a dull ache in his guts that told him he'd pushed his luck too far yet again. And it was going relatively well. It really was. Whatever he'd done, his priority was to get his boys out. If he died doing it, that was fine by him. And he had nine million credits on him, cash creds at that. It was just as well that Obram was the kind of cop who knew what his real priorities were and would never search him. The patrol vessel slipped into a grimy alley, gun turrets almost shaving the walls, and came to rest on a rubble-strewn patch of permacrete where a building had been demolished. Two borets, one a buck with impressive tusks, the other a smaller doe, lifted their heads from a small, anonymous carcass and watched the proceedings as still as statues, noses twitching. Skirata got out of the speeder, keeping one eye on them, and swung himself up into the open crew bay of the patrol ship. Okay, he said. I've blown it, haven't I? Obrim took off his helmet. Yes, my friend. He held out his data pad for Skarata to read. It was a warrant for Skarata's arrest, dead or alive. It was only the authorization seal that made him more concerned than usual. If I count the fact that this is from the Chancellor, then it's a first for me, Skarata said. But I've still got death warrants out on me on five or six planets. Maybe seven. I forget. I know, Obram said. I've intercepted this at the CSF end and I can only sit on it for a little longer before I have to distribute it. But other agencies have it, and you have to get out, Cal. All my boys will somehow draw a complete and inexplicable blank in finding you, you know that but I can't speak for the other enforcement agencies. Any special reason I've ticked off Palpatine? My source says some scientists called Nenelin turned in some Kaminoan cloning data. Nenelin would be doing some research into how to breathe without a windpipe, but that would have to wait. And Skirata could be a patient man. How did the Chancellor connect it to me? Only GR Spec Ops knew about Kosai. You know better than me who's your weak link there. Yeah. Now, where's my grandson and Lesema? I took them and cleared out the apartment, just in case, because I know the kid's a bit special. Let me know where and when you want them moved and I'll do it. I owe you, Jailer. No, I'm your friend. You'd do the same for me. Yes, Skarada knew that he would. The two men looked at each other in silence, and Skarata knew this was the end of the line for them. I don't think I'm going to see you for a long while, Cal, Obram said. But whatever I can do, I'll do it. Skarada grabbed his hand. You're a hero and a gentleman, Jailer. If things go bad for you here... Ever, there's a safe haven for you and the family. It's Dash. Don't tell me where. You know why. Skirata scribbled a code on the flimsy pad on his forearm plate. Okay, but take this. It's a go-between. If you ever need anything, anything at all, calm this code and they'll find me. Skirata hated goodbyes. He embraced Obram in silence, and then walked back to the speeder without a backward glance. Even when he lifted off, he didn't look down. Now he was back where he'd been so many times in his life, in a stolen vessel, with just the armor he stood up in and enough weapons to make a stand. But he had nine million creds on him, too, and he was far from finished. So comms might be compromised. He wasn't going to lead anyone to Aihan by accident. 
He fell back on the kind of technology that had always left the Aruatais flat-footed, and disappeared into an ancient stormwater conduit that had been built and abandoned long before Coruscant had climate management. He switched to an unencrypted GR channel and his helmet calm, and simply transmitted static. It was a special kind of static, of course. Long and short bursts, carefully interspersed in sequences. To a casual listener, it was just random noise and interference. But to a Mandalorian trained in an ancient message code called Datata, it spelled out words. It could even transmit code. There weren't that many in the Gia with even that basic knowledge. Only the Nulls, the Commandos, and the last of the Kiwi Valdar. Skirata kept transmitting a coded message, waiting for someone to sift it from the white noise. Republic Detention Center, Paul's Annexes. It's handy being a clone, Fi said. Your uniform always fits. I haven't worn this meatkin for years. Spar adjusted his belly plate again. I'd forgotten about all the interesting places it pinches. The three clones Spar, Sul, and Fi marched into RDC Polax, as it was called in GR Signals, looking exactly like every other trooper on duty at the prisoner of war camp. Juzik played detainee. Fi made sure he held on to Juzik as if keeping a firm grip on him, to disguise the fact that his gait wasn't the paragon of military precision that it had once been. The camp was chaotic. Fi had expected something grim and desperate, but it was just crowded. There were gun turrets on the walls that obviously meant business. But once they passed through the security gate with their counterfeit armor tallies and prisoner transfer authorizations, they found themselves in something that resembled a migrant's transit camp, a rag bag of species, uniforms, and lots of prisoners waiting in lines for one thing or another. Why take prisoners? Spar asked. Why not just shoot them? Juzik could hear the conversation going on inside the helmets because he had a concealed comm link bead deep in his ear, but he couldn't reply. He just cleared his throat meaningfully. I mean it, Spar said. They tie up resources. What use are they? Let them go, or slot them. I think you must have missed the lecture on rules of engagement and lawful orders, Fai said. It was probably after you went AWOL. Juzik stifled a grin. Fi saw his lips twitch. You're back, he said barely audible. Fi was still more conscious of what he couldn't do than what he could but his verbal skills were definitely on the mend. If he had to choose, he thought, he would trade marksmanship for fluent speech. Juzik looked a lot older than he'd been at the start of the healing process 18 months ago. Fi decided he'd rely on his own recovery efforts from now on. The effect on his brother he saw Juzik as true kin now was visible. It was draining the life out of him. Okay, Jedi, Sul said. Here comes the nice camp commander. Look sullen and recalcitrant. Call me Jedi again, Juzik said quietly, and I'll show you my force kick in the backside. How very serene, Sul said. Fi couldn't let it pass unchallenged. Sul, why don't you shut it? Just getting Bardan in character. Mean Moody Sep Rabble. The camp commander was a lieutenant from the 55th. Mechanized Brigade, which struck Fi as a waste of skills until he realized how stiffly the man was walking. He'd clearly been wounded. Fi fought down the urge to ask him what had happened and how he'd recovered. He was proof of a soldiering life after injury. There was hope. Permission to interview one of your detainees, sir. Sol said shoving a GR issue data pad at him. The lieutenant looked at the pad and nodded. This is for ID purposes, is it? Yes, sir. Sol was actually pretty good at sounding like an ordinary trooper. But then arcs were trained to be resourceful. 
this prisoner claims he can identify a female human we're looking for. She might be using the alias Razan Skirata. If it's the right woman, this is our authorization to transfer her to Karuskin for questioning. Oh, her, said the lieutenant wearily. Very aggressive female, detained on Chimerian. She's in confinement. Not for her own safety for the rest of the prisoner's welfare. Thanks for the heads up, sir. We'll exercise caution. Hut eight bravo. The lieutenant said gesturing to his left. Show your ID to the droid. If I had heard no mention of Skirata's daughter having the slightest interest in her father's culture. Maybe his sons didn't know. Fi shared Ordo's mistrust of their motives. If they found out their dad was sitting on a trillion credit fortune that was growing rapidly just by being in the bank, they'd probably want to read opt him. Fi hoped his daughter was more grateful for the effort her father had gone to. If she wasn't, he'd dump her out the nearest airlock. I think poor old Scarato was under the impression that his little girl was banged up in some disease-ridden death camp. Spar said. This actually looks quite civilized. Look at that smash ball court they've got better sports facilities than we ever had. This used to belong to the old naval training branch. Juzik said. Stay in character, Jedi. The guard droid whirred into their path at the entrance to Hut 8 Bravo to check codes and authorizations, then led them down a long passage flanked by cells. The place looked like a mobile med center. Stay there. The droid said placing a manipulator arm on the door. I must check that the prisoner is secure first. If I switch to helmet-only audio. Ready, Bardike? Remember, when you recognize her she's betrayed your people, you want to rip her head off, she stole your lunch creds, and so on. Uh-huh. Then she protests she's never seen you before in her life, and we haul her away. Spar's shoulders looked braced. By the time they work out she never reached the Coruscant facility, she'll be light years away. And if she thinks she really recognizes you will just wing it. Fi was still worried. We can't keep using the trooper armor as a cover. Someone's going to work out it's an inside job. Fi, do you know how much white plastid's been scavenged from battlefields in the last few years? So last? We ended up fighting seps who had more armor than we did. That's why we have to keep changing the comm link and data protocols. A stream of abuse interrupted them, a woman's voice. The droid reversed out of the cell at high speed. You may speak to the prisoner while I observe. It said, Exercise caution. It wasn't joking. Roscarata no armor, just prison fatigues was pacing the cell, or as much of it as she could in the tiny space available to her. A restraining bulk had a sheet of durasteel mesh that could be moved back and forth to pin the prisoner, had cornered her. It reminded Fi of the kind of cage veterinarians used to subdue an animal so they could administer a hypospray without getting ripped to shreds. It created a small open space inside the cell door. Fi hauled Juzik into it to confront Ru. Asik, she was so much like Cal Bear that it was scary. It wasn't just the piercing pale blue stare and the prominent cheekbones that told Fi this was the genuine fruit of his adopted father's loins. It was the look of a rabid shutter about to run up his leg and sink its teeth in his throat. Is this the woman? Fi said. He had to hand it to Bardike. The guy could act. Juzik fixed Ro with a look that changed from scrutiny to dawning realization to utter hatred. Traitor. His voice was a low rumble. It rose to a convincing crescendo. Traitor. You got us killed. And now I'm going to kill you. Fi grabbed him in a restraining hold equally convincing. Who the Stang are you? Red demanded. 
Fi hoped the droid couldn't analyze human bioscience well enough to tell that the woman was genuinely taken aback. Her angry shudder expression gave way to blank bemusement for a moment. I've never seen you before, because if I had I'd have punched your face in. Liar. Traitor. Fi jerked Juzik back by the neck. You're being transferred to Karuskant, Skirata, he said to Ru. Come quietly, and we won't need to use force. Look, chum, I'm a prisoner of war and I've got rights. I demand legal representation. You can't just take me without due process. Spar reached past Fi to flash the data pad at her. Here's your due process. Personally, I'd rather use force, so carry on as you are, ma'am, and give me a good excuse to smack you one. It was now or never. Guard, lift the bulkhead, Sol said. Shadow was an even better description than Fi had imagined. She fought like a maniac, and Sol and Spar had a job on their hands restraining her without breaking anything. As they hauled her down the corridor, she was spitting abuse that made Calbir's cussing sound like a Jedi Master's learned discourse. There was a crowd of inmates gathering outside now. Fi could see them clustering around the door, and his fear was that this would spark a riot. It was supposed to be a Loki extraction. As things were panning out, it was turning into a circus, and that wasn't good. You can't do this to me, you carbon flush. Rebellowed. I know what happens on Karuska to Dash. Spar tightened his grip on her collar and got a good kick in the ankle, which probably still hurt even in armor. It was a weak point. He diverted to his internal audio link. We really need to shut her up. Juzik coughed and pressed Fi's arm. Leave it to me. Spar, leave her to Bardike. Fi said, loosening his grip. Fi had no idea what was coming next, but he trusted Juzik to pull off something timely. Juzik pulled free from Fi, yelled, Scumbag! And threw a punch. Fi could have sworn it didn't land, there was no sickening crack of bone, no connecting recoil, but Ruskirata slumped to the ground unconscious, and Spar and Sel scooped her up between them with an audible sigh of irritation. Fi seized Juzik and bundled him toward the main gates. The crowd of inmates were making restless noises, milling around. Droid guards moved in with a couple of clone troopers to break it up. They don't know how to run a prison, Sol said. They were nearly out now. Fi could see the calm mass of the GR high-speed gunship they'd borrowed for the occasion. There was a lot to be said for a military bureaucracy that kept poor tabs on its assets. Crowd control. You can't allow inmates out to mass like that. You can't dash. If they were good at it. Spar interrupted. We'd have had to fight our way in and out. Be grateful. The security gates closed behind them. Fi maintained a grip on Juzik until they were out of range of the detention center. Ru was already coming out of her daze. I'm going to kill you, she mumbled. No, you're not, Fi said. Because we're the good guys. He helped Sul cuff and shackle her anyway, having calculated the damage she might do before they managed to convince her. Fi and Juzik sat watching her in the small cargo bay while Sol prepared for takeoff. It wasn't until the sky beyond the small viewport was densely black and speckled with white-hot stars that Fi felt relaxed. Actually, he felt exhausted. He definitely wasn't as fit as he'd been. He'd have to start a serious training regime again. You did great, Fi, Juzik said. If I hadn't known what had happened to you, I'd have had a hard job spotting there was anything wrong. I can get by the way I am now. As soon as Fi heard himself say it, he knew he'd passed the watershed. Any more improvement is a bonus. Good man. 
Juzik patted him on the back. Let's see what our guest has to say for herself. That was fascinating, Bardike, Spar said, removing his helmet. Some punch. Juzik was sixty kilos ringing wet, if that. He smiled to himself, miming a quick right hook. I've got the weight and reach, he said. Could have turned professional. How'd you do it? Force stun. Yeah. Of course. Spars still seemed wary of Juzik. I thought you'd given up all that spooky stuff. Not in an emergency. Ru's eyes were fully open, and the bravado had ebbed. She was scared now. She looked from face to face, then settled on Juzik. My jaw ought to hurt, she said. But it doesn't. And I really don't know who you are. What do you want? I'm nobody worth kidnapping. Your father sent us to get you out, Ruzike. Father? She squirmed to sit up. Father? Phi braced for a stream of invective about abandonment, all kinds of asik that he wasn't going to let her say about Kelber. Instead, she just blinked a few times. You mean Kalskarada? She said. You got another one? Spar asked. Yes, Mama remarried. Phi decided it was probably safe to untie her. The mention of her father had subdued her better than any whack on the head. And that makes me your stepbrother, R. My name's Phi. How criffing heartwarming, Spar said exasperated. There won't be a dry eye in the house. Dad came for me. Her face was pure stunned joy. He really did. Well, we did because he's a bit busy at the moment. Phi savored the bizarre moment of epiphany. He had a sister, of sorts. And he had a wife, too, and a father, a legal one, and he had brothers. He was like any other man. The out-of-reach normal life that had tormented him was now fully his. It was wonderful, even if very few beings had a family as strife-prone, heavily armed, and bizarre as this. But he never forgets his kids. I always knew he'd come back. I knew it. How did he find me? Your brothers got in touch. Eventually. Has he forgiven me? For what? Never contacting him. It was hard to know what to say. Fi glanced at Juzik, who gave him a look that said to leave it for later. Spa rolled his eyes and slipped into the cockpit to join Sol, probably driven back by the threat of a tidal wave of sentimentality. You're back now, Fi said. And that's all he'll care about. Chances were, Fi thought, that Cal Bear was busy running for his life. They'd all had the message from Ordo. Bear now had a warrant on his head. But Rud didn't need to know that yet. Coruscant Underground Emergency Reservoir. Nearly there, Skarata said. Nearly there. He loaded his belt pouch with ammo clips from A.E. Han's armory and shoved an extra blaster in each boot. Can't lose our nerve now. Ordo had come to find Skarata hoping that his father would stay put, wait for the rest of the team to come to them, and then bang out in A.E. Han. But he was Skarata and sitting on his shebs wasn't how he did things. As soon as Juzik's back and Razan's secure here, I suggest we grab Yuthan and get it over with, Kalbir. Omega's not due back for a week, Skarata said. I can't leave without them. They might have to RV with us elsewhere. Son, I know they can hijack anything with an ion drive or a ban the hauling it, but I don't want to rely on that. The more stragglers you have, the more routes you have to secure. And assembling in one place can make us more vulnerable. On balance, it's still safer. 
Minimize time and distance spent separated. Regroup. Then I'll retrieve them. But all the intel I'm getting is of a big fleet buildup, and we can't delay. Actually, we could. We could have left any time before. We can leave any time now. Bear, from the shipyard end, you can't hide it. And Centax shipping movements are ten times what they've been before now. Something's going down, and soon. Isn't anyone asking where all this extra activity is going? Nobody's checking in that direction, Calbear. Only us. I can't find any overlap. There's no calm traffic between Centax 2 and GR Command, and nothing that indicates any tasking of the second wave of vessels. It seemed staggering. But then nobody had spotted the Grand Army in preparation for ten years, and even if Camino was cloistered and off the charts, Quote was not. Ordo marveled at the fact that a vast war machine a whole fleet, weapons, and equipment for millions of troops had been manufactured and stored without anyone leaking information or wondering what Rothana or its parent company KDY was doing. He thought that it was just because three million was a small army in galactic terms. And then he realized that it was actually because most beings weren't very good at putting pieces of a puzzle together and seeing the bigger picture. Palpatine could hide anything that way. He hid his secret in plain sight, mixed into the sheer mundane business of the galaxy. I've got to get back to HQ, Ordo said. Calber, please don't take risks, okay? It was a feeble thing to say to a mercenary, and Ordo knew it. I'm going to retrieve Cat IK and the ladies, and then we grab Yuthin, Skarata said. Can you find a way to recall Omega? Have they said they're willing to desert? Not in so many words. Sometimes you have to give folks a nudge to save themselves. Skarata had learned nothing about giving others choices. He'd kick straight back into Father Knows Best mode despite the fight with Darman, but that blind reflex had saved Ordo and his brothers, and it was impossible to condemn it. When it went right, it was salvation. Where are you going? Ordo asked. As soon as Juzik's back, I'll go with him and spring Yuthin. And you've got a plan. We will have, by the time we get there. You taught me planning was everything, Calbear. I also taught you that you have to seize opportunities. Ordo held up an admonishing finger. You will not put yourself at risk. Your luck's run out. Take a rest. Or you'll never live to see another grandchild. Skarada paused. You telling me something, son? Is Bessany? No. No, not at all. Ordo was taken aback to think Calbear might have believed he planned things so haphazardly. I'm just increasingly worried by the risks you take. Big risks for big gains. Skirata went back to loading himself with weapons. Ordo could have sworn the adrenaline had taken ten years off him. It was fascinating to see what crushed him and what put him back on his feet again. Don't worry, I've got too much to live for. I'd better report into Zay, Ordo said, and give him the illusion that he commands me. Stay in contact, but don't take any risks on comms. Yes, son. Skirata grinned. And I promise I won't stay out after midnight. Ordo slipped through the deserted tunnels and automated pumping rooms that controlled the underwater lake's levels. Then made his way back to HQ, reversing his security measures change out of civilian clothing, then into overalls, then stop again to change into his armor and collect his speeder bike. An arc captain in his showy scarlet pauldron and red-trimmed comma was conspicuous even on Coruscant, where wild variety was the wardrobe order of the day. Or at least he thought he would still stand out from the crowd. Now there seemed to be a lot more clone troopers on the walkways, regular security patrols, red or blue markings on their white armor. 
He'd watched the numbers grow discreetly over the last few weeks. The ones with blue markings were 501st Legion, just one more designation in a complex army that preferred numbers to names. He decided to seize the moment, and swooped onto a convenient landing platform to speak to them. He looked like any other ARC captain. They couldn't even tell he was a null ARC by scanning him, unless he chose to present his real number, an 11, on his armor's electronic tally. Sergeant, he said, approaching one of them. How long will you be on patrol here? Until 20 hundred, Captain? Ordo listened for the subtleties of the accent, and knew this man hadn't been trained on Kamino. There were overtones of coarse scanty accent that few would spot, but Ordo did. And he'd watched the 501st, and the other troopers in the red livery, the shock troopers, noting their level of precise discipline. Very good, Sergeant, Ordo said. Carry on. These weren't the economy model clones from Centax 2. These had to be the direct effect clones from the Coruscant facility that the Nulls hadn't yet located. It hadn't seemed as urgent a task as finding what had to be a huge production line on Centax 2. The few Centax clones that had been detected well, no wonder they didn't know what Kamino was like. Ordo had no doubt they'd been told Centax was Kamino, so that they didn't make any gaffes about their origin and expose the army in waiting. In a closed world, you had no reason or way to disbelieve what you were told. They'd passed the test most of the time. Ordo landed the Aerotech outside area barracks main entrance in the row of dispatch speeder bikes and went in search of Zay, mainly to report to him now that Skirata was officially suspended. Maze passed him in the corridor, helmeted. That was unusual these days. It meant he was engrossed in a lot of calm traffic. How's Skirata? Maze asked. I have no idea, Ordo said to his retreating back. He's vanished, as the general is fully aware. Of course he has, said Mays, walking into the refreshers. Ordo was working out what stunt he could stage to get Omega recalled when the alarm klaxon sounded. It stopped him in his tracks. He'd only ever heard it tested for routine maintenance, and he never really expected to hear it used for real. It was the incoming attack alert. Air assault. Invasion. Ordo paused to check the nearest building control panel, expecting to see a red flashing light indicating a short, and that the alarm was a false one. The panel was operating normally. An incongruously serene droid voice drifted over the open comm system. This is not a drill. Repeat, this is not a drill. Inbound enemy ships have been detected. Report to muster stations. Execute emergency procedures. There were suddenly droids, civilian staff, and even the occasional trooper issuing from every doorway. The insistent two-tone noise was so deafening that the audio buffers in Ordo's helmet kicked in. Mays came running back down the corridor at full tilt, adjusting his armor. It's a whole standing fleet. He snapped tapping his helmet to indicate he was patched into the tactical display. Great timing. Ordo agreed but he meant it, and for wholly different reasons. Opportunity, Kalber said opportunities were also threats. It just depended on how you handled them. You get say to the command bunker, and I'll start locking down the system. An ARC trooper's role on the ground if Coruscant was compromised was protecting the command center and strategic targets if the enemy managed to land. If the enemy got a foothold then his task was sabotage, assassination, and eventually organizing the populace to wage total guerrilla war. Maze sprinted in search of Zay. Ordo decided that if he had to trash Zay's personal data to protect it, he'd take a fast download of it first. Sir. A commando from Yayak's squad jogged up to him, still fastening his belt. He was one of Brawler's COV, if memory served. I'm rounding up the new intake. 
They might as well learn on the job. Orders? Ordo didn't have enough until yet to know where to concentrate his men, and that was Zay's role anyway. He had his own ideas in the meantime. He defaulted to the main contingency plan. Get everyone as tooled up as you can strip the armory if need be, and get as many vessels as possible in the air. The commandos weren't pilots, but they could fly well enough to shift to LAT slash I or any transports hanging around. Then deploy to HNE headquarters. Keep them on air to transmit emergency public broadcasts. GR artillery is supposed to take up position there. Give them support. Yes, sir. And Sergeant Vav's on his way, I just saw him. Ordo did a quick mental check of who was where before he took another step. Phi, Juzik, Spar, and Sol were inbound. Mariel and Aiden were still in the city. Jang and Kamarke were on their way back to Utapal, and Pritiai if he was on schedule was causing a reactor on SEP controlled Byrex to go critical about now. Why hadn't anyone seen this fleet coming? It wasn't as if they hadn't been keeping tabs on General Grievous. Someone knew he was coming, though. It was all very convenient timing. Was this all part of some elaborate ambush by the Republic? luring the Seps to a relatively sparsely defended capital only to smash them with a hidden army? If that was Palpatine's plan all along, Ordo felt he owed him an apology, grudging as it was. Clever boy, Chancellor. Maybe I misjudged you. Ordo slipped into the nearest control room to activate its holochart projector, then keyed in the code to display the real-time battle chart being generated from the main GAR HQ three kilometers away. It was the first time he'd felt on the margins of events. He wasn't in control of this. He could only react, or take orders. This wasn't how he liked to fight. ARC 170s were already airborne and streaming out to meet the separatist starfighters that were sweeping ahead of the main fleet. Switching to the ground chart, he could see armored units being moved into skylanes and surrounding key buildings. Now the planetary defense shield had been activated why so late? What took so long? And hundreds of enemy vessels, including capital ships, had now been caught within it. Like being locked up with a rancor. It's going to get messy. The gar's overstretch was now painfully visible. Too many assets were spread elsewhere in the galaxy. They'd have to recall units immediately. But it was not his decision to make. He was watching a fragment of the war, like any other soldier, and even a better idea of the bigger picture didn't help. Boots and claws clattered down the corridor. Vav skidded into the office, Murd at his side. Palpatine knew this was coming. Ordo said, is he going to get that shiny new fleet here in time? Maybe. Get your Beskar on, or Daike. Vav placed his black helmet over his head with an almost ceremonial air. It transformed him instantly into a faceless warrior, age and species and gender indeterminate. He was an archetype of war. We're going to end up fighting droids on the ground and not for the Shabla Republic either and we need to grab Yuthin. There's no better time. Perfect cover to move everyone's too busy to worry about us. No time to pick up my armor, Ordo said. I'll fight in this rig. It's served me well so far. Murd frantic but silent, thrashed its tail and darted around occasionally letting a tightly suppressed whine of excitement escape. Ordo sprinted for the entrance abandoning the data code to talk to Skirata on the comlink while he ran. Nobody was going to worry about hunting him now that the planet was being invaded. Stay put, Kalbir, he said. Do you hear me? I need you and A.E. Hunt to act as a forward operating base. HNE's just repeating the stay calm message, Skirata said. I've got the GR tactical displays in front of me now. I need to get Lasima, Bessany, 
and CAD down here. Vav's voice cut in on the comlink. He was right behind Ordo. Cal, they're now with Midge and Wadi in another safe house, lower levels code coming to you now. Don't move them unless the area comes under attack. The SEPs are going to be after the high-value targets first, not slums. Gosh, I never have worked that out, Wallen. I'll RV with Faisal's still trying to land. He's coming in a long way south of the GR landing platform. The fighting's too heavy above the center of the city. Ordo's instinct was to go to Skirata, but another urge told him he had seps to kill, and yet another said this was as Vav observed the best time to grab Yuthin. Then his helmet calm kicked into life again, but it wasn't Kalbir. Say to all special ops personnel, in a rim. Code 5, Code 5. Repeat, Code 5, Code 5. Any way you can, people. Keep calm link overrides open. May the force be with you. Every Republic commando on SOB strength, wherever they were in the galaxy, had heard that signal. It was one of a long list of worst scenarios. It was immediate recall to Coruscant for any squads deployed in the inner rim to defend the capital. Their generals in those few places where Jedi officers accompanied them would have heard it, too. If the situation deteriorated, the recall net would be cast wider. First things first, Vav said. Let's find Fi's ship, and then Mariel and Aiden. Agreed, said Ordo. He started his speeder bike's drive. Is Murd okay on a bike? Vav hotwired the speeder bike standing next to Ordo's. He was good at appropriating transport. Loves it, he said swinging onto the seat. Murd scrambled up behind him and seized the pillion seat and Vav's back plate with his claws. Six legs give you a good grip. It was only when they lifted off and headed south that they saw the scale of the fighting. The ARC-170 squadrons were still holding off separatist fighters high in the atmosphere, but the aerial bombardment had begun, and there were already palls of smoke rising from the business quarter near the Senate. This is where we choose sides, Ordo, Vav said, a disembodied voice in his helmet. We fight for the Republic, or we fight for the survival of our own. We can't do both, except by accident. Ally it then, said Ordo, thinking about the RC squads who would do their duty to the end and feeling wretched at his choice. Our clan. Chapter 14 Okay, I admit it now. Palpatine strategically and tactically brilliant. He's spread the GR so thin that the Seps thought Coruscant was here for the taking, and so they roll in and bang he unleashes his second force behind them. He gets them to come to him. Well, at least we know now what he was building that second clone army and all the ships for. Now all we have to do is get out in one piece. Nice one, Chancellor, you slimeball. Cal Scarata, interpreting Palpatine's motives in a logical military light and getting it completely wrong. Gar Rapid Assault Vessel Inbound for Coruscant, five hours into the Battle of Coruscant, 1,080 days ABG. Omega Squad dropped out of hyperspace and stared in disbelief as they reoriented themselves. Asik, said Niner. Now we're screwed. A seething mass of warships spread in a massive formation, converging on Coruscant. There must have been a couple of thousand and that was just the ones they could see with the Mark I eyeball from the viewplate. Big ships. Hold the Asik, Aden said. They're ours. Niner tapped keys and the cockpit scans rolled a long list of Republic transponder and pennant codes. Darman leaned over Niner's shoulder. I didn't think we had that many hulls to deploy, he said. Anyone recognize any of these crates? Aden shook his head. I don't know half of these. Right pennant code, right transponder, 
right drive signature. Niner hit the key again, and again, and the same confirmations flashed on the cockpit display, a cycle of Republic codes and ship names, new names. This fleet was the good guys. We seem to have acquired a new box of warships. Maybe it's our birthday, and we forgot. Darman flipped from sinking dread to elation to resentment in seconds. He thought the timing was pretty sick, given the last three miserable, fruitless, futile years of sweating blood and seeing no real progress, of taking a planet and then moving on only to see it fall again. They could have done with an injection of ships and men like this a long, long time ago. Home, my good man. C.O.R.R. said tapping Niner's shoulder. And don't spare the drives. As the assault vessel headed at top speed for Coruscant, threading between carriers, destroyers, and cruisers, it was becoming clear that they were looking at a turning point of the war. Sergeant Cal was right. Aden said. Palps really did have a secret army and fleet up his sleeve. Better late than never. Niner said fists tight on the vessel's yoke. He was a competent pilot, but not a confident one. Let's check in with Zay. Dar, ping the old man for us, will you? It took a few moments to get Zay to respond. While Darman waited anxious seconds, the assault ship designed for thirty troops, the first asset they could grab skimmed inside the safely zone of a massive cruiser, so close that Darman could see the markings on the hull. There were no scorch marks, gouges, or even widespread pocking from space debris. This ship was new. Omega, Zay said, shimmering into life as a blue hologram. Niner, what's your estimate? Half an hour to area barracks, sir, if we don't run into trouble. Divert to these coordinates, Omega. Numbers flashed up on the NAE display. We've got mobile anti-air batteries at all the main utility stations around Galactic City, but it's only a matter of time before the SEPs get a foothold on the ground. If we lose power over large sectors, then we've got a major civilian safety problem, and we don't need a few billion citizens stranded without pumped water and comms on top our current woes. Keep that generating station running, Omega. Copy that, sir. Niner was never mocking Zay when he said that, unlike some. Mind my asking where our extra assets came from? You tell me, Zay said sourly. The additions to the fleet have come as something of a surprise to us all. Sergeant. But now is not the time for the Jedi Council to ask the Chancellor why. The Holoimage shivered and vanished. If only it was just a nice simple war. C.O.R.R. said. Still, mustn't grumble. That's the trouble with fighting in a place like Coruscant. Niner kept tapping vectors into the NAV computer, looking for a clear run in through the vast maze of ships. Complex, crowded infrastructure that's easily disrupted billions of scared folk fleeing in speeders, clogging the skylanes because the autonav is down fires, collapsed buildings, ruptured water mains, you name it. Look at it as keeping the civvies out of our lads' hair while they get on with the job of killing seps. Darman hoped someone planetside would remember to drop the shields for a moment to let the assault ship land. It was a terrifying picture of a city under attack. There was a certain simplicity to warfare, the act of trying to kill the other guy before he killed you. Once civvies were added though, it all became much messier. And once you knew you had a baby son down there on Coruscant, it made it messy still. Cad better be safe, Darman said. And Lasima. Aten nodded to himself. All of them, in fact. It was all he needed to say. The squad fell silent. This wasn't just a mission. They all had a very personal stake in saving Coruscant. Darman was pretty sure that none of them felt stone cold now, like an H&E news droid had once said commandos always were. At least the Tane's off-planet, C.O.R.R. said. If the Sefs are piling in here, Kashyyyk might be quiet for a while. 
Niner huffed. Well, lucky her, because it's not quiet here. He brought the AV around in loop to clear two vessels exchanging cannon rounds. Omega were past the single mass of Republic ships now, and into a mixed chaos with enemy vessels, fighters, and even random friendlies. An armed Mon Calfreder caught in the melee was pouring fire from its small cannon onto a SEP gunship with magnificent abandon. The AV streaked past it before Darman saw the outcome of the skirmish. C.O.R. leaned forward in his seat to look at the screens. The whole squad was crammed into the cockpit, watching the status screens. Shab, Niner, look at the shield level. Yeah, we've managed to trap a lot of stink flies down there. That'll be fun. Cannon fire was ripping hulls apart all around him, and starfighters were ending their sorties in balls of silent, blinding white light. Otten looked at the sensor screens. Some Shabir on our shebs. It looked like a fighter on the scan. If he's not targeting us, he's worked out we're going in. He's tailgating, Niner said, pushing the drive to the limits. Hang on to your frillies. Sixty seconds to shield. C.O.R.R. tightened his restraints. Knock, knock, let us in. Remember to break if they don't, Auden said. They can always open an intersection for us. Niner was dead serious. He always was at times like this. They only have to drop one generator node for five or six seconds. But Darman's thoughts strayed. He was thinking ahead to when the Seps would be beaten back, and maybe maybe the war would be over or in its dying days. There was a topic they hadn't mentioned since Skarada had broken the news to them in the barracks refreshers, but Darman knew they'd all thought about it a lot. I'm going over the wall, he said gravely. When this is done, I'm deserting to Mandalore. Who's with me? C.O.R.R. raised a finger. Me. Yep, Otten grunted, patting the DC-17 on his lap. Niner didn't answer. Darman waited. Okay, I don't want to be the last nerf stake left in the shop, Niner said. Darman never expected to hear that. I'd better come, too. The relief was palpable, even though they were hurtling toward a defense shield still firmly in place. Omega squad to shield control, we need entry. Silence. The checkered field of Triple Zero's towers seen from the air rushed up to meet them. 5-4 Omega to shield control, let us in. 3-2 Shield control, to Omega, you're clear. A flash of light showed that a short-lived portal had opened and the AV plunged through. Omega, on your six. Shield control snapped. The SEP fighter had made it through behind them. It was a stupid thing to do, seeing as the D-cut was now stuck in Cory airspace, but some pilots got that red mist in front of their eyes and only thought a second ahead. Missed it or not, he could still shoot. The cockpit sensors throbbed with red light and a frantic rasping alarm. The SEP had a lock on them. The AV bucked and spun 180 degrees, turning into its own smoke and flames, and that was the only way Darman knew the crazy pilot had fired. Shabir, Niner said, and even in this chaos, even with the towers of Coruscant spiraling up to meet them he let loose a couple of Firaxa heat seekers. Brace for impact. Dumbest way to die, said C.O.R.R. The ball of flame might have been theirs or it might have been their pursuers. They had no way of knowing until they hit the ground. Darman felt his teeth smack down into his lip about the same time as he heard a loud crunch in his helmet, and then he was upended in a gray hot fog. Something shook the cockpit. The sudden rush of air was as loud as a scream, although he couldn't feel it. Something caught his leg. Ty was still sharply aware of needing to get the shab out of there as fast as he could, 
because his brain set fire even though he couldn't see or feel it, and he kicked at what he thought was a cable snagging his boot. Dar, it's me. A fist hit his leg plate. Stop kicking. It was Niner. The next thing Darman knew he'd fallen onto something hard that wasn't moving. Someone grabbed both arms and hauled him away so fast that his boots dragged and he fell. He was sure he fell before the explosion behind him knocked him down. Vahim. He could see now. It was all yellow light and sharp shadows. When he sat up, trying to get to his feet, he saw burning wreckage and the gaping cockpit of the AV with its viewport split into sections. You got jammed under the instrument panel by the impact, Auden said. Niner blew the viewport's emergency bolts to drag you clear. And your dees. Thanks, Sarge. Thanks. It was pitifully inadequate. Save me one more time, and you get to keep me. We'll all need saving if we don't get a move on. Come on. Let's orient ourselves and crack on. Work to do, bad guys to slot. The smoke from the burning wreckage gave them cover for a moment. Niner turned and ran for the protection of an office building. All the lights were on, but nothing was moving inside. When Darman dropped into the doorway and squatted to check his dees and side up, he was looking back on a mass of twisted metal and shattered permacrete. The fighter pursuing them seemed to have exploded before it hit the ground and had scattered debris everywhere. A drive housing with protruding shafts had embedded itself in a wall. Niner crouched with his glove to one side of his helmet, trying to raise HQ on the calm. Where's everyone gone? C.O.R.R. asked. Shelters, I hope, said Otten. Niner stood up, making quietly exasperated noises. It's chaos back there. They don't want us at H6 now. They want us to report to tactical control at Gar HQ. That's ten clicks. A stroll, C.O.R.R. said. Nice evening for it, too. Darman could see a strobing light reflecting off the transparent steel. He peered out from the doorway, ready to blow the next thing he saw to Heron, but it was a CSF assault ship hovering close to the wreckage. He signaled to it and ran out to beckon the pilot to land. The side hatch opened. You can't park there, soldier, the cop said. Not on even numbered days. What are you doing out here? Darman pointed at the aerial light show. Debris metal, fuel, flame was raining down just half a click away. Haven't you looked up yet? The cop shrugged smoke-stained and looking weary. Been hurting civvies. Why do they not understand stay indoors and don't block the skylanes? There were so many trying to enter the grid that the skylane NAV system fell over. Anyway. I saw the smoke here and decided to take a look. We bounced. Darman thought of CAD. How many city casualties? Thousands. I couldn't give you a definite figure. It's the debris. When you get a SEP cruiser to fall on you, you know all about it. Area med centers can't cope. Can you give us a ride to Gar HQ? Sure. Might have to divert if we get a call, but hop in. You commandos? Darman beckoned the squad. Yeah. RCs. You'd know Fi then. Top man that? Darman had to smile. Even in this direst of circumstances, Fi was a legend, at least among the cops of Coruscant. He'd find that funny. Omega's squad piled into the crew compartment of the cop's ship, and it lifted clear. Didn't know we had that big a fleet, the officer said. The news said there were more coming in. Where have they been? Waiting, Niner said. It'll all be over soon. The whole war. It would. Darman could almost feel it. 
He checked his comm link for a sit-up from Attain, but there was nothing yet. He could wait, too. Manufacturing District, Karuskant. Zayu would probably have forgiven him and welcomed his help about now, but Skirata decided there was no point pushing his luck. Right then, he didn't give a Mott's backside about Palpatine, or Zay, or the whole Jedi Council. He just didn't want them getting in his way when he had his clan scattered across a city under siege. He paused the airspeeder at an intersection well in the cover of tall buildings and looked down, and then looked up. Karuskin had never seemed bigger. Without the vessels packed into the skylands at the heart of Galactic City, he could see a lot farther, and the full scale of the artificial canyons hit home. There were thousands of meters of empty skylane above him, and thousands below. The view left unimpeded by citizens who'd fled the center was a spectacular pyrotechnic show. The dusk was alight with explosions high in the atmosphere. One instant ball of white light faded to yellow right above his head then red, and then seemed to be getting bigger very fast and then he realized it was a massive chunk of burning debris plummeting to the ground. He hit the speeder's accelerator just in time to hear the whoosh and crackle in the air behind him. Smaller fragments fizzed past the hatches and bounced like hail off the view screen. It was a reminder to move under cover. He opened his comm link and if the Chancellor had time to chase him now, it was too bad. Ward I.K., Wallen, are you receiving? Bad signal, Calbear, but I hear you. Where are you, son? I've linked up with Phi, Juzik, and the Ark Double Act. And Omega's just had a hard landing. Thank all the forgotten gods of Mandalore. At least they were back, although it was a spectacularly bad time and place for a rendezvous. How hard. They ended up with a SEP fighter up their shebs. But it's okay they're heading for Gar HQ. Skirata formed a mental map of the city and placed his priority people on it again. Get them all down to Aihan, get Yithin, and go. Is Bard IK with you now? Is Ra giving him a hard time? He didn't say. She's safe. That's all. What now? I'm going for Yuthin. Skirata paused. He could see med runners and a fire speeder streaking along an empty sky lane far beneath him. Somewhere close above him, it seemed an anti-air battery was pumping ion rounds into the sky at something he couldn't SEC, and the rhythmic wump 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 shook his chest like a second heartbeat. We walk in and we take her. And we do it now, in case they evacuate the patients. I need Bardike in a suit, and two lads to act as clones. We are clones. I mean white jobs. You and Sul, preferably. Phi. We take Phi. Ordo was very fond of Phi, and when a Null had formed a close bond, nothing short of Detonite would break it. Okay, son. But is he up to it? He got your daughter out of prison. Okay. We RV at the lower level's landing platform directly beneath the Valorum Center. From there well, we grab the brakes we can get. It took Skarada ten minutes to get to the RV point. On a normal day, it would have taken four times as long. He landed the speeder realized that he'd have to abandon it on Karuskin sooner rather than later, and stood watching the ongoing aerial battle with a sense of disbelief that he could wander around a battened-down city under fire and not feel part of it, as if it were some holodrama. Eventually, he got back into the speeder and watched the h &E coverage. The media had dispatched chem droids, and the images from right among the ships were astonishing. It's real. Boys like Ordo are dying up their fighter pilots, ship's crew. Not just Seps. Stop watching it like a show. It was too voyeuristic for Skirata. He switched off the images and just kept the audio running for information, with one ear on his helmet comm link listening to chatter from the GR command center. 
When he heard the throb of drives approaching it was eerily quiet. Even with the distant noise of the battle he ducked down until he confirmed it was a gar liveried L.A.T. slash I gunship, showing no navigation lights. Wardai K. He said on his comm link, Is that you approaching the RV point? It's Fi. The landing lights blipped briefly. How you doing, Calbear? When the gunship set down, Fi was first out, and Skirata rushed to slap his back and hug him. He found himself looking over Fi's shoulder a stretch, given how much taller clones were to stare at a short, scruffy-looking, thirty-something woman in brown prison overalls. She stared back. Dad? Skirata didn't need to ask. Thirty years' separation just compressed into nothing. She was his little girl, his Ruzaike. There was nothing he could say, so he just hugged her, unable to even marshal his thoughts. Sorry about the timing, Ru, he said at last. And the location. Dad. I've waited such a long time. When we're done here, we can take you back to Drawl, or you can come with us. Ru just prodded him in the chest with her forefinger, eyes brimming. She didn't seem able to speak now. You'll like Mandalore, Skarada said. Cal, get a move on. Vav stuck his head out of the L.A.T. slash I. I've got your erudic clothes here. You might want to change before we do our house calls. Okay, we do a front door job then. It was an effort to switch back to being the bad old Mandomir, because he wanted to be an indulgent dad right then. It struck him that Ru had probably never known precisely what he did for a living. This was a shocking way to find out. Juzik and me we go in as suits. Fi and Ordo meet Kenarmer, our armed escorts. Whose authorization are we claiming? Vav asked. I need to fix the ID chips. Oh, Chancellor's office. Might as well tick him off completely. I hate doing half a job. It's good to be back in the field, Calbear, Fi said, grinning. Good to have you back, son. It was good to have everybody back. There was only Omega Squad and Attain to gather in now. The plan was nearly complete. The Lorem Center, Coruscant. The explosions and screaming of fighters overhead had stopped bothering Juzik now, although he still ducked instinctively. His force sense told him the danger wasn't close enough to warrant running for his life. It still helped to react like a regular being when he pressed the security intercom at the main gates, though. Security, said a voice. Here's my identity and authorization, Juzik said, playing Danelle Harris again and slapping the chips into the slot with the air of a man in a big, annoyed hurry. Harris, Coruscan Health. Have you evacuated the inmates yet? There was a crackling pause. We haven't been instructed to, sir. Do you not have an evacuation plan for civil emergencies? Juzik glanced at Skirata, who looked remarkably urbane in his banded jacket. He could be dapper, and he could be so low-key that he was invisible, but he would never pass for a psychiatrist. His hard life was etched in his face. Apart from the welfare of the patients, is your director aware that you have an inmate the separatists would like to release, and who could do immense damage to the Republic's defense effort? I do believe he is. Juzik could hear mumbling and shuffling at the other end of the comm link. Eventually, the security gates parted with a metallic grinding sound. Juzik strode in, flanked by Skirata, Ordo, and Fi. When he got to the inner doors, they were met by an anxious-looking woman in a medical tunic. We've not been told to evacuate yet, Master Harris. She was in a hurry to get them inside, and kept looking up at the sky even though the height of the buildings around the center obscured the view of the fighting. There's an emergency shelter below, but the patients here need escorts and supervision, and we don't have the staff or the droids. Where's your director? 
He went home to check on his family when the fighting broke out. He hasn't come back or come to us. I'm just the duty nursing officer. And I'm in charge, I suppose. It was perfect. The top man had run away, and this poor woman had an unfair responsibility dumped in her lap. Juzik didn't have to feign sympathy. Then at least I can solve one problem for you, he said. He indicated Fi and Ordo with a tilt of his head, it's okay. I've got the army with me, and you can trust us. We have authorization to remove one of your inmates, Doctor. Kale Yuthan, to a secure place in case the city falls and she's taken by the separatists. Can you take us to her, please? Juzik proffered the bogus clearance from the Chancellor's office. The woman took it. She didn't seem to have any idea how to verify it anyway. This way, she said, picking up a data pad. She looked at Skarada. Have you got restraints then? She seemed to think he was the hired muscle. Juzik didn't meet Skarada's eyes. We might not need to use them, ma'am, Skarada said in his best sergeant's voice. But we'll need details of any medication she's on, obviously. The doors parted and Juzik made a conscious effort not to feel what was happening around him. He never managed to fully shake off the memory of the first visit. Recalling the unquiet souls he brushed against in the forest here had felt like opening an old wound each time, fresh with pain. And they were still here. He struggled to close his mind to them. As he walked through the carpeted corridors, he felt that mind again the one that wasn't detached from reality and shouldn't have been there, locked up for reasons he would never know. And knew he could not stop to intervene. I should. How can I walk on by? But he did. He had a duty to his brothers, and at that moment the needs of clone troopers came first. Juzik didn't rationalize it on a scale of necessary evils and forgive himself. He simply accepted that he had done a shameful thing, and that he would have to live with it. Nice place, Skirata said almost to himself. Must cost a packet to run. Juzik could hear voices. There was crying coming from one direction, and occasional shouts to be let out, probably because the inmates could hear the bombardment going on. He could have sworn he heard that language again the one that had made him think someone was speaking Mandoy. Skirata didn't react to it. But Skirata's hearing had been damaged by years on the battlefield, so maybe he didn't pick it up. This is Dr. Yuthin's room. The nurse said unlocking the doors and taking a few steps back. She's all yours. Skirata flexed his shoulders, making the bantha hide jacket creak. Yuthan wouldn't know either of them from a hut. She knew what clones looked like though, and Fi had helped abduct her. There would be some explaining to do when the helmets came off. But by then it would be too late to argue. Yuthan was sitting at her desk, making notes on a pad as if she had no cares beyond a pressing schedule. She glanced up at Juzik. Oh, you again, she said. She indicated the world above her ceiling with a jerk of her head. I do hope they reduce your corrupt little planet to rubble. Juzik smiled and clasped his hands in front of him, then dropped his voice to a whisper. I said I'd get right on it when you asked to be released, doctor. Yuthin, he said. And I did. But I don't work for the Republic. Would you like to leave? The look of permanent disdain on her face vanished gradually like melting frost. And who are you? Just Mandalorians doing a job, ma'am. She'd had a Mandalorian minder on Kalura, Gez Hoken. She might not have thought much of him, but the M word said friendly forces to her. I hope you're more effective than the last one, she said quietly. Have I got time to collect my research material? Because if I haven't dash. Of course, said Juzik. That's why we're here. 
it was all completely true. There was a bit of Juzuke but he didn't like to look at that relish the game, enjoying the bluff and faint like a sabak player. I'm capable of terrible things. I must never forget that. He watched her gather up data pads and piles of flimsy and pack them in a bag. Nurse, she called. Nurse, can you let the sock off flies free in the morning? They kept me sane. It's the least I owe them. Juzik revised his view of Yuthin just a little. She picked up her bag and walked out through the doors of her cell as if she'd been expecting this rescue all the time. Skirata didn't look at Juzik, maintaining his active board sidekick, but he radiated satisfaction and relief in the force. Juzik found himself wondering what other scams Calbear had pulled over the years. He accepted that Skirata was a criminal and a killer, and still loved him dearly. There were no buts in that thought. Skirata was, from most perspectives, a complete Shabir, but his one saving grace was so vast, so all-encompassing, that it dwarfed any wrongdoing into insignificance. He could love unconditionally. He could love those who couldn't possibly be of any use to him, the marginalized and dispossessed, and even those who hurt him, and when he loved, he would give his life doing it, and ask no questions. Juzik could forgive Skirata anything for that painfully rare quality. Nicely done, son, Skirata murmured. They were now on the final leg of the mission. It was going fine, all things considered right up to the point when Juzik heard that voice again, that one tantalizing, half-familiar sound that made him listen. Nurse, he said. I need to check something. He held up a forefinger for silence. Hear that voice? It was the female one that sounded almost as if she was speaking Mandalorian. Something insisted begged, demanded that he at least go and look. Leaving the Jedi hadn't severed his connection to the Force. May I see that inmate? She may be on our list. When the nurse's back was turned, Skirata shot Juzik a glance. What are you playing at? Juzik just raised his finger a fraction farther. Bear with me. I'm afraid she's very uneasy around males, said the nurse. And she has a history of violence against them. Juzik peered into the room. The woman was maybe forty, forty-five, a little older, and didn't look as if she could mete out even a harsh word. She huddled in the corner, rocking for comfort, and when her eyes met his, he knew she was very troubled indeed. Can I talk to her? Juzik asked. Just be careful. The nurse slid the pad in front of him. She's on a 500 dose of zeloxapine, just to manage her, but she's been detained indefinitely for three homicides. I can't take responsibility for her. Juzik squatted down and resorted to a little mind influence, the most benign, to make her realize he meant her no harm. It was worth trying even if he was stretching their luck. Something told him he had to, and maybe it was simply that he'd walked by one and made too many. Nagai Bardike, he said. Tyan Gargai. Garaliat? He told her his name was Bardan, and asked her name and her clan name. She stared at him. It was as if she didn't believe what she was seeing or hearing. Arla, she said. She glanced at the nurse as if the woman was eavesdropping. Near Gain Arlavet. It wasn't Mandoy, but it was close enough for any Mandalorian to understand. Juzik turned slowly, still squatting, to look at Skirata. The old sergeant's face was a study in suppressed shock. I think this patient should be on our special care list, Juzik said. He beckoned to her. He knew he didn't look remotely threatening. Arla and Michael or at Mora twice he tap. He told her they would take her somewhere safe. He knew it was what she needed to hear. Somehow, 
He persuaded her to stand up and walk out the front doors with them, and into the ship waiting a few meters away. Juzik heard Skirata let out a long breath that he seemed to have been holding for months. I'm dying to hear the explanation, Yuthan said as the hatch closed. She looked around at the helmeted Mandalorians, troopers, and Ru, and edged away a little from Murd, who sniffed her leg enthusiastically. Arla cowered in a recess by the weapon's locker at the sight of the armor, and would not be coaxed out. But thank you, gentlemen. Where to now? We'll wait somewhere safe until the fighting dies down, Skarata said. The L.A.T. slash I lifted. Vav indicated Arla with a gracious gesture. Did we plan this, Cal? He asked. Why do we have an extra passenger? Skarata rubbed his face wearily with both hands. I think I agree with Bard I.K. that we couldn't leave her behind. But what was she in there for? It's important, Cal, given the business the Valorum Center is in. She murders people, Skarata said mildly. Like that makes her not good enough for us. Oh, Shab. Ordo said nothing, but Juzik could see Fai's shoulders shaking slightly and knew that even in this terrible, bizarre, potentially deadly situation, he was laughing uncontrollably. I thought I was a chancer, Skirata said, but Bard I.K., you make me look like a Nymoidian accountant. You know who that is, don't you? If she is who she thinks she is, anyway. Because she's supposed to be dead. Oh, I know, Juzik said. In the last few years, he'd absorbed all he could about Mandalore and its people, both from Mandoate themselves and from Aruatais who knew them all too well like certain Jedi. And that's why she deserves our help. So who is it? Vav asked plainly irritated. Murd watched the woman with head cocktails slapping. We'd better have a good reason for taking a psychotic killer with us tonight. We have said Juzik. That's Arla Fedjango's missing sister. Chapter 15 I didn't realize they had names. What do they think about? They don't know what life is really like, and all they know is war, so they're probably perfectly happy. I'm glad they don't suffer. Jedi Padawan Simi Noor, discussing clone troopers. Kashyyyk Three days into the Battle of Coruscant, 1,083 days ADG. Sev sat with one hand to the side of his helmet as if he was having trouble hearing his calm link. Fifty meters beneath the thick cables of living vine that formed the walkways from tree to tree, Scorch could see the beaten track of crushed vegetation. Battle droids couldn't climb trees. What's happening? Scorch whispered, even though he knew sound couldn't be heard outside his helmet. Have they codified us yet? Sev shook his head. Inner rim only. Anyway, aren't we busy enough? Listen for yourself. I'm trying to concentrate. I'm eavesdropping on the Sepcom band. Well, Corey's taking a pounding. Shab. Have they landed ground forces yet? Yeah, it's hotting up down there. But that's okay, because we have a nice big fleet now. Allies? How kind of them to remember us. Ours. Looks like Palps kept his spare war machine down the back of the sofa for a rainy day. Scorch didn't take his eyes off the route below as he switched channels to pick up the command frequencies at HQ. He knew the battle droid patrol was coming, and Boss was keeping visual observation from the ground. It wasn't as if Delta didn't have a job to do here, but the sheer helplessness of hearing the calm traffic he switched out of, he pilots circuit because it was actually distressing him was painful. They were light years away. There was nothing he could do. Liven with the massively reinforced fleet outside, he shielded. It was a desperate battle to stave off the destruction beneath it. And he was waiting to ruin a set patrol's entire day himself. 
It was a rare moment of quiet. The Wookiees were re-establishing a bridge network higher in the trees to replace the one at Kachiro, much narrower and more fragile spans that wouldn't take enemy traffic. If the Seps wanted to use these boratrons of aerial pathways, they'd have to be on foot. Fixer, this is Scorch you receiving? I'm ready. The vine walkway vibrated under Scorch's boots as Fixer emerged from a mass of foliage and padded along the aerial pathway. Scorch thought it was a lot of vibration for an 85-kilo man to generate until he saw Anaka ambling behind him. Skirata's Wookiee buddy usually fixed his transport and safe houses for him, and Scorch wondered how he was coping without her. Anaka says the Seps have been moving AAA parts. They're reinforcing the battery position west of here. Anaka rumbled in her throat and gestured with a long, hairy arm. Good idea, we'll go recce that battery first, Sev said. Let's see what the general has to say, though. Is she wearing her earpiece? She is, said a voice on the channel, but Atain didn't sound annoyed. If anything, she sounded as if she'd had a disagreement with command. I listened to the experts, which in this case is the Wookiees and you. Flattered ma'am, Sev said. But do I get a droid to play with later? I like to see how they come apart. Do you think they're sentient, Sev? Droids, I mean? It was a weird question to ask when they were getting ready to destroy yet more enemy personnel, a bit too philosophical for the mood of the moment. Sev was still hyped up despite few hours sleep. It was killing Geonosians, not droids, that had become a focus for him. Scorch knew he was itching to get at some more. He kept his head tilted up as if waiting for the bugs to come back, and from the shared HUD icon, Scorch could SEC he still kept a tally of Geonosian kills. His sensors were set to detect their specific flight pattern. Yeah, Sev said casually, which didn't match what Scorch could see happening in his HUD. Tinnies think, act, and they don't want to be destroyed and they're smarter than a lot of wets we meet. Just asking because of the way wets don't think of you as being real beings. Scorch made a winding gesture to the side of his helmet. Humor her, Sev. But Sev carried on. I don't kill them because I think they're inferior to me, ma'am, he said. I kill them because they're trying to kill us. We'd all be best buddies, Fixer said. It's just our wicked masters who set us against each other. Otherwise, we'd be having an ale together. Atain went quiet. Scorch wondered if she was feeling the pressure, too. He had an understanding with her now. She didn't tell him to get a grip or buck his ideas up when he lost control. She just made him feel better not that he was any more comfortable about the Jedi mind trick but she'd asked his permission first and let him know he wasn't crazy. It was the situation he was forced into that was insane and wrong. Jedi or not, she had to be feeling it as well. You okay, General? He asked. There was a crackle in the circuit as if she'd switched off her audio for a moment. I'm worried about Coruscant, she said. I have friends and... family there. Well, at least she was honest enough to admit she had a bit of a thing going with Darman, in not so many words. Scorch found he could shut the doors on feelings like that. Getting that close to anyone caused pain, Vav had told them so, when they were wide-eyed kids drinking in his wisdom and he was the most important figure in their limited world. Letting anyone get under your skin, trusting anyone who said they loved you, was a recipe for being hurt and betrayed so they had to protect themselves by keeping the world at arm's length. It was good advice for the life they led. Darman will be fine. Scorch took the risk of acknowledging her open secret. He's a survivor, like all the Omegas. Shah, they couldn't even kill Phi permanently, and he was dead. Yeah, nobody could shut Phi's mouth for good.
Sev said. It's a force of nature in its own right. That was another cover story nobody bought but that everyone accepted. Attain swallowed loudly. Boy, was she in a weird mood today. I have a child, she said. Scorch really didn't have a comeback for that. It even shut Sev up. Nobody said a word except Anaka, but it was very soft, and they didn't understand every word of Shiriwook. That's criffing awkward for you, ma'am, Boss said at last. They knew the Jedi rules, although they also knew there was now some weird Jedi sect that had shown up to fight alongside the Temple Boys, and they were okay about having families. We didn't even hear you tell us that. We know nothing. Thank you, boss, Attain said. Now let's see what our Sep friends are up to. Scorch had no idea where Attain was until she swung onto an almost horizontal branch above them that was thicker than she was tall. She dropped down and hardly made the vine walkway shiver. If only we'd known Grievous was on his way to Coruscant from here, she said. Not much we could have done about it, except warn Zay. Scorch was trying not to dwell on the idea that Darman was the father of Attain's kid. It was another thing Delta knew that they would never discuss outside the squad, if they discussed it at all. And the new fleet caught them in the end. That wasn't much comfort if your child was on Coruscant. Scorch switched off the distracting thoughts and concentrated on what he could control and understand best. Let's go, Boss said. Scorch topped up his impromptu camouflage by smearing handfuls of gritty moss across the bright yellow and white flashes on his armor, and decided that there really were times when stealth did matter. Those camo coatings that the 41st Elite wore had their place. Inaka let out a very low rumble, right on the threshold of Scorch's hearing. It showed up on his HUD sensors as a jagged and short-lived trace on the scope. A patrol was approaching. He lay flat, looking down on the forest floor below. Sev and Fixer followed suit. A familiar sound grew louder, the chunk-chunk-chunk of battle droids. Their gait was slower and less regular than usual. They were negotiating uneven ground branches, vegetation. Crash. And pits. Wookiees were good at digging deep, deep pits. Scorch heard loud metallic crashing and the creaking of green wood. The droids clattered to reform, leaving two behind to retrieve their fallen very fallen comrade. Mind your step, Clanker, Sev said. They weren't making fast progress. Delta, Attain, and Anaka moved along the network of vine paths above the patrol, unseen and unheard through the dense foliage and chattering wildlife. Eventually, they ran out of path, and the droids clanked off to the right deeper into the trees. Scorch swung his rappel line firing it would produce a sound clearly not of the forest and hooked the next tree, swinging across to the nearest branch like the locals. Sev and Fixer followed him. Boss and the others were somewhere behind now, out of sight in the sun dappled branches. Anaka growled. She says that if you were a meter taller and covered in hair, Scorch, she might think you were attractive. Boss said. You swing like a Wookiee. Sev snorted. That's the best offer he's had all year. Any idea when the council plans to take a crack at Kashyyyk, General? Fixer asked. As soon as Master Voss finishes up at Ba's pity, Attain said which could be any time now. I'm so going to enjoy serving alongside him. If I run into him, I promise I'll give him a quick lesson in courtesy. Good for you, ma'am, it's Dash. Scorch stopped dead. His HUD sensor picked it up first, an abrupt change in density and a shift from organic to metallic compounds, but then he saw it. It was like a warehouse that had been airlifted and dumped in the heart of the forest. My, the Seps have been busy bad boys. They built structures that soared into the tree canopy, soaring charcoal-gray metal insults to the landscape. 
Scorch had to check his sensors again. Turbo laser battery, said boss. Decisions, decisions. Take it now, or come back with a few hairy reinforcements. Come back later, after I've rigged some of my special recipe ordnance, Scorch said. And I'll take it offline in a loud, enjoyable way. You get all the fun. Sev studied the structure as if he was going to bite a chunk out of it to test it. Can I pick off the Trandos as they run away screaming? Knock yourself out, said Boss. It'll give you a treat to look forward to. They lingered for another quarter hour, carrying out passive scans of the tower to get a better idea of the layout, and then made their way back to the aerial walkway. Scorch was already calculating blast radii and optimum placement in his head when Anaka stopped dead and waved them down. The vine path was still shivering as if there was traffic coming the other way. Droids couldn't climb trees. But Trandishans could. There were two of them walking gingerly down the vine path, looking as if they had just discovered the route and were scoping it out. Mine, Sev said. All mine. He stepped off the path into the branches, slung his rifle, and hauled himself farther up into the tree canopy. Scorch and the others melted into the side branches. Nobody needed to speak. Scorch wondered if he should explain the procedure to Atain, but from the way she moved, she'd done this kind of ambush before. He realized now exactly how dirty things had become on Kalura when she was organizing the resistance there with Zay, back in the days before they ended up doing more desk work than either of them wanted. It seemed so long ago. It wasn't even three years. But when you were coming up thirteen and twenty-six years old at the same time, that was a big chunk of your life. I hope you find that cure for us, Cal. They waited. The Trandishans edged forward not as confident up in the trees now since they'd encountered Wookiee hand-to-hand limb-from-limb fighting. Scorch would never get that image out of his mind however much he wanted to. They were right under Sev now. He dropped like a silent stone onto one of them, forcing an oof from the Trando's lungs and slapping a gauntlet over the Burve's mouth before he could draw a breath to yell. A team knocked the other Trando flat without laying a finger on him. Seb's vibra-blade silenced the first Trando. Fixer pounced on his comrade, seized his head and snapped his neck with a sharp twist. Inaka picked up both bodies by the belts like groceries, strode along until she found the two-meter gullet-like bloom of a carnivorous plant within throwing distance, and lobbed them in. The bloom shuddered with the impact. The last thing Scorch saw was four legs vanishing slowly, boots in the air as if sinking into quicksand. Pays to keep the houseplants fed. Scorch watched Atain's reaction, reminding himself that he should have been surprised that Jedi could kill and maim so easily. Potassium encourages flowering. So they say. Atain studied the carnivorous plant before moving on, as if she was considering its merits for a flower arrangement. Do you ever look at the enemy and wonder just what the difference is between us? Hini HQ, Galactic City, Day 4 of the Battle of Coruscant, 1084 Days ADG. The Ark Trooper stood on top of the pile of rubble looking down at Darman. Are we keeping you awake, shiny boy? He had twin blasters, just like Ordo's, but he was a lieutenant, lieutenant. Only after I've slotted them. But you don't hate Trandishans. We don't even know them. No, said Scorch. But I'm human, and the only way you psych yourself up to killing something that's similar to yourself is to be scared of it, or to pretend it's not a person like you are. But I hate Geonosians, Sev said sourly. And we do know plenty about them. Only 3,420 to kill, and we'll be even. Then I'll start on the rest. Sev overtook Scorch, scraping plates as he edged around him, 
a gray worm-like creature longer than Scorch's arm extended itself from the bark of a tree as Sev passed and tried to grab his wrist. Sev yanked it out of its lair in an indignant fist. He held its head up to his visor in a one-handed strangling grip. Don't even think about it. He growled and dropped it over the side into the leaves below. Inaka, who'd been listening patiently to the debate, yelled softly. Atain might not have hated Trandishans, she said, but they looked very different to a Wookiee. No slaver or slave owner could ever be likable, she said even if they tried to be nice, which Trandos didn't. That was why they got their arms ripped out of their sockets. All slave owners dear of their fate. Scorch waited for Atain to continue the debate. But she just glanced at her calm link, tapped it impatiently, and put it back in her pocket. Yeah, Wookiees were very eloquent, if you knew how to listen. Avon. Look sharp. The tinnies are going to be back again. He jumped down from the vantage point and strode among the commandos who were the last line of defense for the Aichini building Omega and Yayak squads. Got to keep the voice of freedom and democracy on the air. Darman had now been awake for the better part of 48 hours, snatching a few minutes' sleep between waves of battle droid attacks. He was hungry, not the usual peckishinks of a clone fueling a fast metabolism but a gnawing sick hunger that demanded satisfaction. Yeah. His head buzzed with fatigue. It took conscious effort to move his muscles. As he reloaded his dice with another clip, his arms felt like they belonged to someone else, directed by strings he was holding. We blew up one on Gaftiker. Or it blew us up. One or the other. What? Holland's station. Where is that, I.K.? You're rambling, lad. Take a stim. Got to stay alert. Here, Dar. Otten ran at a crouch toward him with something in a large flimside bag. Been on a replenishment run. He opened the wrapping and revealed a treasure trove of round, sugar-crusted cakes, wafers filled with something brown and gooey and containers of an unnaturally bright red liquid. Guess what? From the news grunts in the h &E building, Darman had to take his helmet off to eat. He popped the seal. At that moment, he didn't care if some tinny blew his head off. He had to eat and drink. Aden reached into his belt pouches and rummaged, pulling out a stim sharp. Darman didn't even have the energy to flinch as Otten jabbed it into his neck. Every fiber of his body was dedicated to getting one of those cakes in his mouth, and when he finally bit down it was exquisite. He grabbed a container of the red stuff to wash the cake down. It was intensely sweet calorie-laden, nutritional junk, but pure instant energy. Bliss. He felt it flood his muscles with renewed life. I'm never going to shoot an h and &E hover cam on a job again, he said hoarsely. This is really nice of them. C.O.R.R.'s helmet popped up out of nowhere. He grabbed a cake. Well, seeing as we're getting our Sheb shot off so they can keep broadcasting, sharing their scrawn is the least they can do for us. Niner was curled in a ball on a slab of permacrete, grabbing some sleep. It really was possible to sleep anywhere if you were exhausted enough. COV Yayax's sergeant redistributed ammo plasma rounds and grenades among the eight men. Where's their food supply then? CORR rolled over on his back and pointed up at the tower. There was a big hole in it, about three quarters of the way up its height. The other side of that. They're crawling along the girder to transfer the supplies out of the office canteen, Aden said. I have to admire folks who care about their stomachs just as much as we do. They've got this weird siege mindset going. I swear they're enjoying it. Well, if they like it that much, they can grab a rifle and come down here and enjoy it with us. COV took a swig from the bottle of red whatever it was. 
Still, we need M talking to the citizens now, so... Have they got that mobile transmitter ready to roll yet? Avon didn't help himself to the food. Sooner we get that out of the building and move it somewhere secure, the better. He was already thinking in terms of encouraging resistance and setting up a guerrilla network if the worst happened. Darman wondered how many Coruscanti would fight to overthrow a separatist occupation. COV, take one of your boys. Haul it down with service droids if the turbolift is shot on those floors. COV jogged away. Yayaks all wore gray and brown dazzle pattern camo armor, and they merged remarkably well with the debris of permacrete and transparent steel. Avon looked up suddenly. Here come the tinnies, he said. Okay, my lads, time to make shrapnel. Boyed up on a wave of sugar, Darman now felt fine. Omega and two Yayaks men, Dev and Jind, took up positions. Tinnies were predictable. They just kept coming in dumb waves, so it was largely a matter of who ran out of bodies first. One thing was for sure, though there might have been a lot of them, a torrent, but there weren't quadrillions or anything close. Scarato was right. If the Seps really had those numbers, they'd have poured them all into triple zero by now, and the war would have been over. But they hadn't, and it wasn't. It only took one tinny to ruin your entire day, though. Darman wasn't going to celebrate yet. He edged over the makeshift parapet of Permacrete and sighted up. A quick hello from an anti-armor grenade would bring down the front rank, and the second as well if you pitched it right, and then their own debris would slow them down enough to let you hose them with everything else you had. The tidy, synchronized ranks marched toward them down an avenue that the sapper droids had swept clear of chunks of ships and buildings. The seps definitely wanted the heart of the Republic's broadcasting capacity in one piece. They could have reduced it to rubble by now. Darman noted that the line of droids was wider this time, requiring more fire along its length to drop them. That was how they overran positions. They encircled them by sheer force of numbers. Fire! Avon barked. Once Darman squeezed the trigger, things somehow fell into a natural rhythm. It was almost as if he didn't have to think like singing a song and hearing his own voice before even thinking what note came next. Droids dropped metal fragments fizzed and hissed as their shrapnel rained down, and flying debris took out their comrades as surely as a GR issue grenade, but the others still advanced. Niner and Otten took a section of the line each, bringing down a dozen tinnies, and in the rank behind, six droids literally shattered like crystal without a direct hit smashed by the overpressure alone. Well done, pretty eye, Auden said. Nobbled at the factory. The super battle droids behind them weren't from the same sabotage batch of Durasteel, though. They started running, weapon arms held out straight in front of them, and even though CORR and Jin were laying into them with an e-web repeater, the SBDs kept coming. Now they were meters away. They were so close that Darman's rounds threw shrapnel back at his visor. The next thing he knew, one of the things was nearly on top of him. Fine, that was the way to kill them. It was pure reflex. Darman ran into its arms, inside the range of its weapon, and brought his vibra blade up into its left armpit where the material was flexible and thinner, slicing through the servos. Its arm fell limp. All it had now, as long as he clung to it, was its weight, and Katarn armor was crush-resistant even under that bulk. The SPD flailed wildly, unable to target its blaster arm or dislodge him. He hung on for grim death while he pulled a micro-sized thermal debt from his belt and crammed it into the gaping hole in the SPD's casing. Then he let it throw him clear in its wild attempt to shake him off. He landed meters away as the blast directed down inside its casing blew out its chest plate. Events were, as always, in a distorted time frame. Darman, flat on the ground and trying to get up, saw a ragged disk of metal just miss the e-web. 
C.O.R.R. flung himself sideways. Dev leapt on the SBD coming up behind it while Avon rammed both muzzles of his twin blasters up under its arm joints, and fired. SBDs were vulnerable if you engaged them very, very close. Nothing came over that rubble ridge for a few more seconds. Darman got back on his feet. All he could hear was his own gasping breath and his heart pounding. He didn't hear the noise of drives until after Avon yelled, Air support incoming! And the rapid clunk 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 of droid feet at a run began again. Darman ducked as the shadow of two LAT-slash-I gunships blotted out the sun. Staccato plumes of pulverized ferrocrete fountained into the air high above the parapet line as the lart eyes opened fire on the droid ranks. Pull back! Avon grabbed Darman's shoulder and half-dragged him until he got his balance back and ran for the cover of h and &E's colonnaded entrance. Get down! The oddest things got your attention in combat. Darman found himself looking up at a sky that was full of dark clouds not natural ones, but the smoke and windborne debris of the aerial battle that still raged overhead, joined by the rising smoke from a burning, bombed city. He wondered how he would have reacted if the dots in the sky suddenly enlarged and resolved into Mandalorian troops with jetpacks. Weird. Stims, fatigue, and too many food additives. You're a psycho, Dar. Auden said, patting his shoulder. Classy. Niner, C.O.R.R., Jind, and Dev flopped down next to them in a clatter of armor plates. Just heard on the comm. Niner said. Another thousand ships have joined the fleet. Whoopee, Auden said. Can they pop down here and give us a hand? One lardy landed in front of their position nose forward and a couple of troopers jumped down from the open hatch. The droids had withdrawn again. Darman twisted to look over his shoulder, and saw C.O.V., a civilian, and the remaining member of Yayak's squad overhauling three crates on a repulsive trolley from the side door of the building. It was the equipment they needed to broadcast on HNE bandwidth from anywhere on the planet. Whatever happened to the network's headquarters, Coruscant and the Republic would not be silenced now. Darman watched the equipment being loaded into the Lardi, followed by a dozen h &E staff humans and two Twi'leks and then the gunship lifted clear and vanished. Avon lowered his head as if receiving a message in his helmet comm link. Then he ambled back over to the exhausted pile of commandos. To our watches, okay? Move into the foyer and get some sleep. I'll take the first watch. It was late afternoon again, judging by the sun. Darman was losing count of the days. Sir, he said, do you know if comms to Kashyyyk are operational yet? I've heard it's patchy. Why waiting for a call from a Wookiee? Darman shrugged. Something like that. They've bypassed SEP blocking, but the system must have overloaded by now. The fleet's grown by thousands of ships almost overnight. Knowing those useless barves in procurement, they probably didn't add enough extra nodes to the network. Another thing they forgot to tell us about. Avon squatted down a few meters from them in silence, cleaning his blasters in the lull. It was now or maybe never. Darman risked opening his comm link. Atain was probably worrying her guts out. She didn't answer the comm, of course. He tried again, but there was no telling what she was doing, and he decided to send via the uplink while he still could. The message would at least sit there and wait for her to reconnect. The comm's routers could go down at any time, and he might not know. I'm staying alive. I refuse to die now. He scribbled with his stylus. He hated tapping out long messages. M Pi Solus Tome, M Michai Solus DRTOME, M Michai Mi Dinuyin, M Michai BGRI Verde. Translate and respond. RC 1136. 
Darman was still coming down off the adrenal high of fighting, but those words gave him a delicious feeling of contentment that made him smile. Atain knew enough Mandoe to understand what it meant. All she had to do was resend the words to him. A pledge was a pledge, a deal was a deal, a vow was a vow, you didn't have to be in the same room to accept a marriage contract. Once she replied it was legal for Mandalore. And he didn't care about Coruscan law now. I can hear you smiling, Aden said. What's so funny? Not funny, said Darman. The slight click of teeth and the faintest of breaths was enough for Aten to gauge his brother's reaction behind the helmet. Just my half of the marriage contract, while I still can. No point hanging about now. Don't be so morbid. Niner snapped. We'll all be fine. I meant losing comms. Ah. C.O.R.R. murmured. Darman wasn't sure if he was teasing to take the edge off Niner's seriousness. The guy could get very tense. You next, at I.K. Me, I'm keeping my options open out of generosity to all the lovely females who haven't had a chance to meet me yet. It's only fair. Aden made a huffing noise. Darman heard the click of his teeth and a slight rustle as he switched to another calm circuit. He was coming Lasima privately, Darman was sure of it. He watched Aten's shoulders tense and then relax, and his head nodded a little, as if he was talking. After a few moments, he leaned back and punched one fist into his palm in mute triumph. C.O.R.R. nudged him. She said yes then. There's no privacy in this Shabla squad. But Aden sounded happy. And she said Cad's babbling Dida all the time. Just thought you needed to know that. Darman did. In the debris strewn, deserted foyer of the H &E building, with the prospect of enemy droids swarming back at any time, he now felt he could handle anything again. He dozed despite the stims, leaning against Aven. It was the faint blipping noise of a message arriving in his HUD that woke him rather than the barrage going on outside. It wasn't attained, though. It was Ordo. So you're still alive, Omega. Report in when you can. That was how Mandalorians greeted each other Sukuigar. You're still alive but it was also quite funny for Ordo, who wasn't exactly a comedian. Skirata was obviously fretting. One day, Darman would have fine stories to tell Cat about the days when he wrestled with battle droids. He shut his eyes and resumed a brief and precious sleep. Safe House, Lower Levels, Coruscant, Day 5, 1085 Days ABG In the bowels of Galactic City, the desperate battle was a distant thunderstorm that raged day and night. Skirata thought it was probably the first time in millennia that it was safer to walk the streets of Triple Zero's sleazy underbelly than it was to venture out in the respectable sky lanes and walkways up above. He stared at the door to Yuthin's room and rehearsed how he was going to tell her that she was now a prisoner again. He didn't want to sound triumphant and depress the woman. He needed her cooperation, although he didn't think she was the suicidal kind. I didn't think Kosai would hang herself, either. Okay. Vav put his finger behind the blind and eased it away from the grimy window to check the walkway outside. It was surprisingly busy. Plenty of people from the upper levels had fled down here. The pickpockets were having a field day. Let's take stock. We're in the middle of a separatist invasion. We're holding a death-dealing sept scientist who doesn't realize she's been kidnapped. Your stroppy long-lost daughter, a tax inspector whose life we've managed to trash, and Django Fett's lunatic homicidal sister. Have you warned Rav that this happy crew is heading her way, provided we don't all die horribly in the current unpleasantness? Skirata felt his heart skipping beats, making him want to thump his own chest to stop it. Rav Brawler was twice the man that most men were, 
which was quite something for a good-looking woman. She'd take it all in stride. I think we need to start transferring people to A.E. Han. Cal, we have a total of 21 personnel, for want of a better word. Plus the baby. Atain, Kamarke, Jane, and Pudi are off-world, and we'll have to arrange another RV point for them they can't come back here now. A.E. Han has 16 berths, plus the cargo space which would take another 15 bunks if we hadn't filled half of that with emergency supplies and Muriel's Shabla toy. Skirata had a trillion credits. They could leave the G.I. car behind and Muriel could buy another dozen of the things when they got out of here. Bardai K's got the aggressor laid up, and that can accommodate 8 plus a pilot. He said, It's got a secure hold that's a bounty vessel. I say we get Ru, Fet's sister and Yuthan out in that first, with Sol, Spar, and Mariel. Then we follow an A.E. Han. Well, when a few thousand warships have finished pounding ten shades of Asik out of each other, and the planetary shields are lifted. Wallen, it was always going to be a case of winging it. Yes, I know. If you want out, dash. Shab, no, Cal. I've come this far. Look, Skarada said. That's the easy bit. The hard bit is getting Omega out now. And attain. The nulls can come and go because Zay and his cronies are used to that, but the others are pretty visible. Have you spoken to Delta? No. They'll get to here, and then they can make their own choice. What about your other squads? I know Omega's your pride and joy, but when are you going to put the word out that there's a haven for the others, too? When we're sure Kirimorad is secure and everyone's settled. Okay. Wallen, I know I've bitten off more than I can chew. But I had to try. And I think we're as close to pulling it off as ever. Vav sighed. Okay. He slapped his thigh plate. Murd? Murd I.K., come on. Let's go round up the stray nerfs. At least everyone was on the lower levels, except Cad, Lasema, and Bessany. The SEPs were after the strategic targets, government buildings, the spaceports, military installations, and infrastructure. It didn't make it any easier if yours was the district that lost its power supply and the misery from above was slowly trickling down in the form of refugees, but at least it was possible to move around the streets and skylanes down here without getting killed by stray ordnance. Skirata decided to collect the ladies and his grandson sooner rather than later. Aihan wasn't so bad as temporary accommodation, and it was in as safe a location as any on Karuskan now. He threaded his way across the city along the lowest skylane he could navigate in the speeder, then climbed to the upper levels almost vertically when he reached Obrim's neighborhood rampart town. It was a modest, quiet part of Galactic City. Obrim had made dangerous enemies, as cops did and he preferred to keep a low profile in a sprawling multilevel apartment that looked unremarkable from the outside. Only the elaborate security precautions revealed how difficult his job could get. It was a ghost town. There was nowhere to run on a crowded planet, so anyone with a grain of sense had battened down the hatches and waited. Telti Obram took a full five minutes to open the doors. Jailer's still stuck at HQ, she said. Haven't seen him for two days, but that's normal for Jailer. Is everyone okay? Fine, Skarada said. It's weird how I can move around some parts of the city and not others. Look, I know I'm putting Jailer at risk by calling, but I need to move the ladies. He took the nine million creds out of his belt. It seemed such a small stack of chips for a huge sum. The figures he dealt with these days had just numbed him now. I want you to do something for me, Telti. Take this. You and Jailer deduct what you need to stay safe, 
and if there's anything left, give it to that crazy Senator Skeena to fund his care home for clone troopers. Teldi stared at the chips, mouth slightly open. Skirata now realized it was probably very hard for a cop to take a sum like that without leaving himself open to some unhealthy attention, but times were changing, and none of them knew what the next day would bring. Telti was still staring at the fortune, muttering, Oh. Oh, Cal. When Bessany came out into the lobby and put her arms around him, he felt dwarfed. She was as tall as Ordo. Don't scare me like that again, Calbear, she said. Time to run, Ad I.K. You're not going to try to beat the blockade, are you? No. This is a standby, and we'll wait for the battle to die down. I'll get Lasima. She winked at him, but the fear was etched on her face now. She was still putting on a defiant show, though, still Mandicarla. Excellent use for the sapphires. Cad was silent, very alert, not at all like a baby today. He didn't fret or grizzle. He just sat on Bessany's lap, both hands flat on the transparent steel side screen, staring at the world streaking by as Skirata took the fastest route down through the layers of the city to reach the reservoir entrance. The speeder eased through the service tunnel, with just enough clearance to avoid scraping the bodywork. Oh, this is wonderful. Lasima seemed genuinely impressed by A.E. Han. She patted the bunk in her tiny cabin. I've never been in a ship like this. What do you think of this, then, Kadaike? Ma. He tottered across the deck and tried to clamber onto the lower bunk. It was a valiant attempt, and he failed but he kept trying in grim silence until Lasima gave him a leg up. Mama? Mama? Have you come to her? Bessany asked. I'm going to recall her now. Skirata knew he should have spent more time worrying about Atane. She might have to go straight to Mandalore if she can get transport. But I'm not happy about that. I'll see where that Valen woman is. Maybe ask her to retrieve Etik. Or Jane can do it. Bessany took his hand and squeezed it. Then she gestured to the blaster on her belt. It hadn't been so long ago that she didn't even want to handle one. We'll maintain proper security, Cal. We'll be fine here. I'll keep the hatch closed. You won't be on your own long. The rest of the Alliant will be along soon. The whole clan. She gave him a dazzling smile that radiated trust. It's all coming together, Cal. You're going to pull this off. You're a hero, you know that? No, he wasn't, even if Munin and Bessany and a handful of other people had told him that over the years. He was what most thought he was, a chancer, a killer, a marginal man, a thug but he knew he was also a man who sometimes did the right thing for the most deserving people. He could live with himself, most days. Skirata pondered loose ends as he headed back to the safe house to clear out what few things remained. He knew where everyone was, he knew, more or less, how they were getting to Mandiaim. And yes, they were a lie they were a clan, however odd a mix of personalities and backgrounds they were. He come Helamar without fear of being picked up by the Chancellor's minions now, marveling at this incongruous protection afforded by being at war. Mejake? Dr. Stuff. About Fett's sister Ivy been thinking about where we ought to dash. Helamar cut him off. Kel, have you been monitoring the GR or SOB channels? Shab, could nobody find time to calm him? Not for the last hour or so. Palpatine's been kidnapped by the Seps and taken off the planet. Big flap on. Zayis' language is very un-Jedi-like at the moment. All Skirata could think then was that it was weird to abduct the Chancellor, and that it might mean a chance of getting through the planetary shield. 
If anything told him he didn't see the Republic's welfare as his own, it was that. Does that change our plans? He asked. Other than that it might force a surrender or cease fire? They're recalling various Jedi may be time to get Atain out. Opportunities and threats, Midge. One and the same. Skirata didn't have to worry about getting arrested now. He could call Anaka. It was great that she was a Wookiee patriot, but it was also handy that she was keeping an eye on Atain. He owed the furball. He made sure she was set up for life when the current unpleasantness was over. Chapter 16 There are two reasons why we have to wear armor. One is so that we don't get killed too easily. The other is so that we all look Mandalorian, however different we may be from our brothers and sisters. Mandalorian Mother, explaining one of the Resolner the six obligations of Mandalorian identity to her daughter. Emergency Reservoir, Galactic City, Day 5 of the Battle of Coruscant, 1085 Days ABG. Skarada waited, his personal comm link in one hand and his helmet comm channel set to the GR command network. On the underground key side, Juzik was keeping Fi busy by teaching him to use a lightsaber. It was, Juzik said an easier weapon to handle until it was always until, never if Fi got back full motor control. No matter who was swinging the Shabba thing, Skirata still didn't like that humming sound. It had a soulless, relentless quality, almost like a droid casting about for victims with a sensor scan, implacable, not caring who it killed or why. How's it looking, Merai K? Skirata asked. What transponder are you using? Mario was in the aggressor, waiting on a deserted public landing platform in the mid-levels, with a camo net over the airframe. From the air, the fighter looked like another casualty of the battle, but it wasn't the kind of vessel the Republic used, so it was vital that it wasn't taken for a moving SEP target. Fake transponder signal or not, there was always the chance that a smart clone would eyeball the Shabba thing, trust his judgment over the computers, and open fire. Small sports yacht, he said. Rich Civi making a run for it. We might have a window soon they've recalled Kenobi, for a start. They'll need to bring the shields down to get his ego and red carpet in. Fine by me. I'm ready to jettison the net and bang out the moment I see a gap. Everyone okay? Medicated where necessary, in separate cells and Yuthan hasn't spotted yet that three of us are clones. I love my Bicey. It lets me keep some mystery in a relationship. I think a few Mandos on board can keep her quiet if she works it out before she gets to Mandalore. Now, how about the data duplicates? Contingency RV points? All sorted, Calbear. Stop worrying. I can't. It's okay, Papa. It's all on schedule. Muriel rarely used the word Papa. It was always bear. Rav's waiting with her clan at Kiramorat, so nothing's going to go wrong at that end either. We're ready to run. Koyasii, Meraike, Skarata said quietly. Stay safe, stay alive, hang in there. Next time we see you, it'll be on Mandiame. Juzik and Fai could obviously hear him. The VZZZMMM of the lightsaber had stopped. Yuthan's going to go nuts when she finds out who's nabbed her, Fi said. I wonder if she'll recognize me and Omega? Got a lot more work to do before we worry about that, at IK. Skarada really hated waiting. He was getting too old for this game, at least for the slow grind of it, all the snatched sleep and the missed meals. He paced he wandered and he went down below in the ship a dozen times. Bessany rocked Cad, one finger held to her lips. Joka sat looking as if her life was over, which could so easily have been the case by now. Skarada paused to pat her head. 
You won't want to be on Karuskin when this war ends anyway, he said. I'm sorry. I really am. It's been an education. Jilka had the voice of a woman who didn't suffer fools gladly. She didn't thank him for his generosity, or tell him what a kind and generous bear he was. Seems I didn't know Bessany Criffing went in at all. Bessany didn't react. Skirata made a mental note to keep an eye on that tension, but they hadn't slugged each other so far. What Mandalorians took for granted in the ups and downs of a day's work, a civilized office worker in the galactic capital even one with a risky jotsaw as a trauma. Calbert, said Muriel's voice. Shields are coming down. Grievous has withdrawn I think the battle's turned. I have to go. Coassii. Coassii. I love you, son. Skirata went up top and jumped from A.E. Han's casing onto the quayside. He couldn't see the sky from down here, but the urge to go up and watch the aggressor leave was more than his body could resist. It wasn't even near here. He'd never see the ship anyway. But he did it blindly, and then stood facing the wall, helmet resting against the permacrete, counting the long minutes out a second at a time. Someone put their hand on his back and stood there with him. He didn't turn around. Mandalorians had dispensed with their gods long ago. Masters, whether divinities or Mandalores, were only tolerated as long as they pulled their weight. It left Skirata with no higher authority to bargain with for Muriel's safety. Six minutes, seven. Ten. Calbir, we're clear of Karuskin now. Mayor I.K.A. You should see the traffic around the place. The debris's more of a danger in orbit than the live ships. Don't hang about, son. Go. We're gone. The comlink closed. Mariel had jumped to hyperspace. Skirata straightened up and put his hands to his helmet, sweat prickling on his upper lip. When he turned around... It wasn't Fi or Juzik behind him, but Vav. You worry too much, he said. Grievous has banged out. Palpatine's back in one piece. I know. Where's Mert? In my speeder. Well, someone's speeder. It was abandoned up top, so I liberated it for a while. I'm going to play Nerf Herder again until we pull out. There's still pockets of fighting going on, and HNE's saying there's a fair few homegrown anti-republic elements still causing trouble, so it's not safe on the ground yet even if the fleet engagement's done and dusted. Skirata switched back to the GR comm circuit, listening for Kashyyyk traffic. They weren't discussing the Wookiee resistance, but Masters Voss and Yoda appeared to be ready to start the big assault inside 48 hours. Atain had to be out before that kicked off. Anaka had her orders. Skirata come to Omega. He'd kept an eye on the squad's status via the GR links, but now he needed to talk to them personally. Aten answered first. What's it like up there, at IK? Skirata asked. We're still mopping up, Sarge. Who's tasking you at the moment? Say? Yeah, direct or via Lieutenant Avon. Keep me posted on every move, okay? I can get into the GR system, but I want to be doubly sure you are where it says you are over the next couple of days. We're going very soon, son, and you better be ready. I'm ready, Aden said. We all are. Is Vav there? Yeah. It was still thin ice, even if hostilities between the two men had been shelved for the duration. Want to talk to him? No, just tell him that the war's over between us. It really is. Back home, we start anew. C.I.N. Vedin. Vav heard anyway. Skirata put the link back in his belt. I only ever did it to make sure they survived, whatever happened. Vav said. 
I'm not a sadistic man. Yeah. Skirata didn't want to restart that fight. But he knew he'd take his knife to Vav, just like old times, if he so much as raised his hand to those lads again, and yet somehow that coexisted with the respect and... Yes, affection. Vav was family, too. I've got to catch up with the rest of my boys. Go keep an eye on the ladies. I'll even trust you with my grandson now. Oh, I'll build a nest then, said Vav, and stepped off the quay onto the hull. Skirata watched Juzik teaching Fi the art of being an un-Jedi for a few minutes, and then went to collect his speeder, the one that had been his temporary pride and joy when he stole it from a dead Jabimi dissident. He was going to miss that crate. Cor Plaza, late afternoon, two days after the flight of Grievous from Coruscant, 1087 days ABG. He's back, Ward IK. Jane's voice popped in Ordo's earpiece as he patrolled the devastated retail district with a CSF unit, flushing out looters. Grievous? He misses you to pal, obviously. I got a tip off. You're not there, then. No, we're just tidying up a few loose ends on the rim. Time we told Zay? Yeah. Jane sounded tired. There's still something not right about this, but I'm past caring, and so is Kamaike. Where's Grievous' massive droid army now, eh? Quadrillions, my shebs. Maybe they all booked the same week's vacation and couldn't make Coruscant. Pull out, then, Niviodi. You're now officially missing in action, and Kamarke, too. Go straight back to Mandalore. We were supposed to RV on triple zero. Yes, but Brawler needs a hand wrangling the menagerie that Kalbir dropped in her lap. I'll square it with him. Jang laughed. I'm going have to dump my arc armor. Shame. I looked great in that. Still, my Besker gam matches my lovely special hide gloves. Koyasiai, Niviodi. You too, Ordake. Ordo checked his chrono. He'd give this a little longer, and then swing by Arca Barracks to hand Zay the location to find Grievous. He leaned out of the patrol ship's bay as it banked over the heart of the sector marveling at the opportunism of all species, that they could venture out to steal when fighting was still going on in places. A gang of Rodians and humans was busy removing the contents of a fashion store. The police pilot wheeled around to bring the ship level with the walkway, and the marksman sighted up. The CSF sergeant didn't even get the chance to warn them off. The looters scattered at the sound of the drives vanishing into bombed buildings and down stairwells. I'm amazed they even try, said the sergeant. There's so many of your boys around now. Not enough to guard every store. Oh, I wouldn't say that. The sergeant leaned out even farther than Ordo. They're everywhere. I've never seen so many troopers. They all seem to show up in the last few days. Is there anyone still fighting out there in the rest of the galaxy? Plenty, said Ordo. The big push on Kashyyyk's just started. It's business as usual in the Grand Army. It wasn't, but the sergeant didn't need to know that. Ordo had checked the fleet deployments that morning, and staggering numbers of vessels were in play now, although not many showed up where he expected them to be. They were out there somewhere, though, an army and a navy of millions upon millions, making the core of the GAR, the three million Kamino clones, look insignificant. We suddenly got reinforcements. Ordo checked his chrono again. Hurrah for the Chancellor. The sergeant smiled ruefully. Yeah, we say it like that, too. The patrol ship dropped Ordo off near the barracks, and he made his way across the square surprised by the numbers of ordinary citizens who were now venturing out. 
The presence of so many clone troopers on the ground seemed to have given them confidence to leave their homes and come out of the public shelters. It didn't matter anymore. This would no longer be his world in a matter of days. He was going home. With my wife. With my father. With my brothers and their wives. Even if we never get to live a long life, we now have a real one. There were troopers guarding the barracks now they never had before and they even asked to see Ordo's ID. They clearly hadn't been up close to an ARC trooper before. He wanted to ask one of them to lift his helmet so he could look him in the eye and see if he was exactly like his Null and Commando brothers, but it was demeaning, and it was no longer his business. If he connected to these new clones in any way, he'd end up like Kalbir, feeling that each man was his personal responsibility to rescue. Inside Arca Barracks, his boots echoed in the empty corridors, so little had changed for the Republic commandos. Maybe the GR would start cross-training more men. Good shopping trip? Mays said. Shoot any looters? Ordo took off his helmet and clipped it to his belt. Mongrels bewilder me. If I were going to steal in a crisis, I'd take weapons and food. Not garments. Is Zay around? He's in his office. It's back to normal too many fronts to cover. Too few men. Jedi generals spread all over the place. Ironic, given our sudden expansion. The two arcs strode down to see Zay. Ordo tossed the data chip to the general. Intel on Grievous' whereabouts. Zay looked at Ordo with a completely blank expression. Ordo sometimes came close to liking the man. He almost felt sorry for him. Grievous, Ordo repeated. Jang and Kamarke tracked him to Utapa, he's still there now. There's the layout of the camp from the areas they could access remotely. Who are you going to send after him that windbag Kenobi? General Yoda's your best bet, if he wasn't occupied elsewhere. Zay's corrugated brow suggested that he found it significant that Jang and Ka Marke had struck pay dirt at this particular time. You don't approve of General Kenobi, then? Cody might think the sun shines out of his ear, General, but I think he's a glory seeker who wastes too many men. As he's fond of saying from a certain point of view, Zay clearly knew better than to debate with Ordo. He was also canny enough to resist asking how long the Nulls had known this information. He put his hand briefly to his chest as if stomach acid was playing him up. This may well be the beginning of the end, Captain. Thank you. Ordo half turned for the doors. I'm not banking on it. Captain. Say he put out his hand to beckon Ordo back. It wasn't an attempt to grab his arm. He seemed almost afraid as if he thought Ordo would swing at him, as if he didn't think his Jedi powers would ward off a blow. That wasn't the Zayi that Ordo had come to know. Captain, you don't like the Jedi Order, do you? Just tell me why. Ordo almost choked. The naivete of it genuinely stunned him. Mays stood like a statue nostrils flaring slightly as he tried to take deep breaths without opening his mouth. Maybe it struck him the same way, because as Spar and Sul had proven the Alpha Arcs weren't the unquestioning automata most of their commanders seemed to think. Because you can't see what you've degenerated into, Ordo said. That's what comes of having one leader dominate your organization for centuries. You need a big change in command structure. But maybe you don't see anything wrong in creating clones with no choice when you take Force-sensitive children and turn them into Jedi whether they like it or not. Ordo met Zay's eyes. He didn't want to stare the man down. He just wanted to search his soul. He needed to know what went on in a Jedi's mind because whatever it was, Juzik was no reliable guide to it. Juzik had his own moral compass. 
so did Atain. Maybe it was a generational thing, with the younger Jedi starting to ask how things had come to this sorry pass. All Ordo could see in Zay's face, though, was a man drained of hope, almost too embarrassed to pause and look at his own actions. I think the whole Republic needs a change of managed merit, Zay said at last. The war is wrong. The conduct of it is wrong. Our compliance with it is wrong. And Palpatine has outstayed his welcome. May still didn't move a muscle, but Ordo was hypersensitive to the slightest sound. The Alpha Arc held his breath for a moment. He wasn't happy with that, not at all. Don't forget your slave army. Ordo said then touch two fingers to his temple in a not-quite salute. That wasn't the smartest move, either. Ordo left with Maze close on his heels. In the corridor, he strode ten paces and then halted to spin around. Maze stopped dead behind him. Their eyes locked. I thought we'd reached an understanding. There was a time, Ordo said testing their comradeship, when you'd have tried to punch me out for not kissing Zay's force-using shebs. He offered Maze a strip of rook. So? Maze accepted the proffered snack. I just wanted to talk. I'm no fan of Palpatine either, but he was elected more or less, and the Jedi weren't. Who are they to judge who runs the Republic? My, Django's little gung-ho pep talks didn't work, did they? Django's orders were to serve the Republic. Not the Jedi. They're like us. Instruments of the state. Maze, I'm amazed his orders weren't to kill the Jedi, given what happened to him at Galadrin. Ordo felt genuine pity for Django, first his family, then his surrogate father, and then every last one of his comrades all were killed by worthless Shakar. That didn't excuse prostituting his genetic material for credits and an heir, though. But it's good to see that you alphas aren't all Jedi-worshipping planks. Maze raised an eyebrow. Orders, you crazy null boy. Try following them sometime. They're what separates an army as the expression of the electorate's will from an armed rabble out for its own ends. You've been reading hollow books. You sound like a civvy. I should smack you one for that. While you're out on the town with your lady friend, what do you think the likes of me and the white jobs do with our off-duty hours? You think we're put back in stasis, offline for the duration like good little droids? Me, I read. Some guys play Lemmy. Some watch the kind of holovids that just make you realize what you can't have. But I read. It was a sobering rebuke. Mays was right. It was too easy to slip into that civilian way of unthinking of never wondering how human beings just like them spent their rapidly passing lives. You know what your future is, don't you? Ordo said. Body bag, or a couple of rounds to the head. Best scenario clone instructor. Yeah, I know. Zay offered to relocate me, shall we say. He was very upset to find out about the Republic's approach to ARC retirement. Let me know if you want relocation, then. I can do a better job than Zay. I'll bet. Maze chewed thoughtfully. But it's nice of him to even offer when other Jedi just snap their fingers at you and call you clone. Tell me something, Ordo said. I was raised as a son, not a commodity. I'm fully aware that clones are exploited. Do you have a sense of injustice? Too right I do, Mays said quietly. He spat the fiber left from the rook root into a waste container with impressive force and accuracy, and walked away toward the mess, helmet under one arm, comma swinging. Kashyyyk, three days after the flight of Grievous from Coruscant, 1,088 days ABG. About time, Fixer said cramming ammo clips into his belt. I was getting fed up fighting this war on my own. 
Scorch nudged him in the back, indicating Boss and Sev. What were we doing then, filing our nails? I meant Voss. General Voss had arrived from Ba's pity with the first wave of troopers the night before. General Yoda was inbound with the 41st Elite and the Wookiee Chieftain Delta had extracted from the Sep's prison camp, Chief Tarful. The Republic was pouring resources into the Kashyyyk Theater. Scorch agreed that it was a little overdue, and also that it was remarkably handy that all those extra troops and ships had become available, freeing up the likes of Yoda. It's a big ambush, Karuskin first. Grievous gets his tin shebs kicked and runs. Chancellor, you better be right, or we're finished. Ready? Boss said. How long have we got? Time on target for Yoda's flagship 30 standard minutes. They walked out onto the Vine Bridge and scanned for visible vessels in the dawn sky. The Sep's new reinforcements were coming, too. Their fleet was piling in, and a cruiser had taken up position at coordinates that looked as if it was going to engage Yoda's flagship. Wookiees were massing, too. Scorch heard them long before he saw them, a random chorus of rumbling, growling, yawling voices, growing louder, and you didn't need to know a word of Shiriwook to get the gist of the sentiment. They were psyching themselves up not that they needed it much to take back their world. They were going to do it with their bare hands, and Scorch believed them. Oh yes, he did. He'd seen it. He wasn't keen to see it again. The screams would be enough. The Wookiee chieftains were massive, brandishing heavy bowcasters and long guns as if they were tiny holdout blasters. They were working their troops up to a fever pitch. They thrashed their fists against their chests, then raised their arms to the sky again, bellowing defiance. The whole Wookiee army joined in. It was a wall of sound that Scorch didn't just hear but felt in his sinuses. Inaka came up behind them, and even Fixer jumped. She growled and pointed back into the forest. Boss checked his chrono. Yeah. I know you're looking forward to pulling off some arms, but I think our best bet is to take control of the turbo laser battery. That cruiser's positioned to stop Yoda from disembarking ground troops, and we need it gone. Anaka let out a roar of approval. She wanted it gone, too. Atane came jogging along the platform and stood beside her. It was an image of extremes that Scorch wouldn't forget in a hurry the two-meter-tall Wookiee with a bowcaster slung across her back like a small accessory, and Etain, so tiny that he was still sure her cone rifle weighed more than she did. It was nice to see a Jedi general who used more than a lightsaber. Etain knew exactly what it felt like to haul heavy kit for hours on end, so she understood when her troops needed a break. But there was something poking out of her belt, in the shadow of her robe, and Scorch realized after a few baffled seconds that it was a small furry toy, an animal. Reckon you can take that battery in 18 minutes, Delta? She said, winking. Omega would try for 15. We're easily provoked into rash displays of competitive machismo, ma'am, Sev said. We accept the challenge. Scorch indicated Atane's mascot. That's what he thought it was, anyway. Your Wookiee's not very big, ma'am. It's my little boy's toy nerf, she said. He put it in my hand before I left, and right now it's really comforting. It smells of him. Sev said nothing. Scorch was grateful for that. Boss clapped his gloves hard to get their attention. Come on, Delta, move it. You can play with the toy later. Etienne gave them a casual fingers-to-brow salute and disappeared with an Aka. They were booby-trapping the walkways so that the 41st Elite could drive the Trandishans into a trap and pick them off. I call dibs on the main cannon, Sev said. A Sep cruiser is like one big bug. 
I haven't had my bug splattering fix today. But he'd get plenty of chances once they blew their way into the big silo-like emplacement. The seps had built into the trees, almost sleeving them in metal at some points and driving durasteel shafts clean through the road-wide trunks. The first set of doors scorched blue unleashed a wave of spider droids, and Fixer picked them off with anti-armor rounds. Boss checked his HUD chrono, flashing the countdown to all of them across their readouts. Fifteen to go, so let's not let the generals down. Grab the first entire turret you see and hang on to it. One each. Between the four of us, we should be able to put a dent in that Shabir. Scorch could hear the voice traffic now in his helmet between the 41st and Vasa's forward air control. The SEP cruiser was maneuvering to block the flagship, and Commander Gree was searching for alternative sites to land men. If he was forced too far from the landing zone, they'd have a hard haul back through the forest before they could engage the SEP targets. The cruiser had to move. Two MagnaGuard droids blocked their path to the battery positions. Scorch almost didn't count the Trandashans who opened up with blasters. He lobbed a grenade their way while Fixer and Sev charged the droids, slicing one of them in two with a burst of plasma bolts and smashing the other to the floor with the butt of a dece before emptying a clip into it. Fixer ran on and swung himself into the gunner's seat on the first turbo laser position. He waved Scorch and the other two passed him, and started punching the controls. Scorch dropped into the next bay. He found a Trando trying to get a firing solution on the GR flagship, which was now looking awfully close and in need of a parking space. Scorch brought his Viber blade up under the Trando's chin just as the Barve reached for his rifle, waited for him to stop struggling, and dragged the body clear of the seat. By the time Scorch had taken control of the cannon's targeting system and found the optimum points on the cruiser's hull to do the most damage, Boss and Sev were gone, sprinting on to take control of the last two cannons. Fixer was already opening big vents in the cruiser's hull. But the thing wasn't going to go down easy. Now Scorch could see four streams of laser fire playing along the keel of the Sev's ship. Yeah, feel free, join the party. Scorch thought Fixer was talking to him on the comm link, but when he saw AAA coming up from the ground in brilliant white staccato lines, he realized Vasa's lardy units had moved in. That's our sky, buddy. Move over. The cruiser was losing height. Its buckled hull plate shuddered every time it took a hit, and then it started to break up. Flame vented from rips big enough to swallow a gunship. We're going to be wearing that thing for a hat if we don't move soon, boss, Scorch said. It's as good as dead. Job done, Deltas. Bang out. Scorch swung out of the gunnery seat and ran for the turbo lift, Dees ready, but he was running over dead Trandos and shredded metal. Any remaining steps in the battery had made a run for it, too, possibly because of the imminent fireball from a dying cruiser. Boss, breathless, was calling in a LAT slash I for extraction as he ran. Then Sev cut in. Scorch looked around. It was the first time he noticed that he wasn't with them. When he checked the point of view icon in his HUD, Sev still seemed to be looking out from the turbo laser viewport, and then the image broke up into streaks before going black. Sev's voice carried on. Boss, I've got a problem here. Sev, where are you? Sector. Multiple hostiles. Fixer jabbed the calm link reset on his helmet. There was just a wash and crackle of static. Lost his signal, boss. Well, find it again. Delta, regroup we're going after Sev. The forward air controller from Vasa's unit cut in. Negative negative, 3-8. New orders came through from the generals clear the area and evac now. I don't care if they came from General Yoda himself.
Boss gestured to Fixer and Scorch to make a move after Sev. They could always claim they hadn't heard the message. Sev Dash. As a matter of fact, they did, soldier. Now get your squad out of there. Explosions shook the ship. The comm circuit was a disjointed mix of half-snatched conversations. It was all going to Heron. SEP forces were streaming in from the north and east of their position, converging on them. Delta had killed the cruiser and enabled the 41st to land, but the battle had only just begun. He's right, boss, Fixer said. We've got to get out now. Scorch grabbed Fixer's arm. We can't leave Sev. Nobody gets left behind. Remember? Remember how Sev blew up when we left Vav on my Jito? You want to do that to our brother? You want to abandon him? Leave him to die here? He's Sev, Fixer said. If he's alive, he'll hole up somewhere and we can retrieve him later. What if he can't? Then he's dead anyway. We don't leave without a body, moving or otherwise. If we don't evac now, we'll all be dead. Fine, then we go together, not running off to save our own Shebs while Sev's left here. Boss said nothing and just watched as if he had nothing better to do, even though they had seconds to make their move. Then he took hold of Scorch's shoulder. Scorch hadn't wept since he was a kid, but he couldn't SEC for tears now. I'm not leaving him, boss. You go if you want to. Not me. This is an order. Screw orders. Omega wouldn't leave a man. Scorch. You'll have to shoot me. Boss put his hand on his sidearm. Losing one guy is bad enough. I'm not losing two. Don't let me down now. He shoved Scorch hard in the back and nearly knocked him over. The lardy was hovering level with the exit hatch of the turbo lift. Shift it, 6-2. I'll never forgive you for this, boss. Or you, fixer. We're brothers, for Fearfex's sake. I'd never leave you. But he did. He left. They all left. Sorry, Sev. Boss's voice was suddenly husky. He wasn't the weepy type, either, but he sounded like he was struggling. And maybe Sev could hear them, and maybe he couldn't, but if his end of the calm link was still live, Scorch could imagine what he was going through now as he listened to his brothers leaving him to die, or worse. Delta. Move out. Sev was as hard as they came. Vav had made survivors of them all. Fixer was probably right. If Sev was still alive, he'd probably stay alive for a long time, and they could always go back. But they didn't know. No, you didn't pull out all the stops for Sev. Skirata would have told Yoda to shove his orders, cut the calm, and gone looking for him. As they jumped into the Lardy's crew bay for the evac, Boss put his hand on Scorch's shoulder, but Scorch shrugged it off. He longed for a cannon round and instant oblivion, some way of stopping the guilt of not being dead, not staying to search, not making a final stand and defying Boss and CIC and even Shabla General Yoda. He wanted to die of shame. He could only imagine how much worse it would feel in years to come when he had to face himself every morning. It was just as well that a clone's lifespan was limited. Chapter 17 You have to know the limits of your physical and mental endurance, so you can recognize them and pass beyond them. This is why I will push you beyond any suffering you can imagine. You will not give up and die like lesser men. You will not crack up like lesser men. You will not lose heart in the direst circumstances like lesser men. You will carry on beyond your imagined limits. And you will be the last men standing when the weaklings have opted to do the easy thing and die. 
Sergeant Wallen Vav, Kiri Valdar, addressing junior clone trainees, average biological age, 10 years old, on Kamino, five years before Geonosis. The Battle of Kashyyyk, Afternoon, 1,088 days ABG. Inaka picked Atain up bodily and dropped her over the side of the vine rope bridge. No! Atain yelled. She landed safely, buffering her fall with the force, but she didn't need to, an old male Wookiee, gray-streaked and battle-scarred, caught her. Her small brown fabric bag fell after her. You can't do this! I can't do it! Inaka swung down from the higher level, yelling warnings that she had her orders, and she agreed with those orders, and so she would carry them out with extra enthusiasm. Atain had to go home. She was taking her home. But we can't leave Sev. It was her fault. She told them to take the turbo laser position faster than Omega could, turning a life or death mission into some stupid joke because she thought it was better for morale than warning them about their chances of surviving. I can find him. I can get him back dash. She found herself thrown like a sack of tubers from Wookiee to Wookiee along the bridge and across gaping chasms. Her force powers should have enabled her to at least fight back, even if she was a scrap of nothing compared to these enormous beings, but she would have had to use a lot of damaging force to stop them. I can't abandon Sev. He de come back for me. Attain concentrated, pushing away from the next Wookiee's grasp. It was a big, elderly female. The matriarch tottered and almost fell. Wookiees knew what they were doing up at these heights, and Etain's force pushes just messed things up. She landed on the next platform on her feet, but was then pinned down by three more Wookiees and warned in no uncertain terms that she was going to get one or more of them killed. Maybe I want an excuse to run. Maybe they know that and they're sparing me my own shame. She almost missed the next platform and was grabbed by both arms, hauled inboard, and shoved into a heavily camouflaged shuttle nestling under a trellis of slim branches. Inaka strapped her into the seat, then dropped her bag beside her. We can't leave Sev here. We never leave a man behind. We dash. Inaka roared that she would take her to Coruscant, or even Mandalore if she wanted and then go back to search for Sev with the other Wookiees. If he hadn't been killed immediately, then the best people to search for him were Wookiees, not humans. If Etain hadn't located him with her Jedi powers, and Naka pointed out, then she might never find him anyway. So she could leave. Etain tried to find Sev in the Force. She thought she knew him well enough to find the impression he left. That strange blend of focus, confidence, fear, and a childlike need to please, to excel. But she only felt the combined pain and fear of men fighting a battle. Inaka lifted the shuttle clear of the platform and wove between the branches just under the canopy, heading away from Kachiro and the coast and out of the battle zone. Eventually, the vessel's nose lifted at a sharp angle and they were in bright sunlight a long way inland with the palls of smoke just visible in the distance as the ship looped around and climbed out of the atmosphere. Etain found herself putting her hands over her ears. She didn't understand the reflex. It was just instinctive. He'll think someone's coming for him, she said. She couldn't just forget Sev like a closed topic and move on to the next item on the agenda. If he realizes he's been abandoned, can you imagine how he'll feel? Vav had raised his young clones to be hard, ruthless men. They never got any love from him, Skarada had told her, because he had never had any from his father. Vav had told a different story, that he pushed his boys harder than they ever thought they could endure, because the tougher they were, the longer they'd survive. Aden had tried to run a knife through his old sergeant more than once for the terrible scars physical for sure, mental almost certainly that Vav'd given him. 
And Naka listened patiently to Atain's outpouring of guilt, then rumbled a placatory response that General Yoda had ordered Delta to pull out, so she had no choice. Did he tell them to leave Sev behind? Atain snapped. Did he even know they had a man missing? Would he have given the same order if he had? She knew she was on blasphemous ground now, because Master Yoda was the most venerated of living Jedi, the guiding hand of the Council for centuries. He couldn't be criticized. He was the Jedi Order. We sent ARC troopers to rescue Jedi from Hypery. We didn't say, oh, war sure is tough, we're bound to lose a few. We decided it was worth risking clones' lives to get them out. Why isn't Sev worth that? Why is a Jedi worth more to the war effort than he is? Because we're running the show? Because we own them? And Naka said nothing for a long time. Atain leaned back in the seat and shut her eyes. She found herself searching in her pockets and bag to find Cad's toy nerf, and pressed it to her cheek so she could lose herself in that very primal uncomplicated emotion for a moment. Inaka trilled, asking if she wanted her to let Vav know that Sev was missing. No, I'll do it, Atain said. If he doesn't already know, she took out her comm link. Comms had been very patchy on Kashyyyk, but she had messages waiting, data received while she was fighting and unaware of receiving, and so she read them. Most were operational, not urgent, but one was very special indeed and she felt intense guilt that she could swing from despair for Sev to selfish elation in a matter of seconds simply because she had a message from her lover. M. Pai Solis Tom, M. Michai Solis Drtome, M. Michai Mi Dinuyin, M. Michai Bgri Verde. Translate and respond. RC 1136. Her wasn't even close to fluent but she was learning. She knew what that meant, though. If she just repeated that pledge, that vow, it was an agreement in Mandalorian law, which managed to be simple, informal, and binding at the same time. Of course I will, she said to herself. Inaka glanced back at her from the cockpit. She copied the marriage vow carefully, then stored the reply so that it would transmit as soon as the ship was back in real space. DRK, I'm sorry I'm so far from you. And Mpai Solis Tom, and Mchai Solis DRTOME, and Mchai Amidinuyin, and Mchai BGRI Verde. I love you, Dar. I'll be back before you know it. And it was as simple as that. As soon as the vow was transmitted, she would be married. She should have been happy. She was now going back to the first place she could ever really call home, to live with her husband and their son. No matter how many years they had left to share, it would be enough. It was a magically ordinary situation that neither of them had been raised to expect, in a galaxy where almost every other being took it for granted. But she was also leaving a comrade behind a man she was responsible for as commanding officer. Sev wasn't a friend but his life mattered as much as anyone's. She couldn't stop herself from veering between those two extremes of emotion. She wasn't even sure she wanted to. Inaka caught up with the last Citrap received before the hyperspace jump and told her that Karuskin was now largely peaceful, with most of the Separatist forces driven out. Only one or two pockets of fighting remained involving citizens of CIS planets already living on Coruscant who had rallied to Grievous during the attempted invasion. Things would be back to normal soon. General Kenobi had been sent after Grievous. We might as well go straight to Coruscant, Atain said. That was the original plan, and if you drop me there, you can be back on Kashyyyk sooner. And I need to pick up some clothing. And Naka yelled that it was very thoughtful. She had a war to fight, she said, and she was keen to get back in the fray, however kind and generous Skarata had been to her. And it's best that I tell Vav in person why I left Sev.
Attain said. Even if it was acceptable to exchange marriage pledges by comlink, bad news deserved to be delivered face to face. It wasn't the only message she had to deliver personally, though. She had one more. She read the message on the small screen, satisfied herself that it was dignified and final, and stored it to be transmitted. It was to General Arligan Zay, Director of Special Forces. It was notification that she had renounced her status as a Jedi and wanted a brief meeting with him to explain without mention of her son or her clone husband why she had decided to leave the Jedi Order and begin a new life as an ordinary human being. Arca Barracks, Coruscant, 0600 hours, four days after the Battle of Coruscant, 1089 days ABC. Darman passed Ordo in the corridor leading from the accommodation block. The captain gave the impression of still being utterly dedicated to his GR duties, or as much as a null had ever been. Ordo could act. Make sure you're ready. He said pausing to clasp Darman's arm, Mando style. Any time now. Attains on her way back. Over the last few days, Darman's mood had lurched from fear to elation to being so tired that he would have been content to drop dead. It was the roller coaster he lived with in this job. Now his gut settled on excitement. Things were happening. Attain's coming back. I thought she might go straight to. You know. He was afraid to say it aloud, just in case the walls had airs. But I suppose it's safe here now. Yes. Still a few stragglers and basic criminals around, but the clearing up is underway. Where are your brothers? Mariel's. Home, and the others are heading that way. How's the... Doctor? He meant Yuthin. Has the reality dawned on her yet? She's been locked up in seclusion for more than two years. She's used to not knowing what's outside her door. Ordo pointed in the direction of the briefing rooms, then walked away. You'll be late. Go keep Zay quiet. Yayax, Akila, and Manka squads were already getting their briefings from Maze when Darman caught up with the rest of Omega. It was all domestic security tasking with CSF. Are we just the home guard now, sir? C.O.V. asked. Parking duties, maybe? Haven't they got enough meat cans on every walkway already? Maze gave him that watch my eyebrow show disapproval look that seemed common to all ARC troopers. Civil order must be maintained private. We have looting of damaged property, and any number of malcontent separatist sympathizers still on our turf. Just because the enemy fleet's gone, it doesn't mean that all the dangers have passed. Permission to go after the malcontents then, sir? If you're volunteering for public order patrol, be my guest. Maze looked at Omega. Unless you sensitive artists have got any special requests, you're deployed with Aquila and Manka two men riding with each CSF assault ship. Okay? Yes, sir. Get to it. The cops' ships are picking up from the parade ground. It was fined by Darman. There was a time when he would have bridled that confinement to the capital and wanted to be out doing real soldiering, as Skirata called it, but not now. C.O.R.R. seemed in very high spirits. Aden, you and me? Fine. Come on, then, Darike, Niner said. C.O.R.R., don't you lead our old married buddy astray. I know what you're like. Aden hadn't seen Lasima since the start of the siege, and just chatted with her in snatched moments by calm link. Darman couldn't even talk to Atain until she dropped out of hyperspace, and Naka was taking her time. He checked his calm link, found no message, and reminded himself that Atain was fine. Heard about Sev? C.O.V. said, brushing past them. 
Mia. They pulled out of Kashyyyk without him. Vav's going to go off the deep end. I assume he knows. Niner moved in as if to quash any defeatist talk. Come on, the battle's still ongoing. Delta might have been pulled out, but we've still got troops there. They'll look for him. It was true, in theory, but Darman already knew what Sev's chances were. Special forces were the ones who were supposed to do the extracting, not the ones who needed it. It didn't bode well. Otten looked uncomfortable. We ought to volunteer to search. I don't think they're asking for volunteers, C.O.V. said. You were one of Vav's, weren't you? Yeah. I was. It took just one flicker of the eye, one breath held for a fraction too long, and suddenly they all felt bad about not grabbing the nearest ship that wasn't secured and inserting into Kashyyyk to bring back one of their own. There were plenty of beings in theater who could do it, and who should have been doing it, but somehow even thinking that made Darman feel like he'd walked away and personally left Sev to die. I'm disgusted with Delta. COV was angry. Brawler squads had a reputation for being all or nothing. They're still in the gun battery complex, and they see he's not with them, and they don't go back? Just because they lost comms? The general could have kissed my Shebs, because I'd have gone back. All of us, or none of us. That's the way this game is. What a bunch of shock are. He stalked off. Darman felt suitably chastened. He'd been that man stuck behind enemy lines. No, Dar. Niner said able to read his mind pretty accurately now. That's one step too far. It's not your problem. Aden gave him a friendly shove with his shoulder as they walked out onto the parade ground to wait for the CSF ships to land. I voted to carry on the Kalura mission without you, Naviodi, he said quietly. So if I ever get stuck, you don't know me. Vav raised us different when it came to survival. Darman hadn't known that. The whole squad had risked their necks looking for him. Would you vote the same way now? Course not. You're my VODK. Your life matters more than mine, because if I had to stare at your empty seat every day, I wouldn't have much of a life, would I? Darman understood that perfectly. When everyone thought that way, everyone came home alive. Tying at Hukat Kama? It was the phrase they all used, who's watching your back? If they didn't look after one another, nobody else would. It was a nice day for a trip out, but even in the capital, even with the threat level reduced Darman still watched Niner's back, and Niner watched his. Arca Barracks, 2,100 hours. Ordo estimated that he had less than four hours left to spend on Coruscant. He decided to use some of them shaving and making himself presentable. He laid his helmet on the windowsill in the freshers and inspected the state of his reflection, feeling for stubble. Long day. Soon, it'll be over. Only Aiden and Atain still had to report in at the RV point. Omega were on patrol again after a six-hour break and he knew exactly where they were to within a block at any given time. Mariel had reached Kirimorat. Everyone else was waiting in A.E. Han, or at least on the underground quayside. Ordo took out his razor-edge knife and shaved the mando away, drawing the blade carefully across his skin. No lubricating foam, no fancy depilatory chemicals, the kind of shave you could have anywhere, anytime and leave no telltale scent of toiletries to betray your presence to an enemy. He noted that it was time to get his hair cut, and that he now had a few gray hairs at his temples. The doors parted. Maze walked in to relieve himself. Tell your two brothers. 
Mays said staring straight ahead at the tiles, that Grievous was indeed at home when General Kenobi came to call. Now he's dead. I know. Ordo concentrated on not drawing blood. Bessany always fussed over cuts. They give good intel. Eventually. Uh-huh. Are we the last two arcs left on the planet? Looks like it, Niviodi. Is this how you saw your glorious service career when Django was honing you into a perfectly formed killing machine? Not really. Mays shook his hands under the starry dryer. But who knows where I'll be deployed next, now that the armies changed shape so dramatically? Ordo wasn't sure if Mays was being literal, or if he was making an oblique opening gambit to discuss an unofficial early retirement. It was hard to tell if Mays was the deserting kind. Ordo patted his face dry with a cloth, and then dried his knife. Those 501st lads are a little keen for my tastes. They'll replace us, you know. And what about you, Ordo? What about me? Career plans? No, don't answer. I'm not sure I need to know. May's headed for the doors. Says over at the Jedi Temple I think it's the news on Grievous. He'll be back soon, he says, but I'm rostering off for the night. It would probably be the last time Ordo saw Maze, but a hearty farewell seemed asking for trouble. He listened to the Ark's footsteps fading down the corridor and went on tidying himself. Jane was right. It was good armor, even if it was a little too erudic in places. He'd have to leave it behind even the Bicey. All the data in it had been downloaded and duplicated and all he had to do now to make it safe to discard safe in the sense of having too much data stored was to break out the memory modules and pocket them. He'd leave the kit here and walk out of the building in his black bodysuit and a jacket to pick up his Besker gam from a locker at the anonymous public storage facility on the way to the reservoir. No. He'd take the AirTech bike to save time and dump it. They'd realize he'd deserted sooner or later. Ordo was about to brush his teeth when he heard the calm warning in his helmet blipping. He slid it into place, annoyed at the interruption, and wondered if it was Aiden checking in, or a Tane dropping out of hyperspace. It was a voice message. And it was either Aiden nor a Tane. Execute Order 66. It was the Chancellor the source verified by security encryption. Ordo had perfect recall. Memorizing all 150 contingency orders for the worst scenarios had taken him no time at all, but every ARC, Republic Commando, and Clone Commander had learned and repeated those orders from childhood until they knew every syllable and comma. Some of them found it a slog, but it was part of the job. CSF officers had their own set of emergency orders, covering their different responsibilities. Every Republic service and department had a handbook of procedures like that, to be put into action when things went badly wrong. Even so, Ordo froze. It was the order to execute his Jedi commanders. Yes, sir, he said. Chapter 18 Order 66 in the event of Jedi officers acting against the interests of the Republic. And after receiving specific orders verified as coming directly from the Supreme Commander, Chancellor, GR commanders will remove those officers by lethal force, and command of the GR will revert to the Supreme Commander, Chancellor, until a new command structure is established. Contingency Orders for the Grand Army of the Republic Order Initiation Orders 1 through 150, GR Document CO, CL, 50 to 95. Hemley Tower Boulevard, Galactic City, 2,120 hours, 1,089 days ABG. You okay? Said the CSF Ek handler, patting his animal. The patrol ship cruised slowly down the skylane keeping an eye on crowds that had ventured out to sample the nightlife for the first time since the invasion. 
Galactic City wanted to boast that it was open for business again. Something wrong? Darman hardly knew where to start. He'd been sure he'd misremembered the contingency orders, and that Order 66 was the command code for shutting down the banking system to avert an enemy computer attack, but it was wishful thinking. It was desperate thinking. Change of tasking, he said, stomach nodded. They can't make their minds up. Yeah, we've just had an emergency calm. Niner backed him up. Can you set us down somewhere? We need to call in our own unit. It was sheer Asik, of course, born of panic. What they needed to do, what they were required and obliged to do, was to seize and execute any Jedi they met. If they were serving alongside Jedi, that meant killing them on the spot. If they were operating alone it was a case of assassination if a Jedi crossed their path. Sure, no problem. The officer leaned through the cockpit bulkhead. Vil, can you set down the lads, please? Niner switched to the private helmet link. Dar, don't worry. Don't think about it. We'll get Atain out. Juzaquel, he's out already. Don't worry. How would Atain find out there were death warrants out on every Jedi? She was in transit. She wouldn't be able to receive a calm until her ship dropped out of hyperspace. How could he warn her? Darman opened his secure link to Skirata. Kalbir responded instantly as if he'd been waiting. Dar? Sarge, have you heard Dash? Yes, I heard. Order 66. Now don't worry. Get yourselves down here, all of you, and we'll take care of Atane. Okay? How are we going to warn her? Leave it to us. Juzik and Ordo are on the case already. We've got it covered. Skirata would have said that if the galaxy was ending. He thought he could take care of everything and everybody. Darman was now aware of some anxious conversation taking place between the two CSF officers. The Ak handler lapped Niner's back plate. Sergeant, we've just had our compliance order rescinded, he said. The cop ship came to rest on a landing platform. Is this anything to do with your ret asking? What? Jedi. Our standing order is to comply with any Jedi request. We've just been told to ditch that and to report in if we have any contact with Jedi. Niner looked glacial from the outside. Only a brother would have known what was going on under the helmet. Of course, Niner said calmly. He sounded like a stranger. I forgot that CSF would also be affected by any change in their status. I've got no intel about this other than my orders. What's happened? Vil, the pilot, squeezed out of the cockpit into the crew cabin. Attempted coup. The Jedi bigwigs walked into the Chancellor's office and tried to take control of the state. Can you believe it? Violence? Darman asked wondering why he wasn't more shocked at the news. At least one Jedi Master dead. Come and have a listen to the calm traffic. It's chaos around the Jedi Temple sector. Troopers called in, the place is on fire, everything. Burning the incriminating evidence, I reckon. The Ak Handler patted his animal fondly. Who'd have thought it, Ed Jossi? Bad Jedi. Bummer, Niner said mildly. Okay, Dar, this is where we get out. He turned to the cops and touched his fingers to his helmet. Thanks for the heads up. You go careful, okay? The CSF patrol lifted clear, and Darman and Niner were left standing in a vastly altered world. Oh, Shab. Dar, she's going to be fine. Just treat this like a mission. We're Republic Commandos. Extracting Jedi when they get into scrapes is part of the job description. 
But she's not any Jedi. She's my girl. She's my wife, when she responds to that vow. She gave me a son. Niner let out a long sigh, and looked around as if he was searching for something. What do we do if we run into other Jedi? Darman asked. Turn blind, Niner said. Someone else can deal with them. It's not like we haven't got enough troopers on the ground now. You were always so proper. You haven't changed your mind about deserting, have you? Darman thought about a conversation they'd had back on Gaftaker, discussing whether they'd leave their brothers behind for a new life if the opportunity arose. Niner had been as upset by the idea as Darman had ever seen him. No, said Niner. You guys, you're all I've got. I can't face being alone, not again. I won't be parted from you. I don't feel comfortable running away, but Calbear's right when he says we never took an oath to serve, and I just can hack it on my own here. Darman took his arm and squeezed it hard. We're all in this together, Naviodi. I'll commandeer some transport. Niner said and strode toward a young Osarian male who was sitting in the saddle of a large speeder bike, minding his own business. Calbear and Ordo have enough on their plate at the moment. I lay, citizen. I need your bike. Emergency Republic business. It was hard to ignore a Republic commando, especially at night. The blue-lit T-shaped visor proved very intimidating, especially set against matte black stealth armor. The Osarian, startled, looked at Niner, then at his DC-17 rifle, and then passed his shoulder as if he'd seen something on the skyline. Darman turned. There was a fire, a big one. The night sky which was always a dense mass of illuminated signs and light pollution that blotted out the stars, was now showing a distinct, smoky orange ellipse. The Jedi Temple was being engulfed in flames. Air. Okay, officer, said the Osarian, and handed over his key pass. Will I get it back? At the address shown on your permit. Niner said clearly lying. He turned to Darman. Mount up, private. They took off, leaving the bright-lit entertainment area beneath them, but neither of them knew where to go yet. Niner found a quiet vantage point high up on an office block. The two commandos sat perched there on the bike like a couple of armored raptors. What do we do when we know Atane's landed? Darman asked. It's not like we can collect her on this thing. Only two heats. We'll do what we always do dynamic risk assessment. Wing it. Yeah. Darman almost didn't want to know what was going on elsewhere in the city. He had his HUD on default, receiving only emergency data and set to night ops. His comm link to Skirata and the others was kept open. Then he risked patching into the GR comm chatter just to listen to things he knew he didn't want to hear. It was surprisingly calm. There was the ebb and flow of reports from across the galaxy. Most of them about casualties, requirements for supplies, and almost incidental, this occasional voice traffic reporting the completion of Order 66 in a given location, and that Jedi General this, or Jedi Commander that, had been terminated. Darman heard only one comment about it on the open comm net, and that was a clone trooper reporting in from an acclimator. I still can't believe they tried to seize power like that. He was saying to an ops room somewhere. We never saw it coming. How could the Jedi betray us like this? Kunera Harkajais Rolitieri Sol. Darman said more to himself than Niner. Execute Order 66. It was an unremarkable order among many others in the days when they first learned the list. Nobody thought the Jedi would actually turn bad, but if the worst happened, 
and they did simply detaining a being with prodigious force powers wasn't an option. It had to be lethal force. It was the same for a number of other species and organizations on the contingency list, who were great allies but who would need a lot more stopping power than a simple arrest if they turned into enemies. An order was an order. And orders had to be followed or else society fell apart. It wasn't blind obedience, Skirata told his commandos, but a conscious suppression of individual choice that every soldier made in a democracy. The soldier was the instrument of the state, not its master, and the state was the citizens. The citizens made their choice of civil government, and that government tasked the army. The army couldn't pick and choose which lawful orders it obeyed. An army that took those decisions upon itself undermined democracy, and ended up overthrowing the government. And orders followed instantly kept you alive. Take cover, cease fire, fall back. Orders came from those who had the bigger picture when you didn't. Move that battalion, withdraw from that sector, press forward on the enemy's flank. If you stood around arguing the toss about them, you got yourself and others killed. Darman had no problems with orders. He just wasn't ready to kill his wife. He hadn't signed up to do that. He hadn't signed up at all, in fact. None of them had. Attain wasn't part of whatever the Jedi Council had tried to do. Neither was Juzik. Those who really had tried to depose Palpatine well, they should have known better. The Grand Army's purpose was to defend the Republic even against Jedi. Chapter 19 I bet they wish they'd asked a few more questions before accepting command of a slave army now. Spar, formerly ARC Trooper A02, first deserter from the Grand Army of the Republic, now a bounty hunter specializing in live retrieval. Private Vessel Landing Corridor, Galactic City Airspace, 2,220 hours, 1,089 days ABG. And Naka threw back her head and yelled in protest. It's too late, Attain said. We're committed to landing now. Just take us in as planned and drop me at the Kragat. It's okay. And Naka didn't agree. She wanted to land, refuel, and take off again. She could always land near Skirata's secret mooring, and then Attain could dash. No, because if anyone's tracking us, we'll lead them straight to Juzik, to Fi, to the Nulls, to Dar, to... She trailed off. And anyway, I'm not even a Jedi now. I'm not in danger. Just land. Please. And Naka's roar of warning filled the small cabin, but she did as she was asked. She set the shuttle down on a rooftop above the Kragat, and insisted on delivering Attain personally to the doors. They stopped short in the shadows of the doorway of a derelict cantina nearby. And Naka look, I dash. The Wookiee grabbed Attain's hand and slapped a blaster into it. She was going to need that. And Naka said and there was no time for long goodbyes. She'd see her around one day. Then Anaka loped away, vanishing into the turbolift shaft. Atane ripped off her brown robe, the one that marked her so clearly as a Jedi, and dropped it off the walkway into the urban abyss below. Then she walked calmly into the Kragat in her light beige tunic and pants. She still needed to change into plain civilian clothes. Hi, sweetheart, Serana said softly. It was a restaurant full of cops, most of whom knew exactly who Atane was, and they all knew the Jedi were on the wanted list now. Why have you come back here? I need a change of clothing, fast. Serana bundled her into the kitchens. She grabbed the first garments she could find stuff that the cooks had left lying around plus her own coat and boots, and Etain swapped her rough-spun ascetic uniform for a motley outfit that made her look like a girl who didn't have the credits to be fashionable but did her best. 
an ordinary young woman, an average human female of her age from this poor part of town. Perfect, she said, and gave Serana a kiss on the cheek. I don't know how I'll ever repay you. Oh, come back and wash the dishes sometime. Serana opened the trash incinerator and threw in Etain's old clothing and boots. Is there anything in your bag that'll give you away if you're stopped? I've got two lightsabers, a blaster, my comm link, my data pad, and Cad's toy. You're crazy. Ditch the lightsabers. One of them was her own. But one was Master Fulier's, her old master, the master who was killed because he stood up for what he thought was right, in a very un-Jedi way by current standards. Fulier would never have come to this point. Fulier would have refused to lead clone troops, would have kicked up a stink, would have called Master Yoda any number of unflattering names and demanded to know why they'd all gone down this path with barely a whimper. She couldn't leave his lightsaber behind. See, you'd be proud of me now, Master, and I'm not even a Jedi any longer. And if she carried his weapon, then she might as well keep her own. She'd just be careful. Goodbye, Serana, Etain said, and walked out through the kitchen doors into the restaurant again. She had never felt more calm, more certain, and more safe than she had right now. The terrible ripping sensation in her chest that had stopped her breathing even while the ship was still in hyperspace had faded, its place taken by an animal determination to live. I have plenty to live for now, and not just an ideal. As she reached the entrance, one of the CSF cops stood up and blocked her path, with his back to the transparent steel frontage that overlooked the skyline. Her stomach nodded. This man wasn't going to stop her leaving. But in the split second that it took for her to choose which way she was going to make him move, he glanced over his shoulder at the skyline, and then back again as a GR patrol gunship swept by. All clear, kid, he said. They're just running general security patrols with our boys. Off you go. Good luck. The galaxy was full of good folks. She needed to remember that. From the walkway, she could see a pall of orange-lit smoke rising from the Jedi Temple. It was visible clear across the city. Flames leapt to the peak of the four corner towers every so often, then dropped again below the tumbling smoke. She caught a speeder taxi to the upper levels and got out at the Borali Hola Theater where the mass of crowds was the best camouflage. The line waiting outside was facing away from the theater doors as the patrons watched the fire. It was as if they thought the war was over, and this disaster was a distant entertainment. On every walkway, there were clone troops. Etain flipped open her data pad to check for new messages again in case she missed one. They'd come through in a flurry as soon as Anaka had brought the shuttle out of hyperspace, and the calm link had picked up the local node. The one from Skirata had come through first. Gar has orders to kill Jedi on site attempted coup. Wind a dead. Send location and we'll extract you. Don't take risk. There was another from Darman. Did you get my message? And now Juzik had tried to reach her. Tell me where to find you. She tapped out a message to Darman. I got yours. Did you get mine? But she got a relay warning back saying that the node was inoperative. Staying. Maybe they changed the GR comm protocols in the last 24 hours. They did it occasionally because helmet links fell into enemy hands, and they needed to keep one step ahead on comm security. She'd try again later. Juzik and Skirata were off the GAR network most of the time. Etain was aware of the scrutiny of a couple of troopers with blue armor flashes, the 501st, men she would normally have sought out and befriended as she did every clone she met. Now all she could think was that they knew she was a Jedi. 
I'm not. I'm no longer a Jedi. They can't tell me from a non-force user. The Chancellor's office probably wouldn't quibble over that fine distinction, though. She swallowed hard a few times, trying not to look as if she was panicking, and tapped in a reply to Juzik. In civilian clothes, I'm okay. I'm heading for the RV point. Don't leave the others. She slipped the comm link back in her pocket and decided the only way to get past the patrol was to behave like a regular civilian scared, confused, or both. She'd been in battle, and all she had to do was focus on that feeling, on negotiating a battlefield. A coup. What was the Jedi Council thinking? Had they sanctioned it, or did Winda take it on himself to act? Other pedestrians were trying to hail air taxis, but most were zipping past already occupied. There was a definite movement of traffic away from the temple sector. Atain approached a trooper and decided that if he saw her disorientation, he'd think that was absolutely normal on a night like this. Captain, she said. He was a lieutenant, and that was clear from the subtle rank insignia on his chest plate, but her knowledge might have raised suspicion. Captain, I need to get to Quadrant J-12. She didn't but it was close enough without giving her destination away. Are the sky lanes closed? What's happening? The trooper looked down at her. She felt him in the force. He gave her that same impression of child that Darman had exuded when she first sensed him. He was new to this. Nothing to worry about, ma'am, he said. Some trouble at the temple. There's been an attempted coup, but it's under control now. You're free to go anywhere, but the skylines around the temple are closed for the time being because of drifting smoke. His accent was different. He was almost like the men she knew and served with, but not quite. Now she was as sensitive to tiny variations as any clone. Thank you, Captain, she said. Her calm link blipped again. She checked it, and it was. Juzik, I say again, wait until I collect you. Atain was getting annoyed. She didn't have time to stop and send messages now. She didn't have far to go five or six clicks, no more. She tapped a reply, I'm fine, stay there, where's Dar? Tell him to go. Can't reach him. She started walking toward the reservoir sector. It would take her ten minutes to cover the walkways to the speeder bus terminal. If she stayed among crowds, she'd be fine. The only uncertain part of the journey was when she had to descend to the lower levels, and that was because of the low-life scum she'd encounter, not because she'd be hunted for having been a Jedi. She strode out across the paved plaza, feeling awkward because Serana's borrowed shoes were a little too big for her and she was sliding around in them. As she rested her hand in the bag slung over her shoulder and felt the silky fur of the toy nerf, she realized that her jumble of emotions didn't include shock at the fact that Master Winda had tried to oust the Chancellor. Skirata obviously had good intel, but she was more surprised that someone had managed to kill Windu during the attempt. A.E. Han, Emergency Reservoir, 2,235 hours. No, Skirata said firmly into the comm link in his fist. I'm not having everyone running around this Shabla city like maniacs. Get your shebs down here, Kor. And drag Aten by his ears if necessary. It's under control. We're dealing okay? Yes, Sarge, but Dash. I love you, son, but I need you to do exactly what I tell you. Okay? Yes, Sarge. Skirata understood completely how C.O.R. felt, because his own instinct was to get up top and haul people in. He'd never been good at securing the hatches and leaving, even when it was the most sensible option that would save the most lives. 
He stared up at Aihan's deck head as if he could see through it if only he concentrated hard enough, and kept checking the chrono readout on the bulkhead. Eventually, he heard familiar voices through the open outer hatch. He breathed easy again, at least for a moment. Aden gave him a playful punch in the shoulder. I said to dump the armor. Skarada scolded. I know, but we looked more conspicuous in bodysuits. C.O.R. looked around the crew cabin, thumbs hooked in his belt. It's cramped, but I'll take it. Fai stuck his head out of the galley. You think you're funny, but I'll show you how it's done properly. Nerves were frayed. The banter, the sharp and strained humor, had started. Skirata could hear the edge in their voices, even Fai's. He paced up and down the deck. Okay, we're still short Attain, Niner, Dar, and Aiden. Attain's on her way, and won't behave and let us collect her Dar and Niner haven't called in for fifteen minutes and Aiden, as far as I know, is Dash. Where's Ordo? Fai asked. At the barracks, doing a final check to make sure we haven't forgotten anything. It was crowded in the small submarine. They all had cabins or bunk space, and Skirata wanted everyone to keep clear of the main crew deck, mainly because he was getting agitated with folks trying to keep out of his way. But also because he was worried about Vav. The old Shakar had taken the news about Sev in complete silence, not a twitch on his face and that usually meant things within him were fermenting at an unhealthy rate. Vav stood leaning with one hand flat on the bulkhead the other tucked in his belt while he gazed down at his boots. Murd sat at his feet, staring intently into his face. Vav obviously wasn't looking at the strill. Wallen, Skirata said, can I do anything? I understand, Vav said quietly. I actually get it. Shab, why didn't I see this coming? His tone was so unvav like that it got instant silence on the deck. You want to talk? Skirata asked. It was a lousy time. What's the problem? Django. Django had patience. Django could wait for eternity if he had to. And wait, it seems he could wait after death, too. Skirata glanced around the deck at everyone standing idle. Bardike, he said, come here. Everyone else into your cabins, and get some rest if you can. There's still a hard night ahead. It was in order, however softly it was phrased and they all got the picture pretty fast. The deck emptied. Juzik stood between the two men, silent. Get it off your chest, Wallen. Skarada said. Come on, Naviodi. Vav straightened up. You never liked Django, did you? I liked him enough. What I didn't like was how he ended up. Django never gave a toss about anyone but himself. Some Mandalore he turned out to be he was always away in the latter years, and he was as bad as the Jedi when it came to turning a blind eye to what was happening to his clones. No, Shice is a fool if he thinks a Fett dynasty is good for Mandiame. We're better off without him. You reckon? I do. Sorry, but I do. You suddenly his best mate, or something? Vav suddenly grabbed Skirata by the collar. Shab, he was strong. He almost lifted Skirata bodily as he shoved him against the bulkhead. They brawled many times, drawn blood, come close to killing each other, but Skirata had never seen Vav lose his temper, not once. And that was enough to stun him into silence. Now do you see? Do you? Vav hissed the sibilant like escaping steam. Murd cowered on the floor, whining softly. I'm sick to death of your sentimental twaddle about Django betraying us by letting Kamino use his genes. He did it to stop the Jedi. He did it to create an army strong enough to bring them down. 
You drone on about the injustice of unelected elites. My little working class hero will. Now they're gone. Yes, it cost our boys lives, but the Jedi are gone, gone, gone. And they won't be killing Mandalorians again. Not for a long time. Maybe never. Valve was white-faced and trembling. Then he seemed to shake himself out of whatever alien persona had taken hold of him, adjusted his collar, and tugged down the sleeves of his flight suit. He was the ice-cold patrician again. Skirata still couldn't summon up any love or guilt about Django, but suddenly it made sense, and he knew in his guts that it had been about a lot more than five million creds. I should have known. Why demand a son as part of the fee? Django lost everyone he ever loved or cared about, time after lime. And the Jedi had still killed him in the end. If Boba was anything like his father in more than looks, then he'd have a monstrous sense of vengeance boiling up in him now, and no Jedi to take it out on. You never told me what you got up to on Kamino in the time before the rest of the Kiwi Valdar showed up. Skirata said, trying to look as if he'd taken the outburst in stride. So what else are you going to tell me? Shab, they might not have been best buddies from birth, but they were as close as two Mandoate could get. Vav owed him some honesty. You were the galactic freestyle dancing champion, too? Vav didn't meet Skirata's eyes for a moment, but he glanced at Juzik. I could have been at Galadrin but I wasn't, and I never forgot that. Not my fight. Should have been my fight. And you could have been dead now, too. Bardike, if you don't know Dash. Oh, I know what happened at Galadrin, Juzik said. I know Jedi wiped out Django's entire army. He paused. And I know Django killed Jedi with his bare hands, too because I once talked to a Jedi who was there. Vav nodded approvingly. See, if you want to take out Jedi, he said, only the likes of Django could really do it. Only his clones, trained by him, and by men and women like him. That's why he knew it had to be done. He couldn't take them all down alone, but he knew an entire army of Django's could. Skirata thought of the abuse he'd heaped on Django. He knew the man, he'd fought with him, in every sense of the word, and he'd also had comradely moments with him. The thought that he might have done him a disservice was one burden of guilt too many. He shut it out. If Django had been playing the long game, Skirata had never caught a whiff of it. He knew it wasn't all about the credits. He'd seen Django cradling Boba in the early days, and that man wanted a son as much as any man ever had. So Skirata hadn't looked for any motive beyond that. It was the only motive Skirata would have had. I stand corrected, said Skirata. How do I apologize? Where do I even start, with the Asik I have to deal with now? So I was wrong about Django. And now I know why Shaisa wants Django's legacy to live on at any cost. Vav shrugged. I let him down once. Vav would never shake off that feeling of having failed, the legacy of his vile father. He'd instilled it into his clones, despite himself. But I never let him down again. Don't beat yourself up. I should have been at Galadrin, too. I know said Vav. That's why I chose you for the Kiwi Valdar. Skirata grappled with the stomach-nodding realization that he really didn't know Vav half as well as he thought he did. He chose me. Shab, he chose me. Okay, Wallen, answer me this, will you? No, Asik. Did Django want me on the team? We discussed all personnel fully. Don't talk like some Shabla administrator to me. Did he want me? Vav wavered for a moment. Outbursts and wavering in one night. It was all revelations. You know Django. 
He could get his downs on people, and then he'd see sense. Does it matter a shab now? No, Wallen, it doesn't. Skirata knew he was everything Vav said thug, thief, killer, uncultured oaf, and way too emotional. But he knew how to fight anything, anytime, and he knew how to love. It was as much a survival skill as using his blade, or knowing how to construct a vayam for shelter in the field. That's the gift. That's what both my fathers taught me. He held out his hand to Vav. Wallen, whatever we've said or done to each other before this moment, it doesn't matter. Siem Vedin. A fresh field of snow. Vav looked at him blankly for a moment. Maybe he knew how precariously Skirata balanced on the edge of his resources right then, but that craggy humorless face softened for a few telling seconds. Siem Vedin. Vav grasped Skirata's arm in a vice-like grip. And by Vodin, Niviodi. Vav seemed purged. He slapped his thigh plate, and Murd trotted after him into the galley. Sorry about that, Bardike, Skarada said. It couldn't have been easy for the kid to hear all that bad blood about Jedi on this particular night. He might have turned his back on them and put on the Beskergam, but they'd been his family and some of those killed must have been his friends. Jedi were living beings, too. Some might have got what was coming to them, but others were probably decent like Atain and Juzik. We're tired old men, with tired old grudges. Juzik looked at his chrono and then checked his comm link. Had to be said. He shook his head slowly. I'll make sense of this later. Maybe. But, okay, I understand Fett's vengeance. But if the whole Grand Army was planned just to take out the Jedi Order, then Fett alone couldn't have done this or even hijacked it. Why is nobody asking this question? Who planned the army in the first place? Who bankrolled it? And what's Fett got to do with the second wave, the Sentax clones, the massive new fleet? What's the link between the Chancellor and the Jedi plan? It was a shabla good question. It would also have to wait. Skarada opened the comm link. Dar? Niner? Wrap up whatever it is you're doing and make your way to the RV point. It's Index. It's over. Arca Barracks, Special Operations Brigade HQ. 2,240 hours. Ordo finished his sweep of the accommodation block, satisfied that Omega hadn't left anything foolish or accidentally incriminating in their quarters. They were smart men, but the smallest thing might be a link in a trail that would lead eventually to Kiramorat, or worse to the discovery that Atain and Darman had a child. Kalbir was already on Palpatine's list for stealing Ko's size data from under him. It wouldn't take a genius to guess that Mandalore was a likely bolt hole. But Mandayame was a big empty planet, mostly wild and unspoiled and nobody could disappear quite as well as Mandoade when they put their minds to it. Ordo changed into his red Mandalorian armor, his Besker Gam. It was the final act of severance from the Grand Army of the Republic, which had never asked him if he wanted to sign up anyway. He left his fine white arc trooper's armor in a tidy pile on the bunk that he rarely used then relented and scooped up the helmet in the red-trimmed gray leather comma. It was a sentimental act. He thought he was less tied to his memories than that. There was one place left to clean up, just in case. That was Arligan Zay's office. Ordo came down in the turbo lift with his arc bucket tied in the comma like a sack of booty, his red. Mando Baisi in his other hand to find himself in an echoing emptiness. The faint disembodied voices of calm traffic drifted down the corridor from the ops room. All command and control had been switched to the Gar HQ, but nobody had shut down the room. It was as if So Brigade had suddenly ceased to exist. Special operations had been a Jedi project. 
Now the Jedi were dead and gone, from the temple a few kilometers away to the besieged worlds of the Outer Rim, shot where they stood. Fine. No interruptions. Ordo activated Zay's computer and bypassed all the security lockouts, then began stripping out the data onto his own pad as he erased it irretrievably from the Republic's system. It didn't matter what it was. If there was anything in there that would compromise Kiramura, then it was safer to trash the lot. Five minutes. Calbert, you haven't called in? I'll call you when the sound of someone lurching along the pleakwood floor outside, boots scuffing, caught him unawares. He hadn't expected to see General Zay tonight. Zay, it seemed definitely hadn't expected to find a Mandalorian rifling through his desk. The general filled the doorway, disheveled and smoke-stained. Blood had dried in a thin trickle from his forehead down to his chin. His left arm hung limp at his side. Someone had nearly killed him. Ordo tried to feel some compassion. But Zay was outside the small group of beings that Ordo had bonded with, and he accepted that he couldn't convert that intellectual understanding of Zay's human failings and virtues into the sensation in his gut that told him that this was someone he loved and cared about. It would be enough not to kill him. General, Ordo said. I'll be gone in a moment. Do you think it's wise to be here? Ordo? Ordo took off his helmet, wondering if it made any difference in helping the Jedi recognize him. But he always seemed to. Hide while you still can. They killed us. They killed us all. Why? Ordo stood up and pocketed the data chips, then tucked his helmet under one arm. Power was a strange, shifting thing. Ko Sai had been the arbiter of life and death for him as a small child and then the Jedi had become his masters or so they thought and now both were dead. It was best to be your own master and lord it over nobody, because sooner or later the beings you trod down always came to get you. Orders, Ordo said. You never read the Gar's contingency orders. They're on the mainframe. I suppose nobody thinks contingency orders will ever be needed. Zay leaned panting against the door frame as if he was about to collapse. But why? Because, said Maze's voice from outside the doors, it's either your right nor your position to decide who runs the Republic. Who elected you? Ordo heard the click and whir of a sidearm. It was time to go. This wasn't his war or his world any longer. He picked up his belongings and took a few paces toward the doors, wondering what would happen when he had to shift Zay out of his way. Maze, what are you going to do now? Ordo asked. I've never disobeyed an order, said the Ark Captain. Zay didn't seem to have the strength to turn and look at his former aide, just shutting his eyes as if he was waiting for the coup de gr sensi. What am I supposed to do? Pick and choose? That's the irony. The Jedi thought we were excellent troops because we're so disciplined and we obey orders. But when we obey all orders and their lawful orders, remember then we've betrayed them. Can have it both ways, General. Zay summoned up some effort and stumbled toward his desk to slump over it. Ordo put down his two helmets and slid the man into the chair. Maze walked in. He was holding his blaster at his side, not aiming it. He wasn't the one who'd shot Zay. There was no smell of discharged weapon clinging to him. I really must be going, General, Ordo said. But he had to know. Just tell me, is it true that Windu tried to depose the Chancellor? Zay raised his head all anguish and agony. He's a Sith. Can't you see? A Sith. He's taking over the government. He's occupying the galaxy with his new clones. He's evil. 
I said, is it true? Yes. It was our duty as Jedi to stop him. What's a Sith? Maze asked. Django Fett hadn't been very thorough in the education of his Alpha Ox, or maybe he didn't want to muddy the waters with sectarian trivia. Like Jedi, Ordo said, only on the other side. Mandalorians fought for them thousands of years ago, and we got stiff by them in the end. We got stiff by the Jedi, too. So, all in all, it's a mood point for us. Palpatine's probably the one who had you created, Zayi said. He was lucky he was still breathing. Ordo wasn't sure why Maze hadn't just slotted him. Why couldn't you see what he was? Why couldn't you sniff him out with your force powers? Ordo asked. And why the Shab did you never ask where we came from? Ordo had had enough. He walked away. He was halfway down the corridor, and he could still hear Maze asking Zay to come quietly, because he was arresting him, because maybe he might get a trial. Poor Maze. He really believed that political Asik he read on his off-duty hours. The world didn't work that way. I'm dead already, said Zay. His voice was getting fainter. Ordo had expected him to fight to the death. Please do it. I know you have no malice in you. End it for me. I know what'll happen if he gets me. Ordo's forefinger hit the keypad on the main doors to open them for the last time. He could just about hear the end of the conversation in the deathly quiet. I'm really sorry, sir, Maze said. But if that's an order. A single blaster shot cracked the air. Poor Zay and poor Maze. Everyone got used in the end. Except us, Ordo thought. Except us. Chapter 20 I hesitated for a moment when I received Order 66 because the last thing I expected was a Jedi coup. Did I feel betrayed? You bet I did. I thought of all my men who de died under Kiati Mundi's command, and if I'd known then that he and his buddies were gearing up to do the separatist work for them and overthrow the government, I'd have shot him as a traitor a lot earlier. He betrayed the trust of every one of us. Clone Commander Bakara, formerly of the Galactic Marines. Galactic City, 2,250 hours, 1,089 days ADG. Dar, she's not here, Niner said. They cruised up and down the main skylane from the holotheater but Darman couldn't see Atane anywhere. She was here some time ago. You know how much ground she can cover. Give it up. I can't, Darman said. He kept checking his comm link. He'd received her messages now, and he worked out the rough location of transmission based on what Juzik had said that she'd come from the Kragget. The calm traffic on the CSF channels was scaring him. He listened, mouth dry, heart pounding, to the control room supervisors juggling incoming reports and tasking patrols. All units, look out for Jedi, young Jedi, possibly disguised now. Do not approach, I say again do not approach, armed and dangerous, call for military backup immediately. May not have braids, repeat may have removed identifying marks. Copy that, 5-7. No, numbers unknown. Yes, confirm that arson is suspected. Fire investigation team is seeking access. Requires military escort. Please advise. Confidential material has been destroyed. Jedi may be trying to escape with highly sensitive security data, so this is top priority. Chancellor's office. Military has orders to shoot on sight. Person of special interest, male, Tevin Felt, first name true, do not approach, call for 501st backup immediately. 
Jailer Obram had called Skarada to let him know that one of his men had spoken to Etain when she left. If she was following a direct route on foot, she'd probably have come this way. If she'd taken a taxi, she would have been at the RV by now, and Skarada still hadn't seen her. Why doesn't she just call in? Niner sounded exasperated. Doesn't she know we're going to come out and look for her? She's like Calbert. She thinks that if she says not to do it, then we won't. Darman was now desperate. He knew Skarada would wait for her until Mustafa froze over, but the longer she was out there, the more likely she was to run into problems. She's in cities, Niner said. She doesn't look like a Jedi. As long as she doesn't start waving the shiny stick around right under some trooper's nose, she'll be fine. She accepted. What? What did she accept? We exchanged marriage vows. It still counts over a comlink, you know. It's legal. Niner didn't seem to know what to say. He swung the bike around and headed for the reservoir. What are you doing? Time's up, Dar. All we're doing is worrying, Calbert. Niner clicked his helmet calm link. Sarge? It's Niner. We're heading in. Skarada responded instantly. I've got Orda looking for her. She's okay. She's just staying off the radar. Juzik says he can sense her. Shab, I'm going to kick her shebs when I get hold of her for scaring us like this. There, Dar, Niner said. Told you not to worry. Humor me. When we get to the RV point, can we wait up top so I can see her coming? Niner accelerated toward the reservoir. Of course. It wasn't hard to spot the location, even without global positioning in their HUDs. The emergency reservoir might have been an invisible and forgotten facility for most Coruscanti, but there was a large slab-like tower on top of it part of the pumping system and when the bike got within a hundred meters of it, Darman saw an intermittent infrared pulse on his HUD. It was very regular. It was being emitted to attract someone's attention. As they approached it cautiously, it resolved into a CSF speeder parked on top of the tower. Asik CSF had been the clone's staunchest friends for a few years. Darman wasn't sure why he now felt uneasy when he saw them. It was the compliance order. CSF had been told the Jedi were now the bad guys, and not everyone worked within the wide influence of Captain Obram. Dar, let me do the talking. Niner brought the bike to a stop, facing in the opposite direction to the police speeder. It's okay. The speeder's side screen opened. Come on, said Jailer Obrim, hanging one arm over the edge. He indicated with a cutting motion across his throat to switch off their comms. I can't sit here all night. Get below. Captain, you gave us a start. I'm here to see you all get away, okay? Don't let Cal know I'm here. You're not on his frequency, are you? I said I'd keep out of his way now that Palps is after him. Now where's that woman of yours? Haven't you told her to keep her comm link open? Darman could hear a LAT slash I drive nearby. There was a GR patrol coming. It was a sound every clone could pick out at a zillion clicks, because it was the sound of a gunship coming to give welcome air support, or extraction under fire. He couldn't work out why the gunship would be out here and not patrolling the main thoroughfares. CSF's working with GR patrols, Darman said. You should know why are they around here. Obrim jerked his thumb over his shoulder. What's behind me? Darman checked his HUD holochart. Monet Town, the Tibana Storage Depot, and Chance Palp Spaceport. Correct. And where is the Jedi Temple in relation to that? 
Ah. Uh, the RV point was almost on the direct route from one to the other. Darman could see the orange glow. The fire still raged. I see. Obrim indicated the comm link sitting on his speeder console. Quite a few of the junior Jedi escaped the temple before it went up in flames, and logic says that they'll probably try getting off the planet via somewhere crowded like one of the spaceports. So they've got troops covering all the likely routes. He rubbed his eyes with one hand. I hear they torch the place themselves. Don't know what they were trying to get rid of, but the fire service couldn't save the archive. The Chancellor's pretty annoyed about that. Darman knew that anyway. He was shocked that the Jedi had pulled a stunt like this, even though Skirata kept telling him now how corrupt they were. On Kamino, discussion of Jedi had been very neutral, and he never spotted any of the strong Mandalorian mistrust of them back then. What if a patrol picks up a Tain? I'll have to talk them out of it, won't I? But there's no reason for her to get picked up. Darman nodded. Thanks, Captain. They waited. The Lardy swooped over them, searchlights playing across the roofs and spires of the pumping station as it tracked toward the spaceport. As far the lat slash i crew were concerned, it was just a commando patrol pausing to chat to a CSF comrade. Darman hoped they didn't spot that the speeder bike wasn't regulation GR issue. Then his helmet comm link clicked. Dar? E-T-I-K. Where are you? Darman heard Niner let out a breath. RV point. Darman said. Where are you? I'm about five minutes' walk from the Shinarkin Bridge extension. I can see a big crowd at the shopping plaza gates. Any idea what's happening? Because I have to go through there. Wait one, Darman said. He turned to Obrim. She's coming up to the Shinarkin Bridge. What's the crowd problem? Obrim's speeder lit up with a head-up view screen display showing CSF control room information. He read it carefully, red and yellow light dancing on his face. It's a security checkpoint. They're channeling all pedestrian traffic in that area through it. CSF and GR personnel on duty, just routine, so all she has to do is walk through. It's not like we've got a Jedi detector device or anything. Are you getting this, E.T.I.K.? Niner made his impatient noise, an irritated click of the teeth just like Skirata. I say we wander down there and just make sure she gets through okay. I could do that, Obram said. But you're the head of the anti-terrorist unit, Niner said. Everyone knows you. It'll raise questions. My boys don't ask questions. They don't see, hear, or know anything unless it's in our interest for them to do so. I meant us doing it. I meant the GR. Niner started the bike's drive. The good thing about being a clone is that we could be any one of us. Itk, we're coming to meet you on the other side of the checkpoint. Darman said. Slow down. Amble or something. Skirata's voice cut into the circuit. Darman didn't think he'd pick them up. What are you two playing at? Kalbir, we're just seeing Attain through the last barrier. Didn't I tell you to get down here? Okay, take it nice and casual. Niner switched to the private helmet link. He's going to put his boot up our shebs when we get back. We've really ticked him off. It was a small price to pay. In a matter of minutes, they'd be starting A.E. Han's drives, and all the complications would be forgotten. As they dropped down over the bridge, they could see the stream of pedestrians milling around the checkpoint, waiting to pass through, and there was a convenient space among the parked patrol vessels. Niner landed as if it was routine. There were no CSF officers visible, 
but some 500 and first troopers with their distinctive blue markings were just standing there watching everyone walk through, looking serious and armed. They didn't seem to be doing any stop and search. Niner and Darman stood looking serious, too, and a DC-17 looked like a lot more firepower than the long rifle of the troopers. And nobody seemed to turn a hair about the bike. They were commandos. The rest of the GR thought they were eccentric at best, and an undisciplined gang of thugs at worst. Here she comes, Niner said. Darman was twenty meters from Etain now. He looked through the sea of strangers and could see just one being out of all of them ETIK. She caught sight of him and glanced away before she gave in to a smile. On board A.E. Han, RV Point, 2,255 hours. Enough, said Skarada. I'm going out to see them in. I can't bear this waiting. Juzik put on his helmet. Okay, but I'm going to stay on comms and get the drives on idle. Just in case. Ordo's piloting. I know, but if for any reason he has to come down here at a run, and we're in a real hurry to bang out, I'll be there to get us moving. Juzik was a great little planner. Skarada patted his shoulder. Good thinking, he said. Can I have your lightsaber? Juzik paused but handed it to him. Don't lose it. And what for? Trophy. To look like I'm there to kill Jedi, not escort one to safety. Sorry, Bardike. This isn't pretty for any of us. Mind your hands, then. Skirata waggled his fingers. Besker impregnated fabric. We're coming too, C.O.R.R. said. Sarge, we're big strong lads, and you're not, and if it gets hairy, you'll need backup. Skarada didn't have time to argue again. Whatever happened to yes, Sergeant? Right away, Sergeant. Okay. Come on. They had to take Vav's speeder because two commandos and a mando and heavy Besker Gam wouldn't fit on a bike even if they had one handy. As Skirata looked down on the bridge, he could see the pedestrians building up into a huge crowd as the choke point of the security cordon started to build a backlog. They sat down between two GR assault ships. The transport wasn't helping the congestion by taking up so much space on the bridge, but it formed a good defensive barrier. Coming through. Otten barked clearing white-armored troopers out of their way. Mind your backs. A couple of the CSF officers gave Skirata an odd look, but either they knew who he was, and so would say nothing, or they saw the lightsaber hanging prominently from his belt and assumed that he was Mando bounty hunting muscle on hand to tackle Jedi. Anyone who knew about Mando Ade knew they could in theory tackle Force users. But most Coruscanti who weren't part of what was known euphemistically as the enforcement community, or those who serviced them didn't know what they were anyway, and just saw them as quaint off-worlders in pretty armor. They'd never seen Mandalorians fighting on their home turf. Skirata looked toward the cordon. It was a dam waiting to burst. You better hope this stays calm and orderly. Skirata said to nobody in particular. I see her. C.O.R.R. said. Good. Stay calm, folks. Just let the line work through. A 501st sergeant walked up to him. I don't have an identity code for you, sir. Sir. Skirata shuddered inside. He flipped the lightsaber off his belt and spun it in his fingers. Here's all the ID you need, sergeant. I kill Jedi. We like trophies, we mandos. Skirata wrapped his gauntlet against his chest plate. They might take your head off, son, but I'm wearing Besker. It seemed to satisfy the man. Skirata stood with his weight firmly planted on both boots, one thumb in his belt, and drew his short-barreled verpine to rest it against his shoulder in the safety position. 
The calm link in his helmet clicked. You look like a bad boy, Calbert. Dar, is that you? Copy that. Don't do anything dumb, Dar I.K. Niner, I don't see you. We're both behind you. Okay, boys, just relax. Ward I.K., are you getting this? Standing by. Skirata had said calm and relax so often now that he knew he was the one who needed to listen to his own advice. The crowd was relatively good-humored. They'd heard the news, they could see the flames, and after the thwarted invasion, the combined protective might of CSF and the Grand Army was enjoying some popularity. A female Baravian paused at the checkpoint to open her bag for inspection. I hope you get them all, she said to the clone trooper. No wonder the Seps managed to land here. The Jedi were traitors all along. You're doing a wonderful job, trooper. Skirata thought it was a bit late for civvies to feel warm and cuddly about white jobs, but it was better late than never. It was all going calmly. The chatting from the queuing crowd was a steady, loud hum. Etain was getting near the front of the line. Skirata could see her. Darman could too. Skirata heard him say, Sire And then, Three young humans, two males and a female, were slow in opening their bags. The clone trooper held out his hand to take them, the girl paused, and then something fell on the floor a stack of data pads and... Jedi! Someone yelled. They're criffing Jedi! And the lightsabers came out, blue and humming. Skirata only saw a tane, and then all Heron broke loose in the melee. Chapter 21 Sienara any Godelu Mergehauser Godelu Hostel. Time doesn't heal. It only forms a scab. Mandalorian proverb. Shinarkin Bridge, Coruscant, 2,320 hours, 2 hours after Order 66, 1,089 days ABG. Attain's instincts had long been honed to seize a lightsaber and snap it into action. The masters put her first weapon in her hand at four years of age. But not tonight, not now. Sudden danger did the same thing for her as it did for the clone troopers, for the CSF cops, for any soldier under fire. Time ceased to run its normal course. Screams echoed. Bodies jostled. She was back on Kalura, hiding from Hokan's militia, knowing that her lightsaber would mark her out as a Jedi for slaughter, like her master, and so she could not reveal it. She stood firm in the panicking crowd, in another and somehow buffered universe, making no attempt to draw her lightsaber, knowing it would seal her fate, and watched stood back and watched as three Jedi she thought she recognized batted away blaster bolts, scattering bystanders. A man fell, trapped by the crowd that couldn't get away fast enough, hit by a blaster ricochet from the lightsabers. Nobody could safely use a lightsaber in a crowd. But they were kids, just Padawans, terrified and panicking, fighting for their lives. Innocent pedestrians packed too close were caught by the flashing, humming blades. More bolts flew. She ducked. Someone else fell. She didn't see who. A civilian? A trooper? It was chaos. She had to go. She had to walk away, to get past that barrier, to get out now. Attain the Jedi didn't sense her. Or maybe there were other Jedi in the crowd. But from behind... She heard the clatter of boots over the screams as more troopers rushed in, and she looked up, saw Darman on the other side of the barrier so close, so very close to grabbing freedom with him and for a moment, torn by instinct to do something instead of save her own skin, she turned back. A frozen moment, a clone trooper a man like Darman seemed paralyzed in mid-lunch, but it was just the way time lied in a crisis. 
They put his first weapon in his hand at four years of age. Like me. Like Dar. The young male Jedi spun and raised his lightsaber to the clone, desperate to get past him, through him. Attain snapped. Pure reflex, animal and instant, she blocked the Jedi, every bit as fast and force agile as he was. Her hand went for her weapon unbidden. Her body took over. Don't touch him. She felt it was unraveling in slow motion. Don't because she knew what a lightsaber could do, because she'd killed with one, because the trooper was a man, a living, breathing man she stepped into the clone's path and into the downward arc of a lightsaber. It might have been meant for her. It might have been meant for him. The screams were suddenly a long way away. The pain it took moments to register on her brain, but she was now staring up at a smoke haze night sky and every cell in her body felt on fire. She saw chaotic lights above her, a white helmet, the T-shaped visor so familiar and so loved, and for a moment. For a moment she thought things were going to be all right. Cad. Dar. But it was not Dar, and the clone couldn't save her, and Cad was out of reach. She couldn't hear her own cries, but she was sure her lips were moving. The pain she couldn't breathe. Dar. And then the pain stopped forever. Chapter 22 All right. Let's go. Jango Fett, last Mandalorian left at the Battle of Galadrin, to the Jedi who killed Miles. Skarada took off. Darman's screaming filled his helmet. Or maybe it was his own voice. Attain. No, 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 no. Not my girl. Not my girl. He was aware of another scuffle starting to his left, but he was targeting, and he was running, and now he had to kill or be killed, nothing in between. He canonied into the melee, pushing troopers aside, and swung with a vibrabladed left fist. He knew he'd hit a Jedi. The man staggered, turned, and swept the lightsaber across him, but it skidded off his neck plate. The Jedi hesitated, because that wasn't supposed to happen. Skarada's three-sided knife was in his hand already. He brought it up into the Jedi's chest, under the rib cage, in that fraction of a second's pause. It was hate. It was an explosion of loathing and grief. He wanted to destroy the world and every breathing thing in it that wasn't his. The yelling and screaming was outside his helmet as well as inside. A trooper captain shoved him aside and dropped to his knees beside Etain, hands crossed, flat on her chest, trying to pump. It was Ordo. He tried, he really tried, but she was dead, eyes staring, sliced from shoulder to spine, dead, dead, dead. Skarada's brain shut down. Something else seized control. He drew Juzik's lightsaber, snapped it alive, wading into the crowd in pursuit of another Jedi. They seemed to be everywhere. He saw six, seven of those Shabla blades, those filthy cold things, and he saw nothing else. Jedi were still trapped in the press of bodies. People were being trampled. It was a battlefield. He saw only what he needed to kill. And Jedi needed to die. He got one square in the back, kidney level, and those burning blades worked on a Jedi every bit as well as on a Chakar like him. One got away. Skarada swung around to chase. Darman was still screaming names, but it was Niner now Niner, Niner, where are you Niner? And that was when Skirata saw that Darman was way back behind looking down over the edge of the bridge, frantic. Darman saw the Jedi too late, and Niner hadn't even been trying to stop the kid escaping. The Jedi leapt, Niner fell. If it had been Darman in his way when the Barve tried to jump clear, he would have had a vibrablade in his throat now. 
killing for killing, death for death, because even though Darman's brain was saying it couldn't have happened, that Etienne would be coming through the barrier now because she'd been so close, so very near, just a few meters and minutes from putting her hand in his and leaving forever he'd seen the lightsaber strike. She's dead. No, she can't be. Even though he was looking down onto the maintenance walkway below the bridge and could see Niner lying at an awkward angle, his vision was filled with that split second of Atain and the lightsaber. She's gone, she's gone, she's gone it wouldn't stop. But his hardwired training interrupted him, and he swung out from his rappel line, on autopilot, dropping down beside his brother. Shab. Can you move? What hurts? Darman defaulted to being another Darman, RC 1136, because that was what he did under fire, what Skarata had drummed into him to stay alive. Aten down here. Man down. Aten. Below the bridge, maintenance parapet. Dar. Dar, what's happened to Aten? Can you move? Shut up about me. Niner's voice was hoarse, a gasp. Where's Atain? She can't be dead. She can't be. She was right there, right in front of me. Can you dash? Dar. For Shab's sake, what's happened to her? Shut up. Can you move? Niner lay at an odd angle, legs bent. I can't feel my feet. Shah Dar, what's up with you? Atain. The Shabla Jedi hit her. What happened? Is she okay? She's dead. She's dead. Darman said it, heard it, and hated himself. He'd said it, he made it real. How could he be here? How could he be moving, talking, dealing with Niner? Why wasn't he doing something about Atain? He didn't know what. It's over. Nothing matters. What about Cad? What about your kid? Go. Go to him. How do I tell him I couldn't save his mother? It's my fault. A minute ago, maybe two, Atain had been alive and now she wasn't. It was such a fine, cruel implacable line. It seemed impossible that he couldn't push it back. He couldn't believe she wasn't there anymore, and that nothing he could do would ever change that. I should have done this different. The if only started right away if only she hadn't gone to Kashyyyk, if only she'd gone straight to Mandalore, if only she told him sooner and he slapped it down almost before he dared think about it. Another Darman took over. It was the Darman who had been drilled and drilled and drilled to keep his head when the very worst happened to evaluate, and to save who was savable. There was only one way he was going to get through even the next few minutes, let alone a day or the rest of his life. Niner. He couldn't think beyond that. He couldn't even begin to think straight. His hands and eyes were going through the numb motions of checking his brother. The world had ended for him, but he was still moving like a decapitated animal. Something warned him that he'd have to wake up after this crisis was over and live with the reality of life without Etain. Dar, run, Niner said. Get out now. Kelber's ready to go. Run. Darman flashed the priority override in his HUD. He cut across all local comm circuits within his unencrypted frequency range. We need a case vac right now, people spinal trauma, bridge parapet look for the criffing rappel line, I've got my spot lamp on. Medic. Look, get out now. Get to the RV point. Leave me. I'm not leaving you. They'll do to you what they did to Fi. She's dead. They killed her. Cad needs you. I know, I know, shut up, Dash. 
If you don't get out now, Dar, you'll be stuck here. Darman could hear Athen yelling over the edge of the bridge. It was all in their helmets, no external sound and inside the confines of his bucket, Darman was on a screaming, shouting, confused battlefield. Dar. Can you move him? Can you get Niner moving? We've got to get out now. He's broken his spine. I can't. Shah. Shah. Wait one dash. Cad was his son, all he'd ever have left of Atain. Cad had everyone to look after him. Niner would have nobody if Darman left him now. They'd pulled the plug on Fi when he was hurt, but he didn't die. He lived because Bessany wouldn't abandon him to callous scum who saw him as nothing more than a flesh machine. If Darman left Niner this badly hurt, maybe beyond recovery, he'd be leaving him to that fate. He couldn't go. Cad's okay. Kelber's got him. He'll be safe. Niner won't. Get out at IK. We'll work out a way to get home when Niner's okay again. Dar. You're crazy. You can't stay. Niner can't stay. Can't move him. 3-6 out. Darman cut the comms. He hadn't signed off as 3-6 for years. It was his autopilot speaking for him. He could see his call for a medic had been heard, because a LAT slash I gunship was hovering, edging closer, and he could see a clone trooper in the doorway, in the open hatch, getting ready to jump across and give Niner the help he needed. It had always been such a reassuring sight. Now it was also the end of his brief, fragile, shattered not meant to be dream of family. Darman had his hand under Niner's head. You'll be okay, Nike, he said. Look what they did for Kor. You should beer. Niner hissed. Don't you shabla well stay with me. Go with Cad. You can't leave him. And I can't leave you. Darman said his heart not just broken but utterly destroyed forever. How could he feel so much pain twice? The LAT slash I medic thudded onto the permacrete beside them and started putting a brace on Niner's neck, immobilizing his spine. The man had no idea what was going on. He couldn't possibly have known they were talking about desertion. Cad's fine. You'll be fine. One day we'll all be fine. I can't leave you. You never left me. You came for me on Kalura. You didn't even know me then. Niner could still move his arms. He hit Darman hard in the chest. Go. Get out. I don't need you. Darman watched the medic assembling a metal tubular gurney under Niner and strapping him to it. Hey, careful with him. Get the shab out, Dar. You can't leave that kid. What kind of a father are you? What would Etain say if Dash? Don't you dare use her name like that. Darman snarled. He almost lashed out but managed to pull up short. He knew his sanity was temporary, and once the pressure was off and Niner was in the med center, he'd fall apart. That couldn't happen. He had to hold it together. He had to plan. He didn't know what, but he had to have a plan. Shabir, Niner said quietly. You stupid, stupid Shabir. I'm not worth this. Too late, Darman said. It's over. It's all over. But nobody's going to pull the plug on you. Don't worry, the medic said almost as if he'd heard him. Your buddy's going to be fine. They always said that. Darman could still see Atain and the lightsaber like a freeze frame in his HUD when the hollow image emitter had gone haywire. He let it stay, switched off all comms, 
and screamed at Tain's name over and over in his silence private purgatory until he couldn't scream anymore. Ordo dragged Otten back from the edge of the bridge by his shoulder. He's cut me off. Otten yelled. He's cut his calm. There was nothing they could do to extract Niner at that point, unless they wanted to kill him. Could they wait? Did they dare hang about after this night? The L.A.T. slash I lifted into the air, and the last thing Ordo saw was Darman staring out from the open hatch, just a blue-lit T-visor in the darkness, and then he was gone. Calbir was frantic. C.O.R. had him by the arm, almost twisting it up his back, trying to calm him down. It was all silent. The drama was entirely on private comm circuits within the confines of their helmets and all that onlookers could see of the unfolding private agony was gestures that made no sense, exchanged between a bunch of clones and a kill-crazy Mando. Ordo's chest felt crushed with pain for him, and for Etain, and Darman, and Niner. Like Calbear, he wanted to destroy everything in his path to stop the agony. But he couldn't, because Skirata needed him to keep his head and get them out. Jailer Obram sprinted across the bridge, now a scene of bedlam. There were civilian medics tending to people who'd been crushed in the stampede, hit by deflected bolts, and even clipped by lightsabers. HNE News droids were arriving. Having their images all over the news was the very last thing Skirata's team needed. Ordo, you've got to go, now. Obrim stopped to bark at two cops who were trying to move Etain's body. Her face was covered with a CSF jacket. Hey, you too. Not did I tell you to move her. I did not. Leave that body. Leave it. He swung back to Ordo. Get Cal away from here now. It won't take long for these wooden tops here to find out she's a Jedi, and then you're all in really deep dwang. I'll keep an eye out for Dar and Niner but you have to go. She's a Jedi. Was, she was gone. A few minutes, even a second, and she was alive but only in a slip of the tongue. Skirata managed to pull off his helmet, revealing a face utterly white, all rage, a man you would never want to meet, let alone cross. Not without Dar and Niner. And not without Atain, not without my girl. Your cover's as good as blown. Cal, I won't be able to keep them off your back unless you get out now. Obrim shoved him. Please, buddy, do it for me. Skirata was proving too much for C.O.R. to subdue. When he was enraged, he was simply an animal, with all the strength and fury that went with it. I'm not leaving without my boys. You will. I will not, you Shabba will let me go and I'll get them dash. Sorry, old friend, Obram said, but it has to be this way. He took out a small pistol, pressed it to Skirata's neck, and fired. Skirata dropped like a stone, C.O.R.R. took his weight. Obram switched into an obvious show to throw any onlookers off the scent, just a cop yelling at Mando heavies who'd got out of hand on his turf. Get that criffing crazy Mando out of my face, and move that body. Yes, Captain, Ordo said. Stay with the body until Aiden comes. He signaled on his link. Aiden was cruising around now with New York Fallen in her transport, looking for stragglers, and they could pick up Atain. Aiden, you getting this? Obrim's going to guard Atain. Get over here now. Obram looked down at C.O.R.R. and the crumpled Skirata. Tell him I'm sorry I had to do that. Tell him I'll do whatever I can to see Dar and Niner are okay. Now go, and look after yourselves. Thank you, Jailer. The honor's mine, Ordo. The CSF captain's face was stricken. And I'm so sorry about Etain. Ordo put Calbear's right arm over his shoulder and C.O.R.R. took his left. They bundled him into the speeder with Otten, and then lifted clear in what should have been a moment of relief, of triumph, 
but that was simply black desolation. Ordo understood vengeance better than anyone, but there was nobody alive now to take it out on. Some Jedi, though. Some might have made it. He'd know what to do when he met them. Chapter 23 It's entirely possible that the Jedi's increasingly clouded vision was the result of their own moral degeneration. They'd let so many of their principles slip that the reason they couldn't see the dark side was so close to them was the lack of sharp contrast with themselves, like trying to see a gray nerf in fog. They turned off the light themselves. Bard and Juzik, former Jedi Knight. Kirimorat, Mandalore, 1090 days ABG. It had been the worst night of Fi's life, and he'd had an awful lot of bad nights in a short career. But he couldn't imagine what it had done to Skirador Niner, or Dar. As soon as Aihan settled on her dampers, Fi heard the sound of boots on the hull, and both the top and port side cargo hatches popped open from outside. Muriel jumped down from the top hatch like a medic hauling casualties from a lardy, but even he froze as soon as he looked around. The sense of defeat that hung in the air was almost solid enough to bail out like water. Nobody said anything for a few moments. Then Lasima stood and scooped up Cad still awake, still craning his neck and gazing around as if he was looking for something and stepped out through the cargo hatch. Bessany got up and took Cal's left hand. Come on, Calbear. She glanced over her shoulder, then gestured to the rest of them with her free hand. Everyone into the house. I know none of us feels like it, but the first thing we do is get a meal inside us, and then try to get some sleep. We won't get far without that. It was an order, however gently spoken. The females were taking command now, as if this was the second phase of a battle. It was, and it would be far harder than the first. Fi waited for Aden, Corr, Ordo, Vav, and Juzik to exit. Joka sat with her hands in her lap, staring at Skarata as if she didn't know what came next. But Murd nudged her with its nose, then caught her sleeve carefully between teeth that could crush cranial bone and led her out. The Strill was even more intelligent than Fi had thought. It was diplomatic. It's okay, Fi, I'll see to Cal, Bessany said. Parge is going to be waiting. Go greet your wife. We'll be along shortly. Fi didn't expect it to be daylight outside, let alone a sunny afternoon. A thick carpet of snow made the light painfully bright. It was all wrong, it should have been night, and terrible weather, because this was only going to taint all sunny days for him from now on. He stood on the hatch combing and watched Parja checking the landing gear with stress sensors, giving the huge damper piston sharp blows with a hydra spanner and listening carefully each time. Hi, Sire Raike, she said holding out an oil-smeared hand to him. She didn't have to ask how he was, because she knew. As soon as everyone's disembarked, we'll roll A.E. Han into the hangar. I miss you. Welcome home. His mouth worked eventually. It wasn't the aftermath of his injuries this time. It was just the enormity of events that he would never have found words for even when he was at his peak. You heard what happened. Yeah. Parja said. She put her arms around him, and they stood there for a while. I heard. It was amazing how silent a place could be even with more than twenty people wandering around in it. Lasima had instantly become some kind of loadmaster, directing operations and assigning rooms with Rav Brawler. Even Joka who had no reason to feel positive about this anarchic Mandalorian gang Fi accepted that was what they were, and felt no shame was in the kitchen when he walked through it. She was organizing meals with Ru, as if her own expectation of a relatively peaceful life hadn't just been utterly destroyed out of the blue because she was in the wrong place at the wrong time. Everyone had fallen into a role in an unspoken duty roster, except him. 
or at least he thought that until he saw Juzik and Ordo standing in the passageway to the armory, looking way beyond lost. They were both tough men in their individual ways. Now they didn't seem sure what came next. It was fatigue. When the plug was pulled after a heavy engagement, the sense of hitting a wall was almost unbearable. Phi had been there too often. But a night's sleep, or even a week's, wasn't going to fix what was wrong this time. Parjan needs to move the ship under cover, Phi said. Give us a hand, will you? Standing around and dwelling on loss didn't help. Phi believed in exhausting himself with frantic activity until his body gave in and sleep-like unconsciousness overwhelmed him, and when he woke up he would do it again, and again, until eventually things settled down to a tolerable level. He'd coped with losing his first squad that way. He could do it again. Yeah, better cover our tracks. Ordo strode out, upright and alert again as if someone had thrown a switch. What's the Met forecast? Some more snow would be handy to cover the footprints and churning. Skirata and Bessany weren't in A.E. Han when Phi went outside again. Parja had one of the inspection plates hanging open on the underside of the hull, working on something. She gestured out into the snow. Two figures sat huddled on the highest of four time polished chunks of granite that jutted up through the soil. He wanted to wait for Aiden. Besaike is keeping an eye on him. Ordo checked the sensors on his forearm plate with a conspicuous flourish. It's minus eight out here. They'll be hypothermic if they're not careful. He walked toward them, picking an irregular path as if he was stepping on stones, still a commando trying to disguise his presence. Some conversation appeared to take place. Then he walked back again. Bessany says they're fine, Ordo said. She'll make him put his helmet on and seal his suit. Valve wandered out to join the inspection. He'll go like Django. Murd tiptoed around them, leaving remarkably misleading footprints. The first bereavement knocks the guts out of him, and then the next one turns him into something frightening, and all the anger gets swallowed and recycled into long-term retribution. But don't worry. It kept Django going on a slave ship all those years, and it'll keep Cal alive, too. It's a Mando thing long memory, short fuse, big revenge. Five was still coming to terms with the Mandalorian psyche, the contrast between not caring what someone did before they joined, and yet clinging to ancient pasts and feuds. It was in him, too. He was only just starting to find it. Ordo started up A.E. Han's drives and nosed her down into the hangar concealed in the shallow slope to the north of the house, with Phi and Vav playing aircraft directors. With the associated chores of swabbing down the compartments, replenishing stores, and prepping the ship for the next flight, the five of them Murd insisted on helping manage to occupy a big chunk of the afternoon. Who's going to break the news to Yithin? Vav asked as they sat on upturned crates in the hangar. She thinks she's in a safe house awaiting transfer to some nice SEP facility. Let her think that, Ordo said. Until Cal Bear decides it's time. Murd went snuffling around the hangar. Phi found that the strill didn't smell so pungent to him now, maybe because he'd grown used to the animal's strong scent. Then it threw up its big, slobbery head and looked toward the hangar doors with a fixed gold stare, whining. A few moments later, Phi heard the faint AKAKK noise of a vessel's drive as it lost height overhead. They went outside to face a sun sitting low on the horizon in a blinding ball of amber, and saw a rusty freighter coming in to land. Honor guard, Vav said sharply. Turn to. Skirata and Bessany were already at the ramp when Aiden stepped out of the hatchway. Phi, Ordo, Vav, and Juzik took up position almost without thinking, standing to attention in line with the ramp. They weren't alone in their reaction. From the front doors of the bastion, Brawler, Tehai, Helamar, 
and the rest of Skirata's clan trooped out and arranged themselves silently so that there were now two ranks facing each other. Apologies, Calbert, Aiden said. New York had some stragglers to collect. He waved someone out of the hatch. It was a commando squad, for weary-looking clones minus helmets, but still in dazzle camo Katarn body armor. Wait, Brawler said. C.O.V.? Yayak squad reporting, ma'am. C.O.V. saluted, puffing clouds into the freezing air. I can't believe we're doing this. Fall in, Adik, she said. Olaram. Welcome home. New York Valen stood on the top of the ramp, looking down at Skirata. Hi, old man, she said softly. Skirata nodded in acknowledgement. Thanks for bringing her home. I'm so sorry. I'm sorry about your husband, too. Yeah. Maybe it was better not to know the details. She looked down at her hands for a second. So Aiden had found out how her husband had died. But at least it stops me imagining something even worse. Skarada nodded. That's the truth. You ready? I've got a repulsor trolley. Skarada put a boot on the ramp. No. Too cold. Too freight. He disappeared into the ship and came out carrying a small body in his arms, wrapped in a blanket, head covered as if he was just making sure she didn't get too cold. At least you're home, Mitiak. Cad's waiting. Fi heard the faint, ragged intake of breath. Everyone man or woman, soldier or civilian drew that same breath that he did as if they'd been punched in the chest. Skarada walked between the two lines and paused. Bard I.K., it's cremation for a Jedi Knight, yes? It is, Calbert. Tomorrow, then a final night in her own home with her family around her, and then she goes to the Force, or the Manda, or wherever, like the Jedi she was. Normally, Calbert used the word as an insult. It was clear now that Jedi could mean something totally different to him. Fi wondered who would crack first, and he wasn't as surprised as he thought he would be when it turned out to be Ordo. He thought the stifled sob was his own for a moment, until he saw Ordo put the back of his gauntlet to his mouth for a count of two, and then recover and stand to attention again. Shab, Vav said. Cal's building up some steam for a real good hate, now. Enough to last for generations. Skirata disappeared through the doors of the bastion, and the impromptu honor guard fell out. Fi found Parge's hand somehow, not even realizing she'd been next to him, and braced for a long, hard evening. Kiramora Bastion, later that day. The dining table at Kiramora was, as Helamar said the kind you could use as an operating table if you ever had to. It was cut from a single plank of ancient Veshik a native hardwood that covered much of Mandalore's northern hemisphere almost as far as the polar ice caps. Juzik felt it was a table for life events, huge rambling discussions, and somehow also for dismantling engines. He sat between Mariel and Jane, while Skirata took a seat at the head of the table in true patriarchal style, more to be heard than to hold court, Juzik suspected. You heard the ladies. Skirata said face still gray and drained. Highly sitar. Fill your boots. Tuck in. Enlightened Coruscan society would have tutayed at the traditionalist view that the females of the household were valued for their cooking skills, but Juzik was getting used to a subtler mando take on that. The whole clan even if Juzik couldn't define it, he knew the feeling of clan was a fighting unit. Those who weren't on the front line as teeth were the essential tale, and many happened to be female. Sometimes women fought alongside the men, as Brawler did, and sometimes they didn't. But those who didn't still had a job to do keeping warriors fed and supplied and the base or homestead defended. One couldn't operate without the other. 
and at this moment of crisis for the Skarata clan, the females had taken over and made sure that the front line was fed and rested. There was no weeping into shimmer silk handkerchiefs and waiting by the door. There was just an efficient, robust logistics operation that would still be there when the nine hells of Corellia were dust. Attain was... Attain was dead. Juzik said it to himself every few minutes, because he looked at live friends, loved friends, and couldn't reconcile the two states. Lasima said that Kat had screamed inconsolably for a full five minutes at the moment his mother had died then had calmed down and regarded the world with grave eyes and contemplation more like an adult's. He was now eating pureed canetta with a spoon all on his own, although a lot of it was ending up on the table. He seemed suddenly sober, like a little old man rather than a baby. Something had changed in him. Skirata kept him at his side in an elevated chair, pausing between mouthfuls to help Ked eat and wiping his mouth. Skirata had all the hallmarks of a man who knew his way around raising small kids and who regarded it as respectable work for a warrior. Juzik imagined him coping with a company of small commandos to be. But Juzik was now wholly responsible for Cad's care in an area that even Skirata's unerring paternal instinct couldn't handle. The child was force-sensitive, and living in a new era when that probably meant a death warrant. Juzik reached out in the force and gently touched Cad's awareness. The baby stopped smacking his spoon on the canetta puree and turned slowly to stare at Juzik. You're doing fine, Cad I.K. This is a game that only we can play, and only with our clan around. Juzik visualized the thick, safe walls of the bastion, and gave Kat a clear sensation of being protected within them, but not beyond. He gave him an impression as best he could without words. It's special. It's not for outsiders. Mama wanted you to be safe from bad people. Juzik didn't want to make the baby paranoid, but it wasn't being taken by Jedi Masters that he needed to fear now. It was a Sith who killed Jedi, and would want to control any Force users he came across. Palpatine knew Skirata had something that he wanted already. Juzik didn't want to give him an extra reason to hunt for Kirimorat. Does my Force using at the table bother anyone? Juzik asked. They could see Cad's reaction and work it out. Juzik force pushed a bowl of Tyangular across the table to Lasima. It was a blisteringly spicy meat and vegetable casserole, which had the prized characteristic of heticles, pungent enough to burn the nasal passages, one of the four qualities in Nando cooking. Just teaching Cad some force using etiquette. C.O.R. looked to Fi as if to work out whose turn it was with the wisecracks, or if they were even acceptable right now. Fi nodded. Well, C.O.R. said, Officers mess rules say you shouldn't use the force until after the Bespin port is served, but we're very relaxed here. Juzik wanted to laugh, but it felt wrong and so close to tears he didn't risk opening his mouth. Atain's body was lying in a room next door and here they were enjoying a meal. But if there was anything that would have gladdened her heart, it would have been seeing C.O.R.R. transformed from indoctrinated cloistered slave to a man who was wringing every drop of joy and sensation out of newfound freedom. He seemed to get a faint smile out of poor Jilka and a very bemused-looking Ruskirata. What a time to be reunited with your estranged dad. Bardike, Skirata said suddenly, what happens to Jedi when they become one with the Force? That's the phrase, isn't it? It was the hardest question of all, but Juzik didn't realize how much harder it could get until now. We don't really know, he said. But I truly believe some Jedi Masters can come back as ghosts in the Force, to interact with the living. Not everyone believes the ancient accounts, and thinks they're a myth but I think it's real. The whole table went silent. No chewing, no slurping, no scraping of metal on Porce Blast. Juzik looked around the faces, 
clone and not clone, and felt the shock. How could he have failed to understand the impact that revelation would have on them so soon after losing Atain? And now that they thought there was a possibility of existence after death for Jedi, it had made them all feel excluded. Ordinary beings had no such hope. Juzik wondered whether to emphasize the uncertainty of it, but that would have been a lie. He believed it, and he'd heard convincing cases. So he didn't. He traded off truth and the possible comfort of Atain's consciousness not being completely obliterated against the resentment he might come to face about a Jedi privilege that any bereaved being would envy bitterly. Juzik squirmed. He tried not to think where it would leave him after his death if he were right about the ghosts. Well, I never. Skirata said bringing him back to the here and now. Juzik wasn't sure if it was sarcasm or weary resignation. Fancy that. Juzik had to confront it. Ordo's stare was burning a hole in him. If you're asking if Atain exists fully in another plane like that, or if anyone else does but can't return, I have absolutely no idea. I wish I did. Of course it was what they were all wondering. How could it not be? Mandalorians had a vague concept of Manda, but it was very much rooted in the all-embracing continuation of the living culture rather than a literal afterlife. It's okay, Skirata said sounding tired. Cat offered him a sloppy spoonful of vegetables and he took it. Don't be afraid to say a dead death, the dead. It isn't going to go away, and if we don't face it, we'll just make it bigger than it really is. Can't live without death, can't die without life. He went on eating, head down. Ordo leaned back in his seat to reach for a bottle of Tahar spirit and poured a small glass for his father but Ritt took it carefully from his hand. There was a tense moment as their gazes locked, and she got up to walk to the head of the table and place it in front of Kalbir. Thanks, Adike, he said. It's good to have you back again. Skirata looked as if he was going to weep. The mood around the table stood balanced as it would for weeks, months, and maybe even years to come on a knife edge between crying and laughing. Cal, you'll go over it in your head a thousand times, New York said. She seemed to be able to read Skirata as if she'd known him all her life. Over and over. I've done it. But remember that Atain only died once, and then it was over. On first take, it sounded harsh, if brutally true, but Juzik recognized the wisdom and comfort in that observation, and actually felt some beginnings of peace. Nobody died as often or as painfully as the living left behind, who kept reliving the moment of death and speculating on it. There was no end to their dying once they let it drive out everything else. The loved one whose end they repeatedly tried to endure and imagine was now beyond pain. Skirata seemed to chew it over, then gave New York a sad smile. You've got a point there, freight jockey, he said. She seemed to have given him a reserve tank of emotional oxygen to get him out of a suffocating spot. I should know that by now. He drew himself up with a little cough that got everyone's attention as surely as bringing his fist down on the table. You want me to make the right kind of speech? We don't need speeches in this Eliot. We just need reminding. The one thing Atain wanted was for Dar and the clones she cared so much about to have a full life. We've got to grieve, or else we've not loved her enough, but there'll come a stage when the grieving would hurt her, and she'd want to see you all getting pleasure out of every day and every moment, all the little things you thought you'd never have. Relishing life is the best way any of you can make sure she didn't die for nothing. She'll never see her kid grow up. You will see it for her. And Dar and Niner will be coming home. Oya, pretty I said, tilting a small glass of Tihar. Koasii. Ordo only held a glass for appearance's sake. To attain, he said. 
to bringing Dar and Niner home, to getting our life spans back, to seeing Cad grow up as one of many of our children, to never being at the mercy of the Arotais again, and to gratitude for the few good ones, like Jailer Obrim and CSF. Oya. Koasii. Oya Manda. Mandalorian sensibilities revolved around those words, all of them from the same root, the word for life, and the urge to live it while it remained. Juzik felt embarrassed about his certain and privileged ticket to the hereafter. The meal went on for hours, breaking up into small conversations as if nobody wanted to be the first to face sleep, or to leave Skirata on his own. When his turn came to clear plates, Juzik found New York in the kitchen, feeding Murd scraps. He's an ugly barve, she said. But he's adorable. It, Juzik said. The stroke grumbled with delight, happily crunching bones. Murd's either or both, depending on how you look at it. Mind what you feed it, or va vo fret. I meant Skirata. Juzik almost blushed. Yeah, I suspected Aiden was engineering something there. He looked for bashfulness, but New York didn't flicker. She was still grieving herself. His sons want him to be happy. He's poured years into them, every drop of sweat. This has just gutted him, the poor old Shabir. New York cocked her head to mimic Murd's mute appeal for more tidbits. She gave in fast. The Strill had her well trained now. I got to know Mando's pretty well doing this job, she said. Okay, you don't want to cross them or fight them, but they're hospitable, and they love their families. But that in there tonight for all the grief, there's so much love that you could saw a chunk out of it and build a criffing house. It's a magical thing. Yes, it was. It had drawn Juzik, and Bessany, and Etienne, and Etienne had paid for it with her life. Kirimorat Mandalore, later that night. Bessany had no choice but to sleep. Her body demanded it. She thought she would never sleep again for the turmoil in her mind, but her face touched the hard pillow, and she fell unprotesting into a black void. A child's crying woke her. She opened her eyes, and for a moment she was aware only of straining to hear. It was a thin, distant sound. Then she remembered Atain dead, Darman and Niner marooned, and she had to put her hand to her mouth to stifle the sob. She was lying on top of the covers, still dressed, the light was still on. Ordo lay curled in a ball, head buried under the blankets as usual. But it wasn't a baby. It wasn't Cad. The crying sounded like an older child. Bessany slid off the bed, pulled on her boots, and crept out into the passage, picking her way carefully in the darkness. The place smelled of newness, fresh plaster and paint. It was the kind of smell that went with a fresh start and hope for the future, not grief and terrible, unerasable endings. She couldn't make out where the sound was coming from, and stood still for a moment to try to identify the direction. Was she dreaming? It was faint, and if she could hear it, then others surely could. But as she crept past the various rooms, all the doors were closed, and no light showed. The quiet here, the complete absence of any sound of urban or even village life, was eerie. The kitchen was deserted. In the chair by the fireplace, a blanket lay crumpled and the fire looked in need of a few more logs. Skirata's refusal to sleep in a bed was a touchstone, a habit that had grown into a ritual to remind him of all the things he had to put on hold while he made the world right for his boys. If they were deprived so would he be, too. He seemed to be afraid that if he changed that ritual, he would lose his resolve. Skirata wasn't a superstitious man. But it showed how much the years had ground him down, that he would cling to a daily ritual for strength and focus like a sports player. 
The doors leading onto the storage area were closed. The sound was coming from in there. No, it wasn't Cat. Bessany stood for a moment, almost afraid to enter because she had no idea what she might find. She pressed the controls, and the doors parted silently. Cal? She said. Scarato was sitting on a crate with his arms folded and his head almost touching his knees. He was weeping like a child crying itself to sleep, stifled sobs punctuating great, rattling breaths. It took him a while to control it long enough to reply. Just letting it out, he said at last. I didn't want to wake anyone. Midge left some relaxants. Might be a good idea to take some. I've still got to wake up sometime and face it, Bess I.K. Skarada stood up. He was always unashamed of his emotions, and Bessany found that admirable. I've got work to do. Lots. The. Cremation. I can do that. Ordo and I can do that. Thanks, Ad I.K. You're a good girl. I've made a mess of your life, haven't I? We all came along willingly for the ride, she said. Except Jilka and Ru. I'm just shaping up to show Cat his mama's body in the morning. It has to be done. Bessany recoiled. Maybe it was a Mandalorian custom, but it seemed brutal. On the other hand, if the child didn't see Atain, he might regret it later. Mothers were very absent in this clan at the best of times Skarata never mentioned his, birth or adoptive, and Bessany barely thought of hers. It was a world of fathers. You need to start leaning on people for support, Cal, or you won't make it, she said. It's only been a J. What about Dar? What's that boy going through right now? He needs his family with him. And he's stuck in some trash pit of a GR barracks right now. If he's lucky, maybe not even with Niner because the lad's in a med bay if he's still alive. We can't even calm them yet or jailer. I let all of them down. None of it needed to go that badly wrong. Dar made a choice, Cal. A brave one. He really is a grown man. We all made choices. Skarata seemed to be back together again now. He settled down in the kitchen chair and submitted to having her pull the blanket over him. It still surprised her how Mandoade could sleep in armor. She had that education to come. Niner, maybe that's who I pity most right now. And I know he's alive. Per Niner, lonely and serious trying to play the father to his squad like Skarada had been to him, was probably in torment now for making Darman stay. Bessany wasn't sure if Fav had the best of it. He saw his father as a monster, an example to be avoided while all those who saw Cal Skarada as a paragon of fatherhood were doomed to fall short in emulating him, and berate themselves for it. But life went on, because it had to. And Cad was living proof. Ordo had shifted position when she got back to the room. He'd let the blanket slip down to chin level, and she spent a few minutes propped on one arm beside him, watching. He was starting to go gray at the temples. She hadn't noticed that before. Sometimes rarely, but sometimes she forgot how unfairly fast time was passing for him. Koyasii, she said, and kissed him goodnight. Chapter 24 Gar Talin and Ijanik, Gar S.A. Bir, Oriwad Asla. Nobody cares who your father was, only the father you'll be. Mandalorian saying. Kiramura, dawn, next day, 1091 days ABG. Is it going to burn properly? Kamarke asked. Do you want some accelerant on the pyre? Ordo thought that was a good idea, and wondered how it could be done discreetly. 
He realized yet again that he lacked some awareness that most human beings had social blind spots and knew he didn't react quite the same way as others. So, as long as they were beings whose feelings he cared about, he took care to note what might offend them. Attain's cremation was a ritual, something to soothe the onlooker, not a disposal to be carried out with maximum efficiency. If it's subtle, Ordo said carefully, some pit tar underneath the branches might do the trick. Nothing obtrusive, just enough to make the wood burn hotter. Yes, some tar. Ward IKA, have you seen any h &E bulletins today? No. Palpatine's dissolved the Republic, it's the Empire now, and he's declared himself Emperor. How modest. I have to wonder where that leaves our brother still on Coruscant. Does it make any difference? Yes. Kamarke took out his data pad. Look. I know why we can't get comms. The small screen showed a portal that Ordo didn't recognize. It should have been the GR mainframe, which they'd been able to access legitimately and slice solicitly up until a couple of days ago. Now it looked very different, with an imperial symbol and a different interface. Ordo activated a bogus terminal location on Kamarke's pad to disguise the access attempt and began keying his way in. But he couldn't. Shab, he said. They've completely overhauled the system overnight, Ordaike. Kamarke took back the pad. Data, comms, everything. We can't get in. We can't take stuff out. We can't talk or listen at will. We can't spy. It was the first time Ordo could recall when he and his brothers had not been able to get at anything they wanted. Nothing had been closed to them. They'd even hacked the Topoka mainframe as children. The Imperial networks, though, were slammed in their faces. All of them. It's more an annoyance, Ordo said at last. The mist that had hung over the quiet white landscape was lifting. It was going to be a sharp, clear day for the funeral. None of this is beyond you or me to bypass, and Mariel or Jane can crack this over a cup of CAF. I'm sure we can, but we're starting over. The whole system's changed. We've been used to being on the inside, exploiting opportunities, but if we want to keep that level of access, we're going to have to start working harder. Apart from extracting our brothers, why is this urgent? Kamarke shrugged. Just in case. And we hate being shut out. Ordo and his brothers were used to being in control. We still can't calm Darman or Niner then? No, and we can't even get a medical sitrap on Niner. Or find out where Darman is. Because it's the Imperial Army now. There is no so brigade or republic command. Then we start over. But first things first. You get the tap for the pyre, and I'll see how Kalbir is. Ordo crunched back through the snow, forgetting his boot prints for the moment. They hadn't tried to contact Darman because they'd been in hyperspace transit, and when they landed they'd been busy licking their emotional wounds and then the window of opportunity had closed at least temporarily. Ordo knew that Kalbir would be upset by that, and that in turn upset him. He'd delay the discussion until after the funeral. We all decide what those we love should know and not know, and think we're being kind. Isn't this where it all started? He found Skarada in the room where Atain's body had been laid out. She looked fine. It was an odd thing to say, but she looked at rest, and that upset Ordo because he knew how her life had ended, and that it hadn't been peaceful at all. He could never trust his eyes again to tell him how things had really been. And it wasn't as if he'd led a sheltered life when it came to death and violence. Ready, son? Skarada held Cad in his arms. The child was gazing at the body looking not distressed but puzzled. 
He stretched out a hand, and Skirata dipped a little to let him touch Atain's hair. Brawler had done a tidy job of making her look her best. Cad gripped a lock of hair and seemed reluctant to let go. Ordike, clip a piece of her hair, would you? Skarada said. And his. He'll need something of her in years to come. Did you see where her bag went? She had a bag. Ordo lifted the battered brown fabric sack and looked in night. Two lightsabers, data and calm kit, and a toy. He checked the data pad and calm link. No data chips in these. No, nothing else in the bag. You want the toy? It was the toy that seemed to finish Skarada off. He handed Cad to Ordo in complete silence and walked out, returning a few moments later looking shaken. I'm sorted now, he said. Is everyone ready? Yes. Let's do it then. This time, Skirata used a repulsor trolley to move Atain's body. It probably felt one step too far to carry her as if she were still alive and then lay her on the pyre. She was now the deceased and some distance had to be created. Skirata picked up the toy nerf from the bag and Cat held out his hand for it. He clutched it to him when Skirata passed him to Lysema. Juzik took the lightsabers before Skirata could put them on the pyre. Kalber wanted to get rid of them, but he'd regret it later, Ordo knew. They won't burn completely, Juzik said. Besides, they both meant a lot to her for various reasons. Okay, Skirata said. In the few awful moments between looking at her for the last time and setting fire to the wood, Ked grizzled and squirmed in Lasima's arms, holding out the nerf. He wants to give it to her, Lasima said. He docks that. He hands you things. Come on, then, sweetie. She moved close enough for him to drop the toy next to Atain. Skarada muttered something that Ordo didn't hear because he had his head lowered, but he lifted it again and simply went to the pyre to strike a spark from the metal fire starter that he kept in his belt. The sparks took immediately. Flames began licking the branches, leaping higher until they were level with the body. New KYR attic, Shurtabekajla, he said. Not gone, merely marching far away. It was what Mando warriors said of fallen comrades. They were never gone, as long as someone repeated their names daily, and talked about them and the fine times they had then they lived. Ordo didn't even have to ask. Kalbir had already added Atain's name to the memorial list he whispered to himself daily. There was a limit to how long anyone could stay watching a cremation. There was too much detail that mourners best avoided seeing. Lasima stepped back to hand Cad to Juzik, and the motley crowd seemed at a loss for any ceremony or ritual to find closure here. Not even Juzik said anything, but he rested his forehead against Cad's, and maybe something passed between them that the likes of Ordo would never grasp. I'm never doing this again. Skirata walked back to the pyre. Ordo saw his lips move, but he didn't hear the words. He watched his father reach into the flames no gloves, no apparent fear of being burned to grab something before dropping what looked like the lock of Cad's hair into the fire. Skirata came back clutching the scorched toy and turned to the mourners. Orihat, I swear I am never, ever going to see one of my children go to the Manda before their time again. Skirata had started with just over a hundred commando trainees, and now there were around eighty-five left serving. Yet only Omega seemed to have become this central to his life, however much time he spent talking to the others wherever they were deployed. Ordo wondered if he would now start obsessing about the rest. If he did that was all right by Ordo. You've burned your hand, Ordo said. Skarada put the toy in his pocket. There was something pitifully tender about that. 
No big deal, son. You said the guy Balmanda, didn't you? It only took a few words to formally adopt. Posthumous adoption counted, too. You finally adopted her. That's a noble thing you did. Being my son's wife wasn't enough, Skarata said. I want to make amends for the way I yelled at her, and she never knew her parents. Well, she knows her father now. Ordo thought Skarata was going to lose his composure again, but he seemed to have passed a watershed. When the flames died down, I'll gather the ashes for Darman. Fie. At Ike? Come here, lads. He beckoned them to him. Have a hearty break fast. And put on your full beskergam, too. We're going to have a chat with an old friend. Yuthin? Fai said hopefully. Yes, Skarata said. We've honored the dead. Now we look after the living. Skarata was genuinely grateful to have Dr. Ovalot Kale Yuthin around. It was a little more than the potential she represented for giving his boys a full life. She was also useful distraction. She was a task, and he could pour his sharp edges into dealing with her. All those things saved him. They saved him from drowning in grief, unable to claw his way up the sides, and from lashing out at those just as deep in grief as he was. He unlocked the armory door followed by Otten in his newly acquired purple-brown armor, and Fai in the plates he'd scavenged from Gez Hoken on Kalura. They looked totally at ease, as if they'd been free Mandoade all their lives and never served the Republic. Wait until I call you in, Skarata said. There was an uncomfortable irony in Hoken's Beskergam, having just cremated the Jedi who decapitated him, but Atain had probably changed from that first kill. Skarata suspected it was the moment she started drifting away from the Jedi Order. Doctor. Skarata forced cheerfulness. How are you? Yuthan looked up from her papers. Mariel had made her very comfortable. She had everything except links to the outside world, but then she was used to being in solitary confinement. I'm well, she said. How's the war progressing? Has Karuskin been taken yet? The war's over, Skarata said. Really? Yuthan blinked. Really? See for yourself. Skarata placed the hollow net receiver and screen on the table. It was a high quality set. She was going to be a guest here for a long time, so there was no point skimping. When he switched it on, it was already tuned to HNE's news output. Yuthan watched her face a picture of amazement. She hadn't seen a news program in nearly three years, and all she knew of the war after Omega had snatched her from Kalura was what her captors had told her. Shock was an interesting expression, Skarata thought. It unfolded in stages. It was almost too slow for the person doing the shocking. Yuthan was trying to process a gap of three years, the end of the war, the end of both the CIS and the Republic, and now she was going to get the crushed nuts and syrup on her Nivian ice Sunday. Doesn't time fly? Skarata said and leaned around the open door. Adik? In you come. Aden and Fai walked in. Aden didn't get her attention he looked like any other Mando minder she expected to have guarding her but Fi. Fi wore Gez Hoken's red and gray rig, and she'd known Hoken pretty well on Kalura. She stared at Fi. She'd probably forgotten how tall Hoken was not very and she just fixed on the armor. So you're still alive, Gez, she said. She would have no idea how funny that sounded to a Mandalorian. It was the direct translation of the universal greeting, Sukuigar. Fai chuckled and then lifted off his helmet. Skirata smiled. An image is worth a thousand words, they say. Surprise! Fai said. 
Miss me, ma'am? Yuthin just put both palms slowly to her cheeks and stared. It was an oddly genteel reaction, not the gesture Skirata expected from her. You've not rescued me so I can continue with my unique research into neutralizing fed clones, have you? She said at last. Just a woman's intuition. Fai sat down opposite her. He really was coming on in leaps and bounds. He still had that unsteadiness and hesitation, but his confidence was sky high. It was clear that he felt like a competent soldier again. We've got names, Fai said. And wives, and nice clothes, and bank accounts, and everything. Skirata still couldn't tell when Fai was putting on an act and when he was being distressingly literal, but it sounded good either way. Is this revenge? Yuthan asked. Skirata respected someone who didn't go to pieces when they found they'd been totally scammed. So, do you really want to kill clones, or were you just trying to solve a puzzle, doctor? Why do you ask? Because I can't imagine why any intelligent being would genuinely want to kill strangers for no reason. So either you're a sad sick Shabir, or you're a typical scientist who just wants to make something work without thinking too hard about the consequences. Or, said Yuthin, I could be a patriot who doesn't. Didn't want my planet to be run by a Coruscant-centric dictatorship, and so used her skills to target its army. Big word that. Mind if I write it down? Would you be giving me this moral lecture if I was just making blasters to shoot your clones? Maybe. Skirata tried to visualize what this woman loved and cared about, but it was almost as hard as working out what made a Kaminoan tick. He opted for the basics. Do you have children, doctor? No. He might have been imagining it but he was sure she'd hesitated for a split second. She might have been lying, or it could have been a touchy subject. He concentrated on her eyes, searching for pupil dilation or any flickering movement that would betray emotion. Did you want kids? Again, the slightest pause. She blinked. Once. But then life got in the way, and the next time I thought about it, it was too late. Gotcha. Well, these clones are my sons. Skirata's tone was soft and conspiratorial. He knew the buttons to press now. Not figuratively, literally. I adopted them. They're my kids and I love them, and they were my second chance at getting a family right. I want them out of the army, and I don't give a shy if Karuska disappears up its own trash compactor as long as nothing happens to my boys. Are we doing a deal here? No. Ah. Uh, I just want you to understand my motive, doctor. I didn't care for the Republic, because I'm a Mandalorian, and Mandalorians don't like being herded. The Republic wanted to force its brand of democracy on everyone, and the Jedi strong-armed for them because they always know what's best for grunts like us. No, I'd rather have been fighting for the separatists, but I had sons on the front line. I still have. And there's something you can help me do. Why would I want to? You haven't heard what I want yet. Skirata ruffled Fi's hair and gestured to Otten to take off his helmet. These charming lads age twice as fast as you or I do. I want that unfortunate state of affairs to stop. You want them to have a normal lifespan. Yes. Yuthan stared at him for a few moments, and then looked out of the slit-like window. Maybe it was the unbroken whiteness outside that unsettled her. Kiramorat seemed as far from civilization as anyone could get, a wilderness that reminded folks how utterly alone and insignificant they were in the greater scheme of the galaxy. Yuthan might have coped in her fancy secret laboratory on a backwater planet like Kalura, but she was no longer on her own turf among allies with a guaranteed flight home. What's in it for me? She asked. Sp 
spoken like a mandalad. Skirata smiled. What do you think? Knowing your kind I get to live. Doc, no good playing the Ice Queen with me. I've lived with Kaminoans. I know ice. Just cut the Asik and tell me what you want. You're already free of the Republic, the Seps, and even our new Emperor. I want to go home. I lost nearly three years of my life in that cell. Skirata thought she would want credits, or at least to walk away with the research she would want that. He was sure, but her reflex was to ask to go home. Could he ever let her go? No, not as long as there were clone troops vulnerable to her bioweapons. She hadn't had the chance to perfect the nanovirus before Omega Squad had seized her on Kalura, but it was now viable as far as he knew, and the army was still full of fed clones. Put it another way, Skarada said. What do you want to do with your life? Be rich? Famous? Academically respected? Save the galaxy from disease and pain? If I didn't know better, I'd say that smacked of desperation. I'm trying to work out how much data I can safely give you without turning you into a threat. If you had data, you wouldn't need me. Skirata knew that tone. Yuthan had the same need to solve puzzles at best amoral, at worst malevolent as Ko Sai, Nenelin, and all the others. She coveted knowledge, and that was her power. Well, he had knowledge, too. He switched on the data screen on the table. See for yourself, he said. Yuthan hesitated for a moment and stared him straight in the eye, defiant. But then curiosity got the better of her, and she turned her head slowly to look at the screen. Skirata took a few casual steps back, pulling out a few strips of rookroot to chew. Go on, document. Take a look. She did. And she wasn't a sabak player. Her face betrayed her. It was like watching a hungry kid let loose at a banquet. She scrolled through the screen slowly at first, then at increasing speed until she stopped Drew back and looked at him with an expression of breathless excitement. You've got everything here. Skirata did his I'm just a simple mercenary shrug. Yeah, we have. How did you acquire all this? We mined a lot in the last couple of years. Kamino. Arcanian Micro. Gene Sculpt. Theragene. The Republic Livestock and Agriculture Administration. Calm Central Population Planning. Colliumus Institute of Health, Le. Research still in progress at the Republic's top universities. There's not much cloning and genome data for sentience or non-sentience left in the galaxy that we haven't ripped off. Skirata paused for effect before mentioning Yuthan's former employer. Even the Jabadin Academy of Life Sciences. We just aren't completely sure how to put it together to achieve the result we want. Yuthan looked torn between gorging herself on the research and looking for the catch. Nobody's ever assembled this much in one database. My boys are obsessive. And thorough. And all you want is for these clones to have normal lifespans. Yes. Really. Really. Skirata, this is worth billions. You could turn this over to any one of the companies and be a very, very rich man indeed. They'd kill to see their competitors' data. Billions? He had a trillion creds, and the sum grew daily. We only stole it for one reason. Now are you in? Yuthan stood staring at him. I said are you in, doctor? Do we have a deal? What's the catch? If you try to stiff me... I'll personally cut your throat unless one of my boys gets to you first, of course. Either way, it won't be quick. If you play nice and do the job, 
and don't use any of this data or your own to harm fed clones, then you can stroll off with it. Yuthan appeared to do some calculation. That could be many years away. The faster you work, the sooner you leave, Skarada said. Trust me on that. Yuthan didn't really have any other options anyway. I'll do it, she said. Good. Skirata picked up his helmet. Give Fi your shopping list, and we'll get any kit you need. So what did happen to Ko Sai? I'd like to say I killed her, to focus your enthusiasm, Skirata said. I certainly dreamed of it often enough. But she took her own life. I suppose it can get pretty grim here for a Kaminoan. Or maybe that's how all supremacists like her prefer to go anything rather than let an inferior species do it for them. Despite himself, Skirata almost liked Yuthin. There was something in her, some spark of passion that Ko Sai and her vile kind didn't have. It wasn't as if they were even on opposite sides, politically speaking. It was just that her job had been to wipe out clones. If only they could have ironed out that difference, then they might have had a great business relationship. Jane and Mario were waiting outside the doors a little way down the corridor. They straightened up when they saw Skarada coming and ambled toward him. Jane was wearing those gray leather gloves with his gray besker gam. He was very attached to the gloves now. Skarada wondered how else Ko Sai had been immortalized after he sent her head to General Zay. I never took trophies. Funny that. Not my style, I suppose. Well, Calbear? She's playing ball, Skarada said. I do believe the tide is turning. He walked through the Kirimura Bastion and found himself singing under his breath. It was a shame Atain hadn't lived to see this. Juzik had given him some hope, though. If Jedi had this deal with the Force, and Etain was somehow in a Jedi Manda, then maybe she knew, and maybe she'd pass beyond missing those she'd had to leave. And if that was the deal, no, Skirata didn't resent Jedi privilege at all. Chapter 25 Rejorotize Megoesi Jorku Emichai Arashim Tell the Arotais that they live because we died. Inscription on a Mandalorian Memorial to Fallen Mercenaries, Kirimorat. Kirimorat, 1095 days ABG. Mandalorians didn't have memorials. Nomadic warriors never stayed anywhere long enough to tend cemeteries, let alone create public expressions of commemoration. But Mandalore was home now, and Skirata had other ideas. He hadn't planned it that well. It just happened when he stopped sobbing about Atain during the night, and found it was nearly sunrise, so he walked out into the frosted grass around the lake and waited for the dawn. As he stared at the horizon, seeing shapes and memories, he reached into his pocket and found a few pieces of hard plastoid. They were armor tallies, the last remains of dead clone troops. He was absolutely determined they wouldn't be forgotten. The little tags with their ID circuitry needed to be commemorated like any piece of armor from a fallen comrade. We're your clan, your family. So we'll keep your memory alive. Most of the tallies he had were from men he didn't even know. It didn't matter. He had their names just numbers, mainly on his list every one of them up to the moment Mario last linked to the GER network. It was going to be a lot of work. But that was okay. He had time. He began pacing out a large rectangle in the grass, crunching his way in straight lines through the hard frosted blades until he could see the outline. A memorial would stand here to make sure that these men were not invisible, not anonymous, not forgotten. Even the Aruatais would know the size of the army's sacrifice when if they ever saw it. Skirata walked back to the outbuildings to get a shovel. Murd snuffling around the yard stopped and looked up at him with an expression that was painfully human. 
You want to keep me company, stinker? It was unusual to see the animal without Vav, but it had established its territory around Kiramorat now and seemed content to leave its master sleeping while it patrolled. Maybe it didn't see Vav as a master, maybe it saw him as a father, and the Strill was no more subservient and enslaved than Skirata's clone sons. Come on, Murdike. You're a soldier, too. He could have sworn the Strill nodded at him. It fell in behind him and sat watching like a sentry while he turned the first soil for the foundations. In his mind's eye, he saw a broad-based obelisk, polished smooth, with the tallies inlaid or names and numbers inscribed. Perhaps that was both too ambitious and too at odds with the unspoiled beauty around it. It would also be a landmark in a place where he needed to stay hidden. One day, though, one day. He'd think about that. He thought while he hacked into the rock-hard soil. Mur jerked its head around whining softly. Someone was coming, and Mur knew who it was. Skirata went on digging. Only Mandalores have graves, said Vav. I'm being an iconoclast. Skirata braced for a sarcastic comment on his expanding vocabulary, but none came. It's not enough for us to remember them. It has to be something the whole galaxy can understand. However trumped up the war was, they still did their duty and died. Vav squatted down as if he was checking Skirata's construction lines for true. Agreed. You reckon we can build something big enough to take that many names? Die trying. Vav turned to Murd. Shovel, he said. Fetch, Murdike. Shovel. Murd wheeled around and raced toward the homestead. Skirata was glad he hadn't shot it. It was a remarkable creature, and there were few of them left. They were all in this together, clone deserters, ragtag civvies with nowhere else to run, disillusioned Jedi and Astril. Do you think he knew, Cal? Skirata went on digging. Vav totally upended him when he showed his decent side and made him ashamed of all the years they'd spent hating and fighting. Who? Sev. I never told him I was proud of him, and I was. Did he know I loved him every bit as much as you love your boys? Skirata knew that pain well. Did Atain know? Had he ever made up for the things he'd called her when she first told him she was pregnant? I know he did, Wallen. Skarata said. Vav had never had a father worthy of the name, all things considered he'd done his best to be one himself. I know he does. He's missing. Missing men often get found. Our missing men will be found. Vav nodded silent. He was the picture of regret. But whether that was for his relationship with his trainees or his life in general, Skirata had no idea, and thought it was a bad time to ask. So, Wallen materials? Shape? Dimensions? Vav looked distracted. Something that can expand to three million in time. Something that looks like a natural formation from the air. Skirata almost asked about the many millions more that Palpatine had produced on Sentax and Coruscant, but that task was beyond him whether they were clones of Fett or not. Do what you can. What he'd done seemed pitifully inadequate, just a handful of men out of so many. But it was still early days. Maybe more would follow. The sun was climbing from the horizon thawing the frost between the shadows. Skirata put his hand in his pocket again and took out the tallies. There were more in his quarters, in a box under the bed he still hadn't used, and in which he wouldn't sleep until he'd completed his mission to stop the clone's accelerated aging. In his belt pouch, his fingers closed around something soft, small, and heartbreaking. 
What are you going to do with that? Vav asked. Skarada turned the toy over in his hands. Give it back to Kat I.K. when he's older, of course. In the meantime, it's comforting me. Crazy, isn't it? The hard old Mando Merc and his cuddly toy. He felt he'd done pretty well to get this far without breaking down again. He'd had enough of crying. It wore him out. It pounced on him when he least expected it. It was the kind of sobbing that was dry and painful, just convulsions in his chest and a terrible pain behind his eyes and in his throat. Part of the ongoing pain was not being with Darman to comfort him. The poor kid didn't have the experience to deal with that kind of bereavement, even if he was with Niner. Who am I kidding? I still can't deal with it, and I've been watching people I love die all my life. Skarada struggled to get his breath. I've got to go back for them. The longer we leave it, the harder it'll be for everyone. I can't even calm him now. I know, Vav said. You'll understand why I need to go visit some Wookiees for a while then. Study trees. Oh, I understand. Need any help? If I know I can call on you, that's enough. I've got some creds, Io Anaka. Maybe you'd hand them over personally. My pleasure. Skirata scraped the soil off his shovel and headed back to the house to sit down with his family have a solid breakfast with them, and make plans. Atain had always said the Force told her things about the future. Skirata wondered if it had told her that her name would be on a memorial to the Fallen of the Clone Wars, the only non-clone he would ever allow to be honored there, apart from Bardan Juzik when his time came. The kitchen was full of good comforting smells, and the general noise level was high. That was what a clan home should have been like, the bustle of existence. Skarada summoned everyone to the table, and they ate. Ru picked at her breakfast, looking as if she was studying him whenever he wasn't looking. He felt he'd picked up where he left off with her, and in the worst way leaving her to fend for herself while he got on with more important business. Eventually, he got up and moved next to her, putting one arm around her shoulders. You okay, Ad Ike? Just taking stock, Dad. I'm sorry. Skirata didn't specify what he was apologizing for. She had a long list to pick from. I'm neglecting you all over again. Riz shook her head. You're into some dangerous stuff, Dad. And things must be pretty bad for you at the moment. It's okay. It wasn't. The last thing he wanted now was sympathy from her. If she'd raged at him, he'd have felt better. What are you going to do with Arla? Bessany asked. Poor woman's been stuck in her room for days now. It's no improvement on the Valorum Center. I'm going to visit Concord Dawn and see if there's any distant relatives around. I don't expect them to look after her but it might help her get her cogs back in gear. Skirata thought about it. He had use of a fortune, maybe more than Fett ever amassed. Some of it would be well spent on Arla. Even if she didn't ever get better, she'd at least have some comfort. I don't imagine Bob is going to want to see his long-lost aunt, if we ever find him. Are you looking for him? Not really. There was no hurry this morning. It was a bitter winter, so even if the farm had been up and running, there'd have been no work to do. It was another project on the list. In the meantime, they could afford to sit and plan while they waited for Yuthan to come up with some results. Aiden came in and helped himself to a bowl of boiled grain. He liked his meals to have the sticking power of gasket compound. The Empire's looking for marks and bounty hunters. He said, I've been down to Ensory, and there's a lot of talk about opportunities. You thinking about it? 
I'd have to be very bored, Aiden said. And I'm not, not yet. But I'm worried about some other business heading our way. I hear the Empire's offered a lot of creds to lease land for a garrison here, so they've got a base for operations in the quadrant. Ordo just looked. He had eloquent eyebrows. I don't like the sound of that, Bessany said. It's a lot of creds, and there's a lot of folk here who don't have our assets and liquidity, Aiden said. Can't blame him. Skirata didn't need the Empire in his backyard even if the base was a long way south near Akeldabe. The planet wasn't big enough as far as he was concerned. So who are they putting the offer to, in the absence of a man Alor? Lasima asked. She was a bright girl. She was getting more confident every day and becoming a shrewd businesswoman. There'd been very few Twi'lek Mandalorians, so she was going to have to be discreet about her location and circumstances whenever she ventured into town. She'd be noticeable. There was no anonymity under a helmet for a being with headtails. Does it even count as foreign policy? Chances are it's a simple lease deal with the guy who owns the land wherever that is. Sounds crazy to me, Lasima said. Sounds dangerous, said Ordo. And that's a good reason to anoint a Mandalore soon. Sounds messy, Fi said. Does it involve Winnet? It was messy, in the other sense. Skirata didn't want to be conspicuous and he didn't want to get involved in the politics of Mandalore as long as he was trying to run an escape network for clone deserters. But he needed to get things straight. Maybe it was time he saw Fen Shaisa. If there was anyone capable of steering the clans away from short-term thinking and long-term disaster, it was him. And that wasn't saying much. Skirata sat Cad on his knee and helped him tackle a small plate of shirt eggs. He was at the age when little clones had played games designed solely to improve their coordination, visual-spatial ability, and reasoning skills. Skirata tried to put that out of his mind now. Lots of protein makes you big and strong, Cat I.K.A., he said. Like your daddy? He'll come home one day, and he'll be so proud of you, won't he? And then all the Mandoate will stay at home, and never have empires, and never fight Arotai's wars for them. So they'll have to find some other silly people to do the dying, won't they? Cad looked into his grandfather's face with grave, serious eyes. He didn't smile at everyone like he used to. Juzik said he sensed that his mother was gone, and probably had an awareness of death that ordinary children of that age didn't. Skirata liked to think that Attain's forced certainty that Cad would change many lives was actually true, and that he might grow up into someone who could put Mandalore on its feet again. You're politicizing him young, Ordo said. What if he wants to be a waster, hunt a few bounties, and drink any tragal to excess? He's the son of a Jedi and an elite commando, Skirata said. He'll choose his path without career advice from me. I'll take some, then, said Ru. Got time? Skirata took the hint. Of course I have, sweetheart. After breakfast, he walked her around the lake to the north of the bastion and showed her the memorial site. It felt like amnesia. It was as if he'd simply forgotten all the years between but somehow knew exactly who she was, everything that mattered. She wasn't a stranger at all. There was simply a lot to find out about her. A sheet of ice spread from the shoreline toward the center of the lake like a pier. Vivine small rodents that robbed the grain fields and packs popped up from their burrows to watch warily, almost invisible in their white winter coats. Where do you want me to start? Skarada said. My side of the story? Yours? No, let's hit the reset button. Repuffed clouds of vapor into the icy air. 
What's the phrase? Cianvedin. We begin again. Life needed a reset button. It would have solved a lot of problems. Scarada suspected he'd make the same mistakes again anyway, and settled for putting right the ones he'd already made instead. Tell me what your life's been like, Ad I.K. He said, linking his arm through hers. I want to hear it all. Chapter 26 So Palpatine has a new army. I have no doubt he'll find our cloning operations a threat one day very soon, and seek to destroy our capabilities. But he's a fool if he believes we handed over all the combat-trained Fed clones to him. Lama Su, Kaminoan Prime Minister, on discovering Palpatine's new Imperial Army. Oyuba Tapkaf, Keldabe, next day, 1096 days ABG. Boba's out there somewhere, Shaisa said. He had a habit of putting his boots up on the nearest chair, which was poor etiquette even in a bantha's backside of a joint like the Oyu boat. He might be his father's son, or the poor wee lad might be so shook up that he's lost his guts. But if he's a true fat Mandalore needs him. Maybe so. Skirata wished he hadn't come to now. Because Shaisa was a very persuasive man, and part of Skirata the part that didn't want to shut himself away from the erudic world, the part that wanted to keep tabs on it so he knew how to kill it when it next threatened all he he held dear needed to stay on top of events. He found himself mired in a discussion. But Boba's not here, and he's barely come of age anyway, so what are we going to do for a bit of direction while we wait for the Savior to show and lead us to glory? Ah, you're mocking me now, so you are. Yeah, maybe I am. Skirata indicated an empty. Get less mocking with a few mugs of Enitra gal inside I'm told I get sentimental and sloppy, in fact. Shaisa let out a long sigh. Spar was right. Touting him as the son and heir was a canny public relations exercise, but it's no substitute for a real man or I nominate you, Fen. I was worried you'd say that. Everyone's saying it. The clans are reassured to see Palpatine offering paid work now, with no hard feelings so they'd cheer for a band of wearing a by sea these days. Talking of which, why is anyone seriously considering leasing a base to the Empire? They've offered a good price. Who did they offer it to? The individual clan, or Mandalore? The clans met, and it's just a temporary land deal. Skirata didn't hold it against Palpatine for being a Sith. It wasn't a big deal for Mandoade. They'd worked for Sith in the past, and they'd fared better with the Sith than they had with the Jedi. No, Skirata didn't trust Palpatine because he was a politician, and just as the sly ball had wanted to impose the Republic's nice shiny democracy on the galaxy, he now had a new name for his megalomania, Empire. Only the branding had changed, really. Palpatine never did anything temporary in his life, Fen. Skirata huddled over his mug of ale. I know. He's just spent thirteen years at least building a galactic war and two armies purely to get rid of the Jedi. I'm not complaining, but you can have failed to notice that he's occupying the galaxy a system at a time, so what part of the phrase do not let this man camp in your backyard do we not understand? Which part of we haven't had a credible army since Galadrin do you not understand? So the only option is to roll over and become an outpost? Skirata couldn't believe that the Galadrin losses were still irreplaceable. This was Mandalore. The raw material of fighting men and women was all around them. Look at the holochart. What are we a convenient base for? I can only think of Roche, and if Palps really likes Verpine Kit that much, he can walk in. He doesn't need a garrison here. You're a suspicious man, so you are. I'm a man who worked for the Republic's army for more than ten years. The one that wiped out the Jedi. 
and I didn't see that coming. What would Palpatine want here anyway? It's not like we've got prettier views than Naboo. We've got two things here Baroyes Ball Besker. Men and metal. Although now that he's removed the Jedi, he might not need so much Mandalorian iron. But there's nothing else of value here except us. Shaisa was smarter than he liked to let on. The amiable rogue image didn't fool many. It was probably why he didn't want to be pushed into being Mandala. Look, he said. If we said no to the base, the garrison, whatever you want to call it, then we might get his attention the wrong way, clans would lose creds, and he might well show up with his great big hairy new army anyway, and there'd be sweet nas we could do about it. We've got four million people here. He's probably got armored divisions bigger than that. This is not my problem. My problem is to bring home my boys, cure them all, save more clones, look after my own. Nothing else. Skirata repeated that to himself, because the temptation to grab Shaisa by the collar and warn him that things would go to Asik almost got the better of him. He needed to operate covertly. He couldn't do that if he got involved with clan politics. See, if we can't say no, and if we can't raise the kind of conventional army that can show unwelcome visitors the door, Shaisa said, then our only option is to be ready to do the kind of sneaky fighting that your good selves are so fine at. Selves? Me and Vav, we're too old. Ah, uh, sure, you're the cutest age for training young soldiers. I came here to talk you into being man Alor and putting some common sense back into how we do things. Don't sidestep the issue. I don't want power. You'd be man Alor. Power is not the word. Focus. Direction, maybe? Despite the scruffy hair, Fen, you've got focus, and you're young enough, too. Yeah, get your hair cut, your scruffy Shabir, and we'll make a man all over of you yet. Ah, uh, I love me hair, me cronin glory. Shaisa still had a reassuringly dull sense of responsibility under that smooth-talking ladies' man patter. Okay, if the garrison looks like it might turn ugly, I'll step up and keep the seat warm until Boba shows up. Shaisa was making an awfully big assumption about Boba's willingness to take over where his dad left off. Fett's got an older sister, you know. Arla. No, Vizsla killed them all. Not all. Now you tell me. Are you having me on, Cal? No, Orihat. I swear. Django thought they all died. But the girl survived somehow at least, what was left of her when Vizsla's latrine dregs were done using her. She showed up on Triple Zero some years ago. If Vizsla wasn't dead I'd be wanting to kill him again a few times myself. Shaisa shook his head. I low did she get from Concord to Cory? Why didn't Django know? She wasn't in any state to make contact with him. We don't know what happened to her between the time the Fets were killed and when she... Well, I brought her nearer home, anyway. She's had a bad time. Here? Oh, that's fine news. Don't get your hopes up. High time we had a female Mandalore again. The ladies know how to keep us fellas in line. Shaisa wasn't joking. He seemed to clutch at the idea of a real live adult Fet. It smacked of hereditary royalty, and that was very un-Mandalorian. We could give her plenty of support. She'd be a fighting girl, no mistake. She's not Mandalorian, Fanike. Only Django joined us. She could become Mandalorian. Yeah. She could. But she sits rocking herself in a corner for most of the day and she's never quite sure where she is even when her meds wear off, so I don't think she's the woman for the job, do you? Ah. Uh, Shaisa closed his eyes for a moment at the brutal slapdown. But the man had to be told. 
So why'd you bring the poor lass back? Because she was rotting in a lunatic asylum, and I can't walk away from a locked door when someone's inside being treated worse than an animal. Skirata surprised himself. He heard his voice as a stranger might, and felt like a hypocrite. You're such a great guy that you let Attain fend for herself, and she's dead because of you. Shaisa grabbed his shoulder and squeezed it so hard that it hurt. You're a good decent bear, Cal, so you are. Maybe I just like thieving so much that I steal people, too. Shaisa screwed up his eyes for a moment, caught out by memory. I'm sorry, Cal. I shouldn't be leaning on you at a time like this. I'm sorry about your wee girl. Terrible, it is. Mandalorians didn't distinguish between daughters and daughters-in-law, or even between daughters and sons. All were at Ike. If Shaisa had any inkling that Atain had been a Jedi, he didn't let on. Skirata fought an urge to tell him because he was so proud of her so proud too late, but any surviving Jedi were on a death list now, and the son of a Jedi wouldn't get the benefit of the doubt. Cad was doubly at risk. We cremated her. Skirata found he needed to keep saying that to convince himself she was dead. He still expected her to walk through the doors at any moment. She was from. He didn't know. For the first time, Skirata realized he had no idea on which world Atain had been born. It was sudden and terrible. He would never know. Shab, I don't know. She married one of my boys. Ah, the baby's a soldier's son. I'll bet he won't be the only one. Big, strong, healthy lads. Skirata hoped so, too. He gave Shaisa a friendly shove, anxious now to leave the Oyubat and shut himself away with his family to do some healing. I've got diapers to change. You go be a leader, Finn Shaisa. You'll be a great one. I know it. Skirata got up to go. The barkeep jerked his thumb at a holo display on the back wall. It was the current bounty hunting list, images and details of miscreants and other unfortunates with a price on their heads and therefore of interest to whichever of the Oyubot's patrons were looking for work. You're a popular man, said the barkeep, indicating a frame that said Skirata K, preferably alive. There was no image, and he didn't check the size of the bounty in case it was insultingly low. The emperor obviously took a real shine to you. No Mando would come after him, Skirata knew. It wasn't the done thing. But there was an image of Jilka, and nobody here knew she was off limits yet. They'd have to be careful. I'll send him a holocard, Skirata said. Skirata's pace picked up as he walked toward the speeder, and he broke into a run for the last few meters. His ankle was fine, like it had never been shattered at all. Now it was his chest, his heart, that hurt. Once the hatch closed and he stared up through the transparent steel canopy at the brilliant turquoise sky, he wept again. Better out than in, but am I ever going to stop? The clan needs me in control. It still took a few minutes for his vision to clear enough to steer. Dar, if I miss her this bad, what are you going through? You should he here with us, at IK, home with your son. Darman's calm link was still down. Obrim's was down, too, and there was no word of Niner. Muriel said they were upgrading the calm kit to be compatible with the vast new Imperial Army but he'd find a way to contact Dar and Niner even if it meant going back to Coruscant and walking into the barracks. You're coming home, lads. One day soon. The new speeder had been worth the creds, as if he had to worry about that now with a massive fortune getting fatter by the end of each banking day. It was fast, and cut the transit time to Kiramorat by an hour. 
As he brought the speeder low through the treetops to avoid detection he was starting as he meant to go on he was reassured by how hard it was to spot Kiramorat from the air, and how the clearing caught him by surprise. Someone was waiting for him when he landed. Arms folded New York stood like a loadmaster waiting for cargo, glancing at something in her hand. New York, he said, jumping out. Her transport was still ticking over, as if she just landed. You okay? I thought you were working out of Fonda now. She held out her hand to offer him something. It was a tiny piece of glittering plastoid. Found it, she said. It was stuck between the layers of soundproofing in the crew bay. Ordo said Atane's data chip was missing from her pad so I checked where I'd laid her body. It was a data chip, all right and Skirata found himself promising the Force some grudging respect if only it was Etain's. He looked at it for a few long minutes. It took a little while longer before he could speak. Thanks, New York. I'll add it to the list of a million things I owe you. Debt paid. Sorry it wasn't better news about your husband. Skirata still didn't know the details and didn't want to pry. I'll shut up about it if you want. Nobody's getting much good news at the moment, Cal. I'll settle for closure. Some widows don't even get that. She turned to leave, but he caught her arm. Have they fed you, that bunch of mine? He turned the data chip over and over in his hand. What was on it? It might have been nothing. If he didn't look... He'd never know. And he had to know. New York hovered almost telepathic. I can look at it for you if it's going to be too upsetting. No, I have to do this. Thanks anyway. It's no trouble. He took a breath and slid the chip into his data pad. New York had the right stuff. She was Mandacarla. This isn't going to be easy either way. Skirata expected the chip to be full of heartbreaking images of Atane with Cad, and he wasn't disappointed. Mothers did that. They kept pictures of their kids, especially if they knew their time with them would be limited. You told her you'd take her son from her. But it wasn't just her and the baby. It was Darman, too, all three of them and some of the Holos. The pain in Skirata's throat was sudden and intense enough to make him open his mouth. His own sobbing caught him by surprise. New York put her hand on his shoulder. I could have done something, he said. No, Cal. I could have let them be together. I broke every rule in the book, so why not that one? Why didn't I do it from the start? Regret gets you nowhere. It was hard to square her forbidding exterior with the obviously kind woman within. By the way, I took a chance. Got room for some more? She popped the hatch on her shuttle. Can't resist strays, me. A clone in a pair of gray pilot's coveralls, the sort any freight jockey wore, walked down the path toward them. For a terrible moment, Skirata's heart leapt and something in his mind said Darman, but it wasn't Dar. A fleeting thought like that could crush Skirata for days. The clone looked embarrassed. Skirata had expected anything from relief to fear, but not embarrassment. And this wasn't any of his boys. He was a stranger. Any clone was welcome here, though, and the man was instantly family. That was his right. They were all brothers, Voden. Levitt, said the clone. I served under General Tamukin. Ah, uh, this was the commander who'd known Atain was pregnant and kept his mouth shut. Levitt held out his hand to Skirata for shaking. So, you're the one Ordo calls Commander Tactful. Levitt raised an eyebrow. I try to be. Thank you for the refuge, Sergeant. 
I'm not proud of myself, but something snapped. Nothing to be ashamed of, either, add I.K. Skirata beckoned toward the house. You more than did your duty. Now it's your time to do what you want. A farm, said Levitt. He looked around him, taking in the farmhouse with an expression like a lost child checking the darkness for monsters. I don't know the first thing about farming, but I can learn to do just about anything. And General Termukin. I'm very sorry indeed. Her son's doing fine. Skarada patted him on the back. This lad had nothing, just the clothes he stood up in. Go inside, and Ordo will get you settled in. Get some food down you. Skarada looked at New York. You staying for a meal? Least we can do for you. New York considered the invitation slowly. That would be nice. Can I raise a delicate topic? Skirata felt a little hope, but he knew he'd feel guilty if he thought of his own needs before all his boys' needs were met and that included finding a method for stopping their headlong rush to old age. I'm all ears, he said. She waited for Levitt to go. Jedi. Where are we going with this? You didn't hate them all. You loved Atain and you loved Juzik. They're not all bad, are they? Whatever the Jedi Order turned into, they can't all be guilty. No. It was common sense. The fact that they'd killed Atain and used his clones like droids didn't change the fact that he knew there had to be good ones for the likes of Juzik to exist at all. They're not. And Juzik isn't a Jedi. What if I came across some nice folk whose only fault was that the Force dumped midichlorians in their system? How would you feel about them? What do you mean came across? It's an occupational hazard if you haul freight. You find stowaways and illegals in your hold, and you hear their stories, and sometimes you don't feel right dumping them out the airlock, and pretty soon you start trying to do the decent thing in a nasty galaxy. Skirata fixed her with his best don't even think about it look. Hypothetically. Mandos don't care about your roots. Only what you do. Right. Pretty tolerant for a bunch like you. Yeah. I might have two Jedi who escaped. If one's Quinlan Vos, bring him on. I've got a knife that's lonely. Kel. Come on. Okay, who are they? One's a kid. New York's face was still pitiless detachment personified, but there was a silky note in her voice that was almost like being stroked. I mean a kid maybe only fourteen. Name's Esterhazy or something. She helps grow things, and says they thought she was a useless Jedi, more mundane talent than forest skills and that sounds like poor attain to A.T. No decapitating. The others. A Kaminoan. Skirata actually gasped. It wasn't loud, more a slow inhalation, but he had no idea that Kaminoans ever produced force users. Iwa bait and saber jockeys. His two favorite objects of hate right then, and here was one who scored on both counts. His knife whispered to him. So why did Ko Sai get so excited about Cat? If the Grey Freaks had their own Force users, why didn't they tinker with their own midichlorians to create Force-using clones? Because they were the master race, and everyone else was just meat. He could see that now. They'd never used their precious, perfect genome to create a product. Ko Sai had told Mariel that after he said hello to her with an electroshocker. She was really offended when he asked if she was the clone, mother, whether their somatic cloning method had used Kamino and Ova for the fed DNA. I'll confess I'm not crazy about the idea, Skirata said, having the weirdest feeling that this was very important. I can just imagine what a lovely, caring, modest being a Kaminoan Jedi is. She's called Kinaha. 
She didn't strike me as a monster dash. Scarada remembered his first day on Kamino. Such gentle voices. They never do at first. But she's from a special line of very long-lived Kaminoans. They genetically engineered her bloodline for long space missions. Scarada almost collapsed. He had to repeat those words in his head a few times before he believed what he'd heard and his hammering pulse slowed enough for him to get a grip. So, they can extend life, too, as well as shorten it. No wonder Palps went crazy trying to get hold of Ko's side before I did. No wonder he thought she could make him immortal. She could probably do something pretty close. And that means... Doctor. Yuthan will be very interested in her genome. And so, my dear sweet Iwabate, am I. I am so very, very interested in that. For my boys. Cal, I know this is hard, New York said, frowning. And maybe the wrong thing to ask after what happened to Attain. You're right. He struggled with his conscience not about the plans that sprang fully formed into his mind because a Kaminoan deserved no consideration, but because he didn't like the fact that he was taking advantage of New York's good nature. But this is for my boys. They come first. Before me and my needs. Before New York Valen's opinion of me, too. No, it's fine. I can bring them back here. I must be insane. But what an opportunity. When were you thinking of doing it? I'll be passing their location in a week or two. Okay. But be careful. Full security. First sign of trouble I'll personally make them one with the Shabba Force. New York smiled. She could smile, and it was a nice one. You're a good man, Cal. No, he said. He'd level with her sooner or later. She'd probably hate him for it, and that was a pity, because he liked her more every time he saw her. But he had a duty. I'm not good at all. But I do love my boys. Imperial Army Training Center, Sentax 2, Coruscant. Darman had been trained to survive against all odds behind enemy lines, and that was what he was doing now. Strength of will, that determined who lived and who didn't. Dar? He knew when he was plunging into the abyss. Cal Scarata had taught him to spot the signs of despair and weakness, so he would know when he needed to get a grip. It wasn't lack of water or food, or even being shot that really killed you in these circumstances. It was letting despair eat you alive. It was giving up. Dar, can you hear me? If you take control of pain, fear, and loss, then you take control of your situation. Make it work for you. He could hear Cal Scarada's words as clearly now as he ever could. He chose to hear the man as he first knew him when he loomed over Darman as a training sergeant and not as the father he'd come to love as the years wore on, because that dredged up too much raw pain. He needed to be a different Darman for as long as it took to escape. The Darman who'd come to think he had a right to a life beyond the army, who'd loved a girl and married her, seen her die, and held a son for far too short a time before it was all snatched away from him that Darman was too fragile to survive an indefinite period in this alien environment. That man would have to wait in suspension until the time was right for him to come alive again, if that time ever came at all. Darman! Someone shoved him hard in the chest. He shook himself out of his near-meditative state and found he was looking at Niner, walking awkwardly on cybernetic braces to demonstrate that he was up and about again. You seem very chipper, Sarge, he said. I'll be back on duty in a couple of weeks. That's great. Dar, you want to go somewhere quiet and talk? Why? Niner was looking hard at him. Take your helmet off, Dar. Please? 
talk to me? Darman lifted off his bucket and set it on the table. He preferred his old katarn rig, but if he was going to change one thing, it didn't matter if everything familiar went down the sewer. It made it easier to be a different Darman. Niner lowered himself into the seat next to him, supporting his body weight on muscular arms, and took a firm grip of Darman's hand. Dar, it's okay to go a bit nuts after what's happened, he whispered. But I'm your brother. Do what you like in front of these DQ, but you can be yourself with me. Okay? The 501st troops were pretty sharp, but some of the other new boys weren't up to scratch for commando training. It wasn't so much the mediocre performance on initial testing that got to him what else did they expect from clones grown in a year or two, but that they seemed to think Sentax 2 was Kamino. Some decut had told them this before the war ended and they would not believe Darman's stories about endless oceans and cloud block skies until he made them study the Kamino system database. They had to, anyway. There was a contingency plan to deal with Kamino, which wasn't exactly best buddies with the Empire now. Darman was keen to refresh his relationship with the Iowa Bait. If they were looking for volunteers to bring Kamino into line, he'd be first in the queue. I'm fine, Niner, Darman said. This was the worst he could imagine, the lowest ebb. But he was surviving, and if he could hold himself together at rock bottom, then he would eventually live his life again, because no pain he would ever encounter again could be worse than this. I'm coping. Dar, I know you well enough to see what's happening now. What then? What is happening now? Okay, Naviodi. It's okay. I'm not pushing you. Darman wanted to tell Niner that if he tried to get the old Darman to come out, the pain would destroy him. And the things that other Darman knew had to remain under wraps. The best way to do that was to forget that he knew them, and lock them down for another day. What he consciously shut out of his mind could become habit he had a technique for that and then he wouldn't let anything slip or incriminate those he loved. So it was for the best. He put the old Darman away, and with it the unbearable pain of being so very close to an idyllic happiness and having it snatched from him. That Darman couldn't survive here, not even with his brother Niner supporting him. But he could hide, and come out when it was over. You could have left me, Niner said. But you didn't and I'll owe you for the rest of my life. We never leave a brother behind, Darman said. How could I? And he wouldn't be left behind either. He knew that. Someone would come for him. While he waited for that day to come, though he'd do whatever he had to, the way that Cal Scarata had taught him. Barracks Block, Imperial Army Training Center, one standard hour after lights out. Scorch had finally forced himself to stop replaying the events of the Kashyyyk operation in his mind to work out what he could have done to save Sev. There was plenty. But that was in the past, a moment gone forever, and now he could do nothing except drive himself crazy with self-recrimination. and he had a new job to get on with that wasn't going to wait around while he grieved. There were no Skaratas or Vavs in the Imperial Army to let the remnant of Delta Squad do as they pleased, or to care how they felt. This was a new world, much more like the restricted one of Kamino than the independence they'd grown used to. Even the new barracks had that white antiseptic feel of Topoka City. Have you seen him then? Boss asked, voice barely audible. He leaned over the edge of the upper bunk and prodded Scorch. He's here. Him and Niner. 
Scorch was grateful for the momentary distraction. He broke off from his perpetual guilt about Seth's fate to wonder if Etain had survived the purge. Juzik had. Scorch knew because he'd seen the death warrant on the list of missing Jedi that was being circulated. Palpatine had put a bounty on Skarada's head too. But if Darman was still here it didn't look like Atane had made it. Scorch was certain he'd have got her away to safety if he could. No sign of C.O.R.R. or Aten. He whispered. I heard they're on the deserters list, with the Nulls and a few others. Scorch didn't reply. He could hear Fixer snoring mechanically in the next bunk, and the noise now seemed reassuring rather than something that exasperated him enough to pour a jug of water over his brother while he slept. The rest of the commandos in the dormitory area were men he didn't know. A little familiarity was precious right then. Would you shoot them if ordered? Boss asked. Sev had once asked Scorch a similar question. I don't know. But Scorch wanted to say no, he wouldn't, and good luck to them. Would you have shot Atain if she'd still been with us when Order 66 went down? Academic, said Boss, evading the issue. She wasn't. Did you get a chance to ask Dar why he's still here? Boss paused. Yeah. And? Scorch expected news of Atain. His stomach clenched. What then? Boss swallowed. Scorch heard it. All he said, Boss whispered, was that he couldn't leave Niner behind. Scorch knew Boss well enough not to ask him how that made him feel. He felt the same way. Chapter 27 I didn't accept that he was gone until I saw his name on the war memorial. Then it had a finality to it. He wasn't mine any longer. He was absorbed into the ranks of the dead, untouchable, separate, frozen in stone. Widow of Lieutenant Commander Usan Fajanek, First Officer of Republic Warship Orodia. Keldab Mandalore, next day, 1097 days ABG. Cad was restless today. He'd whimpered through most of the night, and everyone had stood their watch with him, trying to soothe him to sleep. Phi bounced him on his lap. Nice day out, Cad I.K.A. He loved that kid. Maybe he was putting too much pressure on Parja to have one just like him. See all the funny Mandoade playing with knives and blasters, and singing rude songs? Cat clung to his scorched toy nerf with both hands and refused all attempts to distract him. He gazed out of the speeder window as if he was looking for something. Phi was sure he was watching in the hope of seeing his mother or father, whatever Juzik said about the kid understanding death better than ordinary babies. I think you get more excited about a day out in Keldade than he does. Skarada said hands relaxed on the steering yoke. It's good to see you happy again. Son, you heal an old man's heart. Atain would be so pleased. When we go back for Dar and Niner, I'm in, okay? I want to do that mission. You will be. Skarada seemed to be in a mood that Ordo called contemplative. Something was up, and his willingness to go to Keldabe made Fi wonder if it had anything to do with Shaisa. But Calbear insisted he was just going to buy some stuff to keep Yuthan happy holozines, toiletries, maybe even a bottle of fancy wine. It was too much of a risk to get goods delivered to Kiramorak from outside the area. And Skirata seemed to need to get out and stretch his legs occasionally. Ked want to try my bicy? Phi held his helmet over the child's head like a Bani high priest performing a coronation. Lots of funny noises. Lots of colors. Cad looked up at him with big, wary, dark eyes. Then his lips flattened into a thin, tight line and he frowned tears wobbling on his eyelashes. But he was silent. 
He was very good at not crying aloud. Fi reckoned that every baby had the right to bawl its eyes out, cad more than any of them. Fi lowered the helmet anyway. Here it comes, cad I K. Look at the pretty colors. Buckets on. There, you're a soldier now. Cad accepted the crown for a moment, with Fi's hands taking the weight. Then he squirmed away. Dada, he said. Dada? Can't start the kid too soon, said Skarada. We'll have Bevian Verhaek make him a nice little bicy of his own. No expense spared. Even a little flight suit. Mergo Ruse makes good ones. Only the best for my BU at IK. Is Bardan going to teach him to use the lightsaber? No reason why it's a weapon only for Jedi eyes. Skirata was worried Fi could tell. There was always that carefully controlled note in his voice that cut off some of the higher registers. Discreetly, of course. Fi watched Cad like a fleet met storm forecast. He was sure the kid could sense his father in the Force, and if anything happened to Darman, Cad would know first. Keldeb was busy today. It wasn't Coruscant by a long chalk, but Fi had given up on his ambition to rappel from the highest tower in Galactic City. Keldabe was on a scale he could handle, and he was more confident with every passing day that eventually he would remember his way home without ever needing a data pad prompt. The two men wandered through the alleys for the morning, Skirata carrying Cad on his hip in typical proudly paternal Mando fashion. They stood in the square outside the Oyubat Tapcaf, looking over the edge of the rail into the Kelita River to amuse Cad. He was still more interested in the sky for some reason. He was looking for something. It was then they first saw the ships. Overhead assault vessels and transports swept in a loose formation toward the east of the river. They'd once been a welcome sight on the battlefield but now they were a threat of dark days to come. The Imperial garrison was moving in, and they hadn't wasted any time. They were obviously in a big hurry. Skirata looked up and sighed. I've got what I came for, Adike, he said. I think it's time we disappeared. I'm glad I didn't take the man all our job, said Fi. I bet Spar is, too. So that was what Cat had sensed and fretted about. Juzik could sense trouble in the Force, so Cad probably could too. That was what he'd been watching for. Fi preferred to think so rather than imagine him pining for poor Atain. They headed back to the speeder. A man in amber armor paused to touch Skarada's arm as he passed. Have you heard? What, that we're going to rue the day we let Palpatine in? The man shook his head. No, Shaisa. Fen Shaisa's just accepted the K-Wirebess. He's our new Mandalor. The ale's flowing in the Oyubat. The man walked on, apparently happy that the three-year interregnum without a Mandalor since Fett's death was now over. Maybe he didn't know what Fi knew, that Shaisa had told Skirata he'd take the top job if he didn't like the look of his Imperial guests. Shaisa had obviously made up his mind right away. I don't think I'm thirsty. Skirata glanced at Fi. Are you, son? I'm the designated driver, Fi said. A gunship not quite the beloved LAT slash I, but close, clad in the new imperial livery swooped low over the center of the city, looking as if it was going to clip the Mundelmotor's tower. Fi put a finger to his lips. Stay quiet. Cad mimicked the gesture in complete silence. It was a good habit to get the boy into. Cad looked up with his fist in his mouth, eyes wide, brow puckering with the start of tears. He already knew that he'd need to be unseen and unheard to survive the years to come. Skirata watched the sky until there were no more ships, and Fi had seen that look before, wary but not cowed down. Wary but with something up his sleeve, 
something more than his three-sided knife. Cad whimpered quietly. It's okay, Skirata said stroking the boy's head. I'm here, son. I'm here. End of Star Wars Republic Commando Book 4 Order 66 By Karen Travis